closed session of the November 12th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. <coughs> In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for the closed session. I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Weber? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cumming? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to address the council on our closed session agenda? Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Hello, council members. My name is Dania. I live in Santa Cruz and I'm here because I received a letter a few days ago that said that I should address the council for my issue. Um, my car was towed in front of my house. I live at 315 Ocean View Avenue and I park in front of my house. Um, I've lived there since April, April, and I've had no problems except in September, I went out to my street to go get my car to go have a surf and it was not there. And I called the police department and the police department informed me that it had been towed. I thought it had been stolen. Um, I don't know why, so uh, the police department informed me that there was a neighbor that called in my car, that a warning sign was placed on my vehicle and that it, it, because it wasn't moved, it was towed. So here's the warning sign. Um, the car, so I checked the laws of the state of California and it seems that legally I have three calendar days to move my car. The car was moved before the three calendar days. I don't know if you've received any paperwork for this. Um, I should say I, I have filed a claim with the police department and I filed a claim with the city of Santa Cruz and with all kinds of copies and documentations. And Do you have that with you? We'll go ahead and pause. This is um, an opportunity, since it's on our agenda, we have the documentation, but this is an opportunity for us to hear from you. We don't really engage with dialogue in terms of questioning. Oh, I see. You can share your thoughts with us. For oh, you have received oh, it. Received Great, received it. I, yeah. um, because I d wasn't expecting to address the city council. Happy to. Um, so my uh, wish is that the towing fees would be refunded um, because the car was parked legally in front of my house. I was sleeping while the car was towed and the towing fees were considerable. And I only realized the car was towed when I went out to use it and found it gone. Um, so you're not allowed to ask me any questions. Um, you have everything that I submitted to both the police department and the city. Um, thank and you. that's my two minutes. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. I had a quick question. Councilmember Crown. You saw the thing on your windshield for a couple days before, or you just no. have never seen it? Good question. The reason that I have it is because it was, it did this. Because otherwise, these signs are, are pasted on windows and you have a fun time removing them. But here's the original warning sign with, so I, I, it was like, when I, so I picked up the car at the tow company and this thing was sort of inside the. Thanks. Okay. Is there any other member of the community who wants to address the council oh. before closed session? Okay, okay thanks, thanks guys. Uh -huh. Okay, Mr. Kandani. Yes, we, uh, we may have a subsequent need item. Um, I was asked prior to the meeting if the council could add as subsequent need consideration of initiation of litigation uh, relating to the Ross encampment that sprang up over the weekend. Um, under the Brown Act, the council can add an item uh, to the agenda if um, at least two thirds of the council uh, determines that uh, the item arose subsequent to the posting of the agenda and that there's an immediate need to take action prior to the next regular meeting. So um, that would be the process should the council wish to uh, add that to the closed session. Okay, is there any council member who is interested in making a motion to add that? Council member Matthews. I would be interested in adding this to the agenda for the purpose of a discussion. Closed session, okay. I'll go ahead and second that. Any further discussion? Oh, and I guess I have to say, making the, find, the appropriate findings of urgency. Okay, Councilmember Cotton. Can we say why, why it should be closed session and not an open session discussion? Um, that would be my recommendation, both um, because it's authorized for considering initiation of litigation 
and um, due to potential liability concerns surrounding the Ross camp in general and related issues. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, oh, excuse me, is there any member of the community who wanted to address, or could they address, would that be appropriate for community input at this mm -hmm. time? Yes. Please come forward, you'll have two minutes. In, in the general sense, right, of, of this event happening, it shows that people in dire need, without you judging them, people in dire need will do what they feel is necessary. When I'm talking with such people, I try to ameliorate any tendency toward extremism of any kind. And I always encourage them to be good neighbors, to respect every official of the county, work things out in a court if they have disagreements, or come here and sort it out. Um, I guess that's the role I'm trying to play. <clears throat> uh, there will be probably more of these things happening people setting up camps spontaneously, as far as I can tell. I don't, I don't like that too much, personally. Uh, I'm, I'm part of a coalition, and that includes people who want to do these camps. But I want the camps to be better organized. I want the county and city to have a definite policy. I want all the neighborhood groups to, to work on this as well. The Chamber of Commerce, the, the police, you know, we can do this. Thank you. Unless there's any further discussion, Councilor McLeaver. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think it's important for us to have the conversation. I will also just point out for the record while we're in uh, public session that this, I believe, is a direct result of our policies back in May to close the camp without adequate shelter space uh, and thus forcing people that are in need of service and or shelter to find their own means. So I think we should take that in consideration as we enter into closed session uh, and make conscious, conscious and forward-thinking action, since this is just discussion, but moving forward uh, to address the situation in a compassionate, constructive, and generative way as opposed to a degenerative or destructive way of criminalizing. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So we'll now adjourn to our closed session. And I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Crone. Here. Glover. Present. Meyer. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cumming. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. And if our clerk could please, please lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance. So jumping right in, we'll go ahead and move right along into our introduction of new employees. And I'd like to invite up our Acting Director of Finance, Cheryl, to introduce her new employee. Good afternoon. Um, today it's my pleasure, pleasure to, invite, um, to introduce Molly Vang. She's our new, uh, the Finance Department's new purchasing technician. Uh, Molly's lived in Monterey County for the past 13 years, but originally comes from the Central Valley. Uh, she moved to Santa Cruz two years ago and is happy to be part of the community. Her prior work includes uh, CSUMB, uh, CSU Monterey Bay, and uh, she worked, in an, uh, worked for an international sports um, summer camp where she spent part of, the, part of the year on the East Coast. Molly's interests include farming and harvesting and salsa dancing. Yeah. <laughs> She's known for a positive and helpful attitude and keeping a keen oversight over purchase orders for the city. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Nice to welcome Molly. And now I'd like to invite up our assistant uh, director for our libraries, Eric Howard, to introduce his new employee. Hello, good afternoon. I'm very happy to introduce Sarah Jones, who is our new uh, assistant uh, to help out with our volunteer office. 
assistant coordinator. We have over 200 volunteers for our libraries. If you're interested or know anybody who is interested, Sarah is the person to connect with. Um, she's had lots of experience in many different fields, including software companies, um, and also um, motivating and organizing PTA parents. So some of you may have an appreciation for the challenges there. So we are very, very happy to have her. Thank you. Wonderful. Welcome. Welcome. Next, I'd like to bring up um, our Director of Economic Development, uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, to introduce her new employee. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. It's my pleasure to introduce Andrea um, Inoue, who is our Housing Program Specialist. Um, Andrea is, is a California native. She was born in San Francisco and grew up in Emeryville. Um, she went to UC Irvine for undergraduate school and USC for grad school, where she earned a master's in urban planning with a concentration in social and community development. Um, she has a work history and direct services in a number of nonprofits during graduate school. She has a lot of relevant um, housing experience. Her most recent job was at UCSC as part of the employee housing office. Um, she's also worked in a nonprofit in housing and some of her past experience includes being a housing analyst for a nonprofit working on the homeless stabilizing team in Alameda County, which provided emergency services for housing. So she has direct and deep relevant experience on sort of a housing first model and a relevant skill set for working in housing in Santa Cruz. She really likes um, working for the city. Um, she loves being part of our housing team. Um, she's currently learning about Measure O um, for sale units, monitoring, we'll be working on our CAPER, that's our Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, um, community development block grants, home basic information, we'll be engaged in invoicing and creating systems. She's extremely organized, so it's been really fun having her um, as part of our, our actually very organized housing team, but working on checking security deposits for programs. Um, her favorite job, past job, was um, a rec leader in Emeryville while she was in high school. So her civic experience runs deep and long. Um, and the most uh, surprising thing she's learned since she's joined the city is how much the employees really care about their work and community. Um, and she loves being downtown and it really makes her feel more a part of the community too. So please join me in welcoming Andrea. Welcome. Welcome. Um, but last, but certainly not least, we'll invite up our Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel, to introduce his new employees. Good afternoon, Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, two new employees. Uh, next to me is Miguel Aguirre. Agu um, he's uh, uh, in a sanitation division, um, solid waste worker. He's born and raised in Watsonville and currently lives in Watsonville. He has two sons, a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old, and a dog named Kermit. So uh, um, it's a little Sesame Street there. Um, before joining the past work experience, uh, with the, he, he worked as a solid waste, solid waste worker aide one for the city of Watsonville. Uh, gave him the experience to uh, join our team. He also worked for Santa Cruz Bicycles and he worked as a plumber for six years. Um, when he's not working, he likes to spend time with his kids and enjoy outdoor activities, work on his truck, video games, and um, watch movies. So um, please join me in welcoming Miguel. Okay. Next to Miguel is Kenny Jatho. Uh, he's our new engineering technician, and he works in the transportation division. He was born in, the San in Santa Clara and grew up in the Santa Cruz Mountains off Soquel San Jose Road. Uh, currently lives in Seabright, and his past work experience includes working uh, Apple, in Apple Maps as for Apple Maps as a GSI, uh, GIS technician and data analyst. He brief, had a brief stint in PG&E, also as a GIS technician. Uh, he attended Cabrillo College for three years and then went to the University of Santa Barbara and graduated with a Bachelor's of Arts in Geography and GIS. And when he's not working, he enjoys uh, rock climbing at Pacific Edge during the weekends and tries to head up to Tahoe or the Sierras during the weekend. So uh, please join me in welcoming Kenny. Okay.
Welcome to all the new employees. Okay, we'll go ahead and move right along. We have a series of presentations, the first of which is our City Government Academy graduation. So I'd like to invite up uh, Director of Parks and Recreation, Tony Elliott. So, $1,000 in your court. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Tony Elliott, Director of Parks and Recreation. And we've got uh, as many folks as we could get today from our City Government Academy uh, in the middle of a work day here. But um, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about this program. So over the past two months, uh, we've had about 20 participants in the inaugural City of Santa Cruz City Government Academy program. Uh, the participants met eight times with various city departments, uh, including the city manager, public works, the police department, fire department, uh, economic development and planning, uh, the water department, the library system, and parks and recreation. Uh, each department through the program was responsible for crafting a curriculum and a hands-on learning experience uh, for the participants in the program. Uh, and really the purpose of the program is to gain, for students to gain, uh, participants to gain a better understanding of how the city government uh, works here in Santa Cruz. So some examples, the students sat uh, on the dais where the city council sits right now uh, as they learned about the, the council manager structure of government uh, from the city manager and assistant city manager. Uh, they worked together to solve a mock crime, uh, complete with a lot of um, packets of ketchup um, at the police department, uh, which was fun and engaging. And they toured uh, maybe one of the most fun experiences, which was touring the wastewater treatment plant uh, with Public Works. So a variety I could go on and on of different experiences uh, that the group experienced throughout the, the last couple months. Uh, again, the purpose of the Government Academy is to open the doors to the city and to provide a transparent, experiential opportunity to learn about the inner workings of local government. And our hope really through this program is that residents will gain a better understanding of how the city functions um, and ways they can also get involved. And that could be from board and commission involvement uh, to volunteerism opportunities. So many, many different ways that uh, could be a, a follow-up or an outcome of people being involved in the Government Academy. Uh, the program is free, it was free, and will continue to be free uh, uh, to the community moving into the future. And we look forward to hosting this program again uh, next fall of 2020 uh, for class number two. So on behalf of the Parks and Recreation team uh, that coordinated the City Government Academy, I just wanna say thanks. We're very grateful to the City Council and the City Manager for the support uh, of the program and certainly to all the different departments, department leads and department heads uh, who helped us put on the program. And I uh, also wanna say thanks to the students. This was a two hour commitment each week uh, for each of the last um, uh, eight plus weeks. So it's a big commitment from them, but we're very grateful to have a really excellent group to kick off the program. So. Um, with that, I'd like to just uh, ceremonially read off the names of the, the folks who are in the program, some of which are behind me here. Um, and then after that, I would ask uh, if we could come up to the dais and take a photo with the city council. All right, uh, Amanda Armstrong, uh, Amber Burke, Anna Costa, Kendra Dossenbach, Jane Doyle, Renee Golder, Serge Cagno, Claire Ken, Caroline Lamb, Jane Mio, Jaron Moonrising, Alex Nearson, Ada Popke, Andrew Raz, Philip Rosenblum, Don Scott Norris, Cindy Smith, Kim Smith, Rafa Sonnenfeld, and Seth Suresh were the participants in the inaugural City Government Academy program. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. Right, if we may, can we come up? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Please. Thank you for your presentation. Thanks to all those who are here today for your interest and engagement with our city government. And to those who aren't, um, please extend our gratitude to them. And please come, come on up to the dais if you'd like for the picture. Can I also just thank uh, Director Elliott for coordinating this. Uh, it's a really great Definitely. program and so glad it's happening and welcome everybody. You're here, amen. <laughs> Great job. With us. <laughs> yeah, because I like this. Yeah. Do you see if you're fast? <laughs> oh, one first of many. Okay. Right, one, two, three. Peace. Peace. <laughs> Thank you. One, one shot. That's daring. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you very much for the presentation and for the work. And really quickly, uh, Tony, before you head out, if, 
if there's those who are either in the audience or watching at home, they want to be part of class two, they should visit the Parks and Recreation website. Okay, sounds like that's the best place to access this opportunity in the future. Great. All right, well, I'd like to invite up our uh, Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz to come forward with their presentation uh, for a brief update on the work they've been up to. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thanks for having me here today. I'm just gonna pull up our presentation here real quick. All right, here we go. Um, yeah, so hey, I'm Matt, Matt DeYoung, Executive Director of Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz. Today, here to talk to you guys, a little quick reminder, our introduction to who we are and what we do, and also wanted to tell you guys about all the work we've done in city parks over our past season. We kind of, we talk about our trail work seasons as June to June of every year, because we do most of our work over the winter months. Um, yeah, so we're your local at nonprofit trail advocacy and stewardship organization. That means we partner with our local land managers to fund, design, build, and maintain sustainable trails and bike parks. Uh, what that looks like is we do a lot of trail maintenance. This is the Yukon Trail in Poganip a couple of years ago over a pretty bad winter and the trail got really chewed up. So we coordinated a big volunteer effort to repair that trail. Um, we had volunteers from the community and various businesses come out. They will bear like 30, 30 tons of rock down the hill to repair this section of the trail. And this is what it looked like afterwards, so big improvement there. We also build new trails. This is in Poganip, near the old Lookout Trail. We rerouted that trail because there was some erosion and safety issues there. So we took this raw hillside here and built a new trail and decommissioned the old trail, restored it back to natural habitat. We also do trail planning. We've been involved in the San Vicente Redwoods project up the coast with the Land Trust. We build trails for the demonstration forest uh, up in Soquel. We worked for state parks. We rebuilt the Enchanted Loop reroute over there. Built the Emma McCurry Trail in the city of Santa Cruz Poganip, open space preserve. Working in the city of Scotts Valley. This is the new Glenwood Preserve right behind Scotts Valley High School, which just opened up this past year. Uh, here's another trail we did in, in Wilder Ranch this year. This is the West Englesman reroute. Um, but yeah, I want to talk to you guys specifically about the work we've done in city parks this year. We've done a lot of work. We've been working in city parks since 2012 with the, uh, sorry about that, with the uh, Emma McCurry Trail being our first project. And since then we've done more and more maintenance and new trail construction every year. So you guys have uh, the full reports in front of you which go into a lot of detail about the specific projects. I'll just give a kind of a, a best of and a high level overview here and show you guys some pictures and some video. Uh, last year, we had 204 unique volunteers come out, doing almost 1,200 hours of volunteer work. We had 375 hours of our staff time contributed to that work, and $14,000 in direct cost to MBOSC. Some of our work is funded by the city. A lot of it's funded by sponsors as well, so we put in $14,000 on top of all that, all those contributions towards uh, maintenance of city trails and pump tracks. So we, we maintain both of the city's pump tracks on the west side and at Harvey West. We built the Harvey West pump track a couple of years ago. So we have staff members go out there a couple times a month and lead volunteer work there to keep those in good condition. We've worked with Parks and Rec and the Earth Stewards Program, which is a partnership between the Museum of Natural History and Parks and Rec, where they have high school students from Ponderosa, uh, hi, I come out every Friday to do service projects and we jump in there uh, a few times a year to help out leading trail work days. Uh, this is another picture of some trail work that happened on Yukon last year. This is, um, we, we've been working on the Yukon Trail for years and years, but this last year we finally got that, that um, into the city's Adopta Park program where we've adopted that trail in partnership with Specialized Bicycles and they contribute $5,000 every year towards directly towards the upkeep and maintenance of that trail. So the city is not no longer paying for that, that cost. Their specialized is paying directly for, for that. So keeping that trail in tip top shape. We've done a ton of work at De La Viega over the past year. We've had a couple of our big volunteer events, which we call dig days out there. We had our students dig day, which I'll show you some more about in a minute. 
We also had a group of uh, volunteers who worked out there every Wednesday after work over the summer to do all the brush work and do some trail repairs there. So we're able to keep those trails in good condition. I'll show you guys a video real quick here. <coughs> This was our student dig day at De La Viega last spring, or winter, rather. Santa Cruz. I'm also an environmental studies student at UCSC. We're out here at De La Viega Park doing some trail work. Today we're going to be working on drainage and brushing some trails, so it'll be good to maintain these trails we use. Yeah, stoked. I'm Sean. I go to Kirby. I'm in sixth grade at Kirby. Hi, my name's Sophia, and I go to Scott Valley High. My name's Colin. I go to Good Shepherd, and I'm in seventh grade. I like riding bikes with my friends, and working on trails is a whole lot more fun than I thought it would be. Hey, my name's Sterling. I'm the owner of Cycle Works Bike Shop. This is the Students' Dig Day, and we're proud supporters of Slug Cycling at UCSC. So it seems fitting that we uh, sponsor this one. Glad to be a part of Mount Bikers of Santa Cruz and support those local trails. Martin Luther King Day, and we're just wrapping up our dig day here at De La Viega Park, in City of Santa Cruz Park. We did maintenance on almost all of the trails. We had 98 people here today, which is our new record biggest dig day. We had an amazing raffle, including a brand new bike from Santa Cruz. how to get out of this window. That just gives you a feel for what our volunteer events are like. We do about 10 of those every year in various parks around the county, usually three or four in city parks. We've done one at doing on McCurry Trail and on De La Viega as well. All right, we uh, had our first ever pump track jam event at Harvey West a few months ago. It was a fundraiser for the maintenance of that, that park, and we had a uh, all-ages competition. We had the little kids out there on their Strider bikes, then we had professional riders as well, as you can see here in the picture, doing like a high jump contest. It was, it was a great event. It was um, a part of the Parks and Rec. I forget what the event was called. I'm sorry, it was where the whole park was activated. There was events happening at the swimming pool and uh, all parts of the park, so it was a great attraction. We've done a lot of work at Arana Gulch over the last two years. There's some eroded sections of the trail there that we've improved. This is with the Summer Youth Trails program. Uh, we also rerouted the Poganip Creek Nature Loop this last year. So there was a section of that trail that was really falling apart. It was fall line, it was eroding. It was not a pleasant experience. So we, we do a training program for our volunteers every year. And we use this project to train them about trail construction, trail maintenance, volunteer leadership. So we're able to complete that project just through that training program. We also replaced uh, the, the failing bridge there. There's a very rickety old bridge that we re rebuilt with the youth program as well. 
Uh, we do a Women's Dig Day every year, spent on Emma McCurry Trail for the last couple of years. It's been really well attended. Last year it was raining pretty hard and people still showed up and had a good time. So that was a, a fun time out there. Uh, one more quick video to show you. This is the first year that we took the step to partner with Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz with the Summer Youth Trails program because the goal for me was to bring in a little more focused skill set on trail maintenance and trail design and concept of trails and building sustainable trails. The funding was identified and made available by the council in 2014, and it was a separate program along with the summer intern program, which are two programs where we wanted to focus on our community's youth. We've been asked to reduce our, our funding in certain areas, but those two programs have continued to be fully funded by the council, and they do continue to see it as a priority to invest in our youth. Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz, we're a 501c3 nonprofit trail stewardship organization. The goal is to continue to provide meaningful work for the, the kids to do in the summertime and make sure it's worthwhile for the city as well that we're you know, tackling projects that are high priority. So that's the goal. And then you know, I think there will be opportunities to continue to grow the program. We'd like to get more, more kids involved. I'm Jacob Hyde. I am a trail specialist for Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz. You know, we're trying to get new trails built and that type of stuff on the youth program, but we're also trying to teach the kids about real life jobs. So it's, you know, teaching the kids about trail and having them outdoors and working and good work ethic, but it's also about just general kind of like moving forward in life, like out of high school. I've learned to just pay attention to detail and just like specific tricks on how to do certain things like invasive plant removal, like there's certain ways to do it. So it's definitely opened my opportunities up to side work. So I've acquired a bunch of skills, you know, to the point where I can go and work on my own for people. It's excellent. Bye. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we've been involved in that program for several years now. We're looking forward to doing it again this coming summer. It's, uh, it's been a great, a great collaboration. So what's next for this partnership between MBOC and the um, City Department of Parks and Rec? Well, really, we're gonna, we're gonna keep on doing all this great work and hopefully do more and more of it. We're investing in training more volunteers so they can take on leadership roles as well, so they can expand our reach in parks. We're planning our, our dig day season for the coming year as well. Um, we're excited for the Summer Youth Trails program next year, and we're just happy to help continuing to help the city evaluate trail maintenance and reconstruction needs as, as needed. Uh, we do have an exciting new pro project that we're planning for this year, which is the rebuild of the West Side pump track. We're gonna upgrade that pump track to like a, the new trend is to have asphalt pump tracks. They, they hold up much better. They don't require any water. There's no there's very little maintenance requirements. So we are finishing up the plans for that with Parks and Rec right now and are actively <coughs> fundraising for that and plan to rebuild that this fall. So we're looking forward to that. Um, so thank you for having me here today. I'm happy to answer any questions and yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the presentation. We're running a little bit behind on uh, time here today, but um, we'll go ahead and see if there's any uh, urgent questions from the council. But thank you for highlighting your, your work and the volunteerism and the partnership with the city. And if council members also have questions for you or wanna connect, they can do so after the meeting as well. Um, any uh, urgent questions? There's no public comment on presentations. Uh, go ahead. Super quick, uh, you guys do great work. Um, and these are wonderful videos. Do we link on these, I asked Tony, to our Parks and Rec website? I mean, it seems like it's a good way to just take, these are, these are very engaging, so just suggestion. 
Mayor Myers? I just wanna recognize your work and um, just make sure our community knows that really without this partnership, many of our trails would continue to de decline. And so the partnership and the volunteer and the training of the youth is um, just fabulous. And we also get to hike on, on beautiful trails. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, last but certainly not least, our um, presenter is Tiffany Wise West, who is our Sustainability and Climate Action Manager, and she'll be presenting on Resilient Coasts, an update. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon, Council Members and Mayor. Tiffany Wise West, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. So yes, we uh, are now six months into the Resilient Coast Santa Cruz Initiative, and I am delighted to give you an update on the progress of those projects. We are well on our way and on track. Uh, just to remind you uh, why, a couple slides as to why we're doing this project. Um, we have the need to address a variety of things pertaining to our coastline. As you can see on the left-hand side box, everything from access to transportation to sense of place, uh, cultural identity and equity. And uh, while we're addressing those, we're also trying to create an inclusive conversation which will together create a community vision for resilient coastal management um, that of course is a long-term solution and provides equitable access uh, to the coastline. So there are two projects uh, with this one goal of this uh, kind of united uh, vision, community vision. There's the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan. And then the other project we just call our Beaches Project because it's a mouthful, but it's development of local coastal programs, sea level rise strategies and policies to support beach and public access protection. So West Cliff Drive is really looking at the bluff lo blufftop locations and uh, the Beaches Projects really looking at the beaches, namely uh, Seabright, Maine, Cowell, um, the pocket beaches on West Cliff and Natural Bridges. And uh, again, why are we doing these projects? Um, well, first of all, they were called out um, in our climate adaptation plan that was adopted in October of 2018. But these series of images that I'm gonna be showing you in these next two slides really illustrate the uh, compelling reason uh, sea level rise is exacerbating erosion and coastal storms uh, and flooding and so forth for as in addition to the rising tide. So you can see top from from the top to the bottom, this is kind of a typical profile of West Cliff Drive where we have riprap, also known as revetment, as it's noted here, those big boulders, some of those boulders are up to five tons, believe it or not. Uh, they're protecting um, our bluff top location that has nice habitat, uh, our bike ped path, as well as two ways, uh, two lanes of traffic. As you continue out through time and you look at the, the center uh, image, you see that that riprap's become uh, displaced. It's no longer providing the protection that it's supposed to be providing and we potentially will have erosion of the bluff, most notably the uh, habitat that is adjacent uh, to the riprap and potentially impacting um, our bike ped path. So this is again, this is like a do nothing scenario if we did nothing. And in the lower right hand corner then we see what happens, you know, our, our uh, Pocket beach gets squeezed out. We no longer have a pocket beach. Our riprap's no longer functioning, and we have potential erosion into West Cliff Drive. We've already seen that erosion to our path. It's happening. And then in terms of our beaches, um, same kind of sequence of, of uh, evolution of coastal change. We see in the upper left-hand corner, we have dense development backing our beach. This is in this case, main beach with a small seawall. As you continue down lower, you see that um, the intertidal and subtidal zones are encroaching on the beach. We're losing some sand. And eventually, as you see in the bottom photo, we will no longer have a beach and we could see overtopping of that seawall um, at Main Beach. So these really are driving this conversation around what are we going to do and uh, developing this community vision. We are taking this unique approach, it's called adaptation pathways. And this is something where we identify, could be physical or other kinds of triggers that have specific thresholds 
And at those thresholds, we do the next sequence of whether pl it's planning or implementation. This is uh, an example visualization from Imperial Beach where you can see the trigger uh, across the top is depth of sea level rise from zero to 6.6 .6 feet in this case. And you can see all along the left-hand side the various types of adaptation strategies that have been called for. And as you continue through time, you get to 1.6 feet of sea level rise. No longer is the existing armoring going to work. At that point, riprap should have been replaced and they should begin planning for sediment management and retrofitting stormwater pumps. The benefit of this kind of approach is that we do not lock in investments too soon or too late, but whereas we only do those investments when we need to based on these kinds of triggers. And here are a number of different kinds of triggers we're considering right now. You can see they span uh, temporal in terms of a specific time horizon. I've already mentioned um, depth of sea level rise. It could be repetitive losses uh, and so forth. And so this is something that we're actively working on right now and are developing our own uh, visualizations to really enable the lay person to just look at, okay, I understand what we're doing. This is, this is clear. Okay, and we did begin this project about in April. We really uh, kicked off and had all the contracts in place by June, so we are well into this project. The first phase uh, that we're just finishing up now is benchmarking and data collection. We'll be going into the second phase uh, closer to the end of the year where we'll begin analyzing and identifying feasible adaptation options. Um, and then milestone three that really gets started next year is developing the plans and policies um, that we actually want to implement as a community that are both technically and regulatorily feasible. And every uh, stretch of the way, we are uh, checking back with the community. That's what these red stars mean. And I'm gonna share a lot more about community outreach with you in a moment because this is crucially important uh, for this project. So Westcliff Drive, uh, funded by Caltrans, we have a $44,000 match. Uh, we've spent a 140,000 to date on this grant and 31K in match. Right now, we are in the process of, of reviewing deliverable number one. Um, quite an extensive exi existing conditions in inventory and future hazard projections. So getting a little more specific than the existing modeling that's out there that is really too large of a scale for us to use um, for the Westcliff Drive project. Um, that will be finalized by the end of the year. And then we will go ahead and turn into our next deliverable, which again is identifying those adaptation alternatives um, that are feasible and checking into the community and so forth. We do have a 17 person technical advisory committee for this project and uh, the Beaches project. Uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and Council Member Myers are on that technical advisory committee along with a number of other community experts and residents. The Beaches Project is funded by uh, the Coastal Commission with some supplemental funding from the American Geophysicists Union. We have an $82,000 match, uh, 8K is cash and the rest is labor. We also are delivering currently, or I'm sorry, reviewing right now deliverable number one, which is the policy and strategy analysis. We will then be turning into our socially vulnerable populations impact analysis, and I'll share with you how we're connected with the community on that. And then again, getting into the adaptation strategies. So the scopes of work are somewhat similar on both these projects, um, and you, we really have benefited from aligning the public outreach together on these projects, as well as the TAC involvement. In terms of community outreach, uh, we've really just finished up uh, the first part of our outreach where um, we uh, have completed our community visioning, we've introduced the project, begun to build some relationships. Um, and as you can see, there are a number of other uh, touch points with the community. Um, I'm gonna share more about that in a moment. One thing I failed to mention are the consultants on these projects. So Dave Revel, uh, Revel Coastal is leading the West Cliff Drive project. We have Charles Lester, Sandra Coast Wetlands Group, um, Gary Griggs, Harkasunich Associates, um, Fair and Piers, uh, Groundswell Coastal Ecology, and Middlebury Institute on the Economics. So it's quite an all-star team. 
that very same team is being led by Ross Clark and Central Coast Wetlands Group on the beaches projects. We have a lot of alignment between um, who's working on this as well. We're really fortunate, it's a really expert team. This is the outreach we've been doing. Um, we really have uh, been doing an all out strategy. Um, you can see the top line uh, is the outreach that we've completed to date. Uh, we had talked with over 200 people at uh, Open Streets, although they estimate 10,000 were there, we know 2,000 came by our booth because of the number of stickers we uh, put out. We completed eight focus groups, include one with underrepresented groups who were also included in uh, two of the mixed groups. Um, we've conducted 600 Westcliff Drive surveys looking at questions like willingness to pay, trying to get a value for coastal recreation and tourism and how that could be uh, impacted by any of our adaptations. We've conducted 105 interviews in the beach flats and lower ocean area, really diving in a little deeper on how, um, how flooding is occurring, how that's changed over time, um, and trying to make that connection with sea level rise. And we've done over 30 talks in the community. Um, we are turning into our next phase in the near term with some one-on-one -on -one meetings in December with underrepresented groups, again, getting into kind of the socially vulnerable communities, how would they be impacted, really trying to engage them and helping us to develop the methodology and tell us how they think this should be done. Um, I know you all have received an invitation. Our virtual reality app is launching uh, this weekend. I'll share more on that in just a moment. And we'll be having two community workshops. And then there's a bit more happening later on. You know, we have identified at least 57 potentially affected interest groups in this project that we have committed to making an individual touch point with every single one of them and are very far along on that. We have over 200 people on our email list and that continues to grow. We've worked very closely with Beach Flats community mm -hmm. leaders on developing this really tailored outreach for those communities. And we have four academic partnerships going on as well. Uh, one with the UCSC Coastal Science and Policy Grad Program on the focus groups. They helped us develop those, facilitate them, and are now turning to doing a quantitative statistical analysis of the data. We um, have partnered with San Jose State University for the beach flats and lower ocean work. Um, and Santa Clara University uh, is doing an erosion study that we're feeding into and taking the outputs from. So that's specifically called out uh, also in our beaches project in the scope of work. In terms of what are people saying? So when we entered into this first phase of outreach, we really wanted to build relationships give understanding of what the project scopes are and start to have a conversation about coastal values, priorities, concerns, and uses. So one of the questions that we asked are, we use some kind of dot activities, what are your top coastal concerns? What you see almost unanimously across all of our focus groups were erosion and transportation, and transportation in a lot of different flavors. So um, that was very interesting. We also asked what's the best thing about Westcliff Drive? Interestingly, transportation, the bike ped path, is one of the best things that were cited, as well as scenic views and access to or watching surfing. Um, we asked this question in one word, what does resilience mean to you? This is some, a little guy looking at our adaptation plan at Open Streets, which we just thought was so cool. Um, and these are the universe of words that uh, folks both at Open Streets and our focus groups have said. Um, so we really see that, that folks are engaged in this process. Uh, in terms of the VR that's coming up, I'm super excited about this. This is, uh, these are some of the panels that are gonna be accompanying our virtual reality headsets. Here's our fire chief and emergency operations manager at the recent disaster event at the Civic where we debuted um, a, a kind of beta version of our VR. Um, this is a very immersive experience that shows what we're projecting in terms of uh, coastal storm flooding and erosion and it starts to build in solutions. We were really fortunate to work with um, Gary Griggs did the narration for the English language version and Ernestina Saldano voiced to the Spanish. So it will be uh, available in English and Spanish and it will be at the downtown library in a 
feature exhibit at the front of the library between November 18th and February 18th. So again, we really think that this um, has the potential to reach a lot of people. It will be out as a mobile phone app in both Spanish and English after the first of the year in its next phase. And then last, um, we also are using another creative uh, uh, way to reach people. We've been playing our card game that we developed with Rincon called Cards Against Catastrophe in the community, really giving people a feel for the trade-offs and the decision making in climate action planning and resilience planning. And that's been, I've been getting a lot of good feedback about that. Everything that we've been doing, um, we've been putting on our website. So summaries of focus groups, we've been going back to the, the folks that we talked to and say, is this, did we capture this correctly um, and correct whatever we didn't hear correctly um, and post that at our website. You'll be able to find this slide deck and many other things, uh, including our outreach materials uh, at our website. So our next step is identifying feasible solutions for the community to consider. And I will be back to report to you after the first of the year on that. I'm happy to take any questions you might have on these projects. Wow, well, thank you so much for your presentation. You're welcome. And this is very important work, and we look forward to hearing about the updates along the way. Um, so we're really grateful to have you here, Tiffany, and doing this work. Thank um, you. Any brief comments or questions from uh, the council? Vice Mayor Cummings. I just want to say thanks for all the hard work you're doing on this, because it's something that people really care about in the community, and I've been having yeah. conversations with folks and making them aware of that we are actually working on this, um, you know, how we're going to preserve Westcliff and and what sea level rise is gonna look like in coastal erosion. Uh, the one question I did have, and I think mem members of the community might be interested is, what day and time is the kickoff to the virtual reality session? The virtual reality is gonna open. We're having a soft launch this Sunday, but it officially opens uh, when the library opens on Monday the 18th. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, just to respond to your comment, we hear that very often people are saying, we're so glad the city's thinking about this and doing something about it. We had no idea that the city was thinking about this, so that's great. It's also given us the opportunity to hand out um, the little uh, reverse 911 sign-up cards um, that the police department and fire department has so that people can get alerts for flooding on their phone and so forth. So we're really trying to kind of double up on things where we can and achieve some efficiency and you know making sure people are personally prepared as well. Matthews. Well, I think you should have a Superwoman logo on you, frankly. <laughs> but <laughs> um, Tiffany can can talk about reaching out to groups. But um, I heard her present maybe a few months ago to a Chamber Community Affairs Committee. <coughs> they were so engaged, so impressed, and so with the program. And uh, so it's uh, the acute interest in this is absolutely across the spectrum, and the, the thoughtfulness and scientific validity of what we're doing is is impressive and will help us get to the decisions we need to make. Thank you for saying that. And I'm, I should say, I'm not doing this alone. I have a grad student who is working with me and I have a team of five to 10 interns at any one time. We could not do all those surveys and interviews without those folks. So I'm really grateful for them, to them. Council Member Brown. Colleagues' comments and add that I really particularly appreciate the efforts made in the beach flats and lower ocean neighborhoods where the impacts of uh, sea level rise will be really strongly felt. And I know that that's a concern, and there's a lot of um, worry and not necessarily understanding about what that might mean. And so I appreciate that that's happening and, and kind of at using the, the scientific. Uh, study and all of that knowledge and translating that into uh, language and kind of way of of, uh, addre of addressing the topic um, in a way that's understandable and people can really engage with is so important. And so thank you mm -hmm. for all of your work and thanks to your team. Thank you. Here, here. Councilman Myers. Yeah, I just want to recognize your work and, and um, just your continual commitment to um, really just be a leader. Um, you've brought the city to a place of real prominence, I think, in this subject matter. I, yeah, I just hear from colleagues around the state. Um, they're excited about what you're doing. Um, I think specifically with this um, tie-in with our beaches and our uh, recreation area is really, it hits people, you know, we're literally at home because they use these, these areas all the time. And so, 
um, to, to Vice Mayor Cummings' point, you know, if you spend any time out on Westcliff or other places, you see, you see the effects of, of uh, the erosion. And so um, people are really relieved to know that we are, are participating and, and doing this kind of cutting edge work. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Tiffany. I'm, I'm glad folks are chiming in. I'm not going to repeat what they've said, but this is like an overwhelming for a lot of people. Most people, as you know, um, both of us being up in environmental studies and seeing all the information constantly coming into us uh, over the years. Um, but thank you for taking the lead on this and for continuing to show up. And I just urge you to keep the council informed on stuff that takes place, changes and everything as soon as possible. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. So that then concludes our presentations for this afternoon's agenda. <coughs> I have a few announcements. Um, and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community te television channel 25 and is streaming on the city's website at thecityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the wet window edge to my left and it's my job as the mayor to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our council chambers. I'll go ahead and ask if there are any statements of disqualifications today from council members. Okay, seeing none, um, I'll go ahead and see if our clerk has any additions or uh, deletions to our council meeting agenda. Yes, yeah, so we have um, two department pulled items from consent number 12, which is the purchase of tasers and associated licenses and number 17, the purchase of two new pieces of heavy equipment. So we have um, item number 12 that is being polled on our consent agenda by staff, as well as item number 17, which is being polled by our consent agenda by staff. So those items will not be heard or discussed this afternoon. Right, they'll be postponed to another meeting. Postponed to another meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay. I'll uh, go ahead and share briefly that oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. Um, this evening. I'll go ahead and look to our city attorney at this time to report out on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. Um, this afternoon, the council convened in closed session at approximately 1 p.m. in the courtyard conference room. Before going into closed session, the council added as a subsequent need item, uh, one item of consideration of initiation of litigation um, circumstances that gave rise to the need uh, occurred after the posting of the agenda and uh, the council determined that there was a need to uh, take action on that item or to discuss potentially taking action um, prior to the next regular meeting. Um, that was a motion adopted unanimously. Um, council also heard three liability claims. Uh, the claims of Roman Felix, James Giannopoulos, and Dania Maria Tres Palacios. Um, those are also listed on your open session agenda as item 11. Um, I will be requesting as part of your consideration of uh, the consent calendar that you um, remove the claim of James Giannopoulos and take no action on it at this time. Um, the claim will likely return to the council for subsequent action at a future meeting. Um, lastly, there were two performance evaluations on the closed session agenda. Uh, of the city attorney and city manager. Um, there was no reportable action. Thank you. Okay. We have now an opportunity for um, our council members to report out on any external boards, committees, or joint powers authority meetings um, that they've been attending on behalf of their uh, role here as a city council member. We had a specific request um, to hear a report back on some of the work that the vice mayor and myself have been, have been doing in regards to a um, sort of a matrix flow chart for agendizing items. So we'll go ahead and share and report at, at this time on that, um, but we'll go ahead and reserve that uh, for after we hear from uh, the colleagues. So I'll start to my left, Councilmember Brown. All right, thank you. Uh, so the Regional Transportation Commission met on November 7th. 
uh, in Watsonville, and at that time, the RTC adopted its public participation plan, a final participation plan for uh, uh, 2019, and um, this is something that we're required to do by state and federal law under our authority um, to establish the process, but I just want to um, highlight that our, the RTC staff spent a considerable amount of time uh, really developing a plan that will provide opportunities for the public to engage in, uh, you know, programming and project implementation um, for the RTC, including development of our 2045 uh, Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan. It uh, <coughs> seems like a long way off, but transportation planning, as we know, takes, uh, these are long-term projects, very, very large-scale long-term long projects, many of them, and um, so we're getting started in that process. I encourage the public to check out the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission website for further information on opportunities to participate. Um, we also uh, did uh, approve some, just for your all of your information, the um, some moving forward on some repairs related to the Santa Cruz Branch rail line. Uh, particularly in the South County area where, you know, major disruptions occurred during the 2017 winter storms and kind of ongoing. So that is going to be a major undertaking to make the line, uh, the whole line usable in the future. And so we're moving ahead on that. So as we new segments come online, um, can keep moving forward. And I think that's all I have. The revenue subcommittee met again. We don't. Ha I don't know that we have any major updates. Report, We're report to come. <clears throat> report to come. Uh, yeah. And same with the high up health and all policies report to come. Um, on the Measure U implementation group, which is the city county partnership regarding um, uh, lobbying uh, around UCSC uh, growth impacts. Um, there was, um, as I think you know, a proposal to hire a part-time organizer um, that has been on hold for a while. But I do want to point out that um, UC is holding some community and campus meetings regarding <coughs> their long-range development plan. Um, two of them on Monday, December 2nd, um, will be held in the city of Santa Cruz, one at the lunch hour, one in the evening. Um, so I'll give these to the city clerk. Maybe these could go on our, uh, they're certainly relevant to the city. So maybe those can go on our, our city count, council uh, calendar or the city calendar. Um, the Mid-County Groundwater Agency, uh, which I've reported it on in the past, um, is achieving a major milestone. The board will be um, uh, asked to approve, and I believe will approve, the Groundwater Sustainability Plan uh, for the whole Mid-County Groundwater Basin um, that was prepared under a state mandate uh, that will be uh, adopted at the end of um, th this, this year, and it was due uh, by the end of January 2020, and we are ahead of schedule, and it has been brilliant. So um, that's been a great committee to work on. Um, regarding the Downtown Management Corporation, a couple of things. Um, our, our downtown <coughs> businesses participate in the Think Small um, uh, promotion that happens, uh, I think it's November 20th, uh, kind of kicks off the holiday season, and that's in partnership with the County Economic Development um, uh, staff and agency. Um, also, um, we met uh, some council members and staff met with um, people at the county regarding a possible program for uh, livening up some of the vacant windows downtown so that we have some combination of pop-ups, art, whatever, just to um, get some, um, some interest at the pedestrian level. So I think that's on a fast track. Um, low budget get it done, <laughs> um, and interest it on the part of the merchants to um, take a, a real role in that as well. Um, visit Santa Cruz County, um, uh, some of the uh, points of interest, uh, the tourism uh, income uh, reached a billion dollars this year in the county, so that's significant. Uh, occupancy at the hotels is softening, we got a report on that. Um, 
the uh, Visit Santa Cruz County has launched a new initiative. They, they adopted direction for two new marketing initiatives about a year ago. One was for heritage tourism. That's been initiated, been very well received, and they are gearing up for an LGBTQ initiative. They'll launch in January. Um, they've been doing a lot of training and uh, comparing with what other communities do, and uh, that we expect to also be very well received. Yeah. Councilman Browning. Thanks. I just um, one other mm -hmm. item that I overlooked but wanted to um, highlight is uh, the so I'm on the uh, area agency on aging council and the and our director has been uh, really actively engaged. I mean, one of the kind of most engaged and our team in Santa Cruz in the uh, work that happens in Sacramento. And so I wanna um, publicly acknowledge Clay Kemp for that work and also uh, <laughs> let you all know that the state is now undertaking a master plan on aging. And um, so most of the meetings that are, the public meetings that are happening are in Sacramento, but there is an opportunity for public engagement. Uh, so if folks are interested, that information, the draft master plan is available and you can go to the California uh, State Department of Health and Human Services website uh, to, to to go to a link to um, to either read it and or and review it and also make comments and learn more about other opportunities for engagement. This is a, a really um, critical issue. We the the goal and the you know the governor and the the legislature have made very public that they're interested in uh, producing a plan that really envisions an age friendly California. Um, and increase the diversity, the number and diversity of older adults and families and you know, opportunities for um, quality of life enhancements and, and other projects to acknowledge um, that we are an age-friendly community and an age-friendly state. Thanks for sharing. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, so <clears throat> it was last week, um, the library Downtown Library Subcommittee met and we discussed um, kind of next steps with, I think we all agreed that in order to make a decision about the library and where we're headed with that, that um, we'll have a uh, cost assessment and kind of design of what a renovation of the current library would look like. But um, I think many of us felt that we would also need an update on what a um, mixed use structure would look like since that's something that other folks in the communities are interested in the community is interested in. So um, we're looking into trying to um, find a contractor who can uh, give us what that would co what the cost would be for that and what that would look like. So that's forthcoming. Um, December 13th, um, we don't have the time set officially yet, but Jason Architect will be providing their final report to us on what the cost would be associated with the remodel. So um, we'll have those times posted on the uh, library subcommittee's website um, so that if people want to come to that, it will be public. Um, there won't be public comment, but the public will be able to come and see the presentation. And that'll be similar to the previous uh, presentation that Jason Architect provided on what the design would look like. Um, in addition to that, uh, LAFCO, the last meeting, uh, the commission unanimously approved the draft service review and staff recommendations for Mid Penn Regional Open Space District. Um, there's gonna be four service reviews scheduled for next year, and the commission unanimously approved uh, the multi-year work plan. And the commission unanimously, unanimously approved the meeting schedule for the next year, and we will be, the meeting times will change. LAFCO meetings will now be at 9 a.m., and the next meeting for LAFCO is gonna be January 8th at 9 a.m. And I think that's all I have to report. Maybe I'll just go ahead and, um, and we can go ahead and weigh in together on the other item. So um, at the uh, retreat, when we were discussing the work plan, the vice mayor and myself um, signed up to take a look at how the agendizing process flows and recognizing there's areas for improvement for everybody and um, looking forward to having some consistency and expectation on how you get things on the agenda or what that flow would look like. So we're working with um, our interim city manager, Laura, on a flow chart and essentially looking at sort of the types of um, items coming forward, how it will move forward in terms of urgency, workflow, um, time, time of staff to work on the item, and then how um, it would be moving towards a larger kind of a broader initiative which would require um, more than eight hours of work, which is essentially consistent with the council policy at this time, but more consistency on the um, 
on the criteria, essentially, of uh, understanding of the types of items that will be brought forward. And so what we're doing is trying to um, have that consolidated into a consistent kind of um, approach and protocol that would then go to inform updating our council policy handbook so that we have a better process in place. I mean, um, I'll, I'll see if my vice, if the vice mayor has anything he wants to add to, to that, but it should be coming soon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I think that's a good, great summary of where, where we've been at and what we've been working on with regards to the agenda. So. Thank you. So hopefully we'll be able to repair some of the um, areas where it feels that there isn't consistency or transparency. Council Member Carter. Thanks. Uh, yeah, good to hear about the progress on it. Um, just a little wavery on the timeline. Uh, soon is kind of subjective. So do you have like a specific timeline that's associated with it? Because I know that uh, myself and two other council members submitted a agenda report to try and get this on an actionable discussion item on the city council agenda for the reason that there wasn't a very clear timeline associated with it and a lack of information. So do you have any a timeline associated with it on when we can expect to see that report and uh, have it come back for action? Um, not, I mean, uh, likely within the next couple of months, but it depends on the items that are also on the agenda. But ideally it wouldn't require a lot to get on there. So if, if all goes as plans, depending on how the agendas open up, we'll ho hopefully have it in the next couple of, of months. Mm -hmm. Um, it's kind of tangentially related to this because we all realize that um, a new demand for dealing with something displaces some other activity. And um, I wonder if we could just, it doesn't need to be an agenda item again, just kind of report on where we are in city staffing because I think now we're short a planner and um, I don't need the answer now, but I mean, we, we recently had a report on staffing in the police department and I, I'm aware of some gaps, so that would just be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, and I think the process is, is intended also to incorporate some of that yeah. uh, discussion as part of items coming up yeah. and, and how they relate to the the work plan as well. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Councilor Carter. <laughs> um, I, I didn't see the agenda item that Councilmember Brown, Councilmember Glover, and myself put forward talking about agenda review process. What, what you just explained was not was not really related to some of the issues that we spoke about in our agenda report. And I'd still like to see that that report go appear on our agenda at the next meeting or the first meeting in, in December. Um, there was many other issues involved than what was just reported on. I would just say that, you know, I think that as we're kind of working on this process, if there are recommendations from other members of the city council with regards to agenda review and putting items on the agenda that, uh, you know, we recommend that you provide those to us so we can incorporate your feedback into this. Because personally, I think that, um, you know, having two separate committees working on a similar item really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I think that if council members have recommendations that they would like to see incorporated into this process that we can incorporate those and continue to work on that as we develop this agenda review process. So that would be my recommendation. And I'd just like to remind <clears throat> our colleagues that um, everybody agreed when we established this committee that it would be comprised of myself and the mayor. So, you know, if, if there are concerns that, that my colleagues have, I would just encourage you all to send us information so that we can incorporate it into this process. And essentially, I'll just um, also add that that was essentially the response that I had to the agenda report that since this work was already happening, that the information that was provided by the colleagues that wanted to bring forward that would be incorporated into our next meeting agenda for consideration. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. Yeah, my concern is just the process and how out of the public eye that it is. Um, this was the first that we have heard about a report back and that is only because we submitted an agenda item to be on the agenda. It also is very indicative of the problem uh, that there will maintain an issue of agenda building for as according to your timeline months as opposed to being able to move and have any kind of representation or community involvement in that process for months. So. I, I will just echo my concern from before. The timeline is very loose and non, there's no accountability really associated with it. And in those months leading up to that, it will still have this problem of certain council members feeling like their agenda items are not being prioritized or taken in consideration with the urgency, even if they're co-signed by two other council members. So there's a lot of problem associated with that and it, it's a much larger issue. So I would encourage that timeline to be sped up. And especially with what you mentioned in your report, about there being a limitation on staff time to be able to uh, 
apply it for those in the community that don't know, for a staff member to invest more than eight hours on any specific project, it needs direct uh, um, direction from the council. So to not agendize the conversation, but then to cite the need for additional staff hours as one of the roadblocks seems kind of counterintuitive, where if we brought it to the council for a reevaluation and an actual discussion and conversation like was originally requested, then we would have had the opportunity to provide that direction to, to staff and then given you that extra staff hours in which you could work through it. So the reasoning doesn't make any sense, the timeline doesn't make any sense, and it really is worrisome to me because there are council members here that feel like their issues are not being addressed. Okay, all right, so I have one additional report back and that's on the city select committee. That committee met um, last Friday and essentially there was just sort of a review from the various jurisdictions on some of the progress they're making on housing and um, some of the um, updates that they had for us to kind of hear about, as well as an update from LAFCO. And then uh, lastly, uh, I shared that the city of Santa Cruz was supporting the Santa Cruz County Civic Summit as a co-sponsor and encouraged the other jurisdictions to do so as well if they were available or had funding available, any little bit would help. And it's essentially looking <coughs> about how we can get our youth involved in the democratic process as well as understand um, sort of the work of the local elected official and that's going to be happening countywide in January and was proud that the city council and the city of Santa Cruz um, offered co-sponsorship and and hope and I'm hopeful that the other jurisdictions may as well um, additionally the um, upcoming meeting that I will re be reporting on is the CJC and that is not uh, taking place until Thursday and then lastly the health and all policy subcommittee will be returning with a um, proposal and recommendation um, soon and so that's all I have councilmember Myers uh, I just have a couple of items. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm on the finance and audit committee for the uh, Santa Cruz Metro. We did meet last week and we did um, pass the 10 year CIP, um, unfunded CIP plan, uh, and also um, a, a, a revenue. Um, <coughs> A re revenue policy that will be coming to our board this coming Friday. Um, one item of interest in, in the work that we did as the finance committee is we continue to support and put forward um, $4 million for the Pacific Station project. So that will be planning money that is um, utilized uh, from Metro to continue to work with the city on developing out, uh, developing a uh, plan for, for the Pacific Station, uh, affordable housing and combined projects um, and so that's exciting news. The other item I will quickly look at, some of the other members have uh, updated some of the items, or some of the meetings I was, uh, the, the last one I'll update is uh, the Cal Working Group will be meeting next week um, to talk about further um, activities surrounding uh, the water quality at Cal's Beach. We did um, premiere a short video uh, regarding the work done to date. Uh, that was shown at a, the Save the Waves um, uh, surf uh, movie festival last week at Patagonia, several hundred people, about 200 people I think were there. And uh, so it was nice to see our work um, demonstrated with other stories from around the world with people working on protecting their beaches and water quality and working uh, as with communities to to, um, to uh, provide, you know, just clean water for, for people to enjoy. So um, I have asked Save the Waves. They are planning to also come give us a, a similar review of the movie or the video, and probably after the first of the year, we'll get that scheduled. So it was uh, well done. Yeah. I think that's it for me. Yeah. Councilman McLeaver. Uh, none of the committees I've been on have met since our last meeting when we did a report back, but just a reminder to the community that our next public safety committee meeting, I believe, is scheduled for December 2nd. Um, our next uh, community uh, committee that, uh, it's called the CAG, Community Outreach mm -hmm. Committee, or a group, Community Advisory Group. Um, it's gonna meet again on December 19th, but I thought it was in, uh, instructive that the, uh, the chancellor reached out to staff and faculty uh, in, a, in a public meeting um, 
and she talked about a few things that I thought were interesting. Um, we have more Pell Grant recipients who graduated than all other institutions in the United States, which I thought was just a really great thing. We have 70% uh, of first year students, excuse me, 49% um, of, of this year's class is first generation students. Um, what the chancellor stressed was in, in her own work with the university, she wants to improve efficiency and um, align communication in the organization, data informed decision making. And I was really happy to hear that she wanted to talk about budget transparency and accountability because we know that UC has had some problems in that area. Um, she just mentioned as a side note, Student Housing West, not you know being caught up in litigation and um, really had no uh, Insight, or, or you know, when we might see some building on campus as far as uh, new new dorm space. Um, people uh, brought up to her the issues of students sleeping in their vehicles and being ticketed for that. Uh, she said that that is not in the plan to allow a par safe parking area on campus for students. And um, I was able to speak at, at the meeting. I wasn't going to, but when she talked about that, I thought it really uh, intersected with a. A city issue, um, and I asked her to reconsider that, and she said she she would, but you know, but that's within other committees, and she'll you take it up the, the staff. The same thing as far as compensation for staff, um, she would also take. You know, she's talking about staff turnover; it's very constant, and of course, we all know that it's about rent, and that's you know, people are paying 50 to 70 percent of their salaries in rent. Um, there's actually students and staff relying on food banks, and um, students also. Uh, getting EBT, um, which used to be known as food stamps. Um, but I thought it was a, a, a really productive meeting. She said that the strikes will continue because uh, there's periodic strikes up there all the time. And I know our police department um, works with the university police on that. So that's like an expenditure that we, that we do. And it really screws up a lot of things on campus. Um, they happen like two to three times uh, every quarter. Um, but that's all for that. And um, we have our next CAG meeting um, December 19th. Should we update? Yes, yeah, so just a couple of updates. First, with respect to the Library Joint Powers Authority, a couple of items to note that uh, the board has been uh, discussing. One is uh, relates to the uh, staffing model with the library system. Uh, a couple of reasons that are driving that. One is the uh, uh, the fact that the current model is implemented you know, during the recession and uh, uh, driven largely by the need to uh, make uh, budget adjustments or, or, or a deficit that the library was, was facing. And also with the new libraries that are coming online um, here pretty soon, there's really a need to really look at that because some of the library branches are expanding in terms of size and capacity. Uh, like for example, the New Felton branch and even uh, some uh, <coughs> Aptos branch and, and some of the other branches. And so uh, we're having conversations about uh, developing a, a more appropriate model for the library that has uh, implications on the budget, which drives us to the second topic that we're discussing, which is uh, the, our financing agreement with the county which uh, we have one that's been in place for approximately five years, will expire pretty soon. And uh, we're in a place now where we need to really negotiate that. And I think the conversations there are going really well. We started them with the county. Uh, our last agreement uh, where the county sort of held back to some of the library fund uh, 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 monies uh, we're talking about uh, really changing that back to we're all contributing in, in a, a proportionate and appropriate fashion uh, so that it makes the library systems more sustainable. So there's progress on that too. So those are the probably the biggest, uh, two bigger issues that we're discussing at the library. Then with respect to the 911 center, uh, we had a meeting recently, I think just to highlight there, we had actually our own fire chief, uh, Jason Hyduke, do a presentation on the South, South Bay uh, ma management incident team. And I uh, can't recall whether he's discussed it here, but it's basically a, uh, a team of volunteer, primarily fire personnel, but other personnel from Santa Clara County and Santa Cruz County who are available to create these uh, response incident teams uh, to jurisdictions or special districts or entities who face a major event. So for example, when Gilroy had that uh, shooting incident, the team was quickly put together and they make themselves available to provide any number of services that that particular jurisdiction or incident uh, requires. Like in, in the case of, of Gilroy, they help put together the communications function. Uh, but they're available to any jurisdiction to basically assist and come in in whatever is needed. And so that's just a brand new, really timely uh, needed uh, new, new resource that's being implemented in our 
uh, county along with us, uh, uh, Santa Clara County. So that, that's it. Thank you very much. And thanks to everyone for sharing uh, the work you're doing outside of our meetings here on Tuesdays. Okay, at this time we'll move along on our agenda. So we have next on the agenda, which is the council meeting calendar. Um, and this is a time for our clerk to provide any updates to our uh, council meeting calendar. I don't have anything, so. Council Member Myers. Yeah, I'd like to um, make a motion to add an item to one of our upcoming uh, uh, meetings. So I'm putting the motion up here. Um, so I'd like to move to direct staff to contact the county to identify immediate winter shelter opportunities with availability identified by date certain and to bring revisions of the camping and other ordinances that are as appropriate to provide an enforceable mechanism for addressing nuisance conditions on public property in a matter that is consistent with the Knights District, uh, Knight Circuit Court uh, opinion in Martin versus Boise. I'll second that. We have a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Brown. My understanding is this is an item that um, stemmed from an uh, uh, earlier uh, item that was brought to our attention in a closed session and is intended to be on the next council meeting agenda. Is that correct? As, I, as I soon, believe as, as soon as, as possible. As soon as yes. possible. But hopefully next. We'll make agenda. it happen. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so we have a, a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Uh, Council I, I'm Brown. just assuming that we're, there will be a discussion included, implicit in, in the motion is a discussion of what's going on with Camp Ross right now, or the Camp Ross 2, or we've had a lot of people uh, writing and calling us. Can, uh, Mr. Kandadi, do you want to speak to that? Very Give briefly. Number, please. Um, I, I think that's inevitable. Okay. But also I just need to admonish the council that because this is not on your agenda for today, you can't have a discussion about it. And so it's just for the agenda. Uh, you really just the need counter. to call the question. Okay. But fair, fair enough to say that that, that uh, I think is on everybody's minds and, and mm. part of the discussion. Thank you for that. Okay, Councilman Brown. So, uh, the, so the motion would be to direct staff to agendize these, this, and with this language, agendize this for the purposes of this context under our council meeting calendar item. Okay, all those in favor, well, please. Council Member Glover. Just to clarify on this, would that open up the conversation for other winter shelter options that could be enacted by the city during this agenda item, or would that have to be a separate agenda item on city solutions to winter shelter instead of just pressuring the county? I interpret winter shelter opportunities to not just mean those identified by the county. Okay, and then, um, and you said that the conversation of the encampment behind the Gateway Plaza is implicit in this motion, or it should be added specifically in this motion? Because I don't, I, I, I think I've gotten to the point where I'm kind of nervous about it's implicit, implicit or, you It's know, implicit. <laughs> I would appreciate it if we could add language in there specifically to address the, uh, the growing encampment behind the Gateway Plaza. Is shopping that, center. Is that appropriate at this time, Mr. Condotti, in terms of? It's a friendly amendment, right? Without um, any discussion. This is a very unusual circumstance. That's right, that's um, how I feel about it. Yes. I, I would suggest that you vote on the motion and there may be a subsequent motion. A after your interpretation of it being an implicitly uh, possible for a discussion to ensue at that time. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Councilmember Glover. Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a motion to agendize for discussion and action the uh, growing encampment behind Ross and the city's participation in supporting its success or whatever you want, just discussing it, I guess. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, Councilmember Cronin. Mr. Do you have something you want to add? I just wanted to add that we, just for your information, we did put out a statement on sort of just right now on the status of the Ross encampment so that we can inform the community on where we're at with that and we'll continue to do that to provide information on that. Yep. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Brown. Um, obviously the Ross encampment is on everybody's mind but is not by any means the only uh, growing encampment in the city limits. There's Pogo Nip, there's uh, Coral Street comes and goes. There's all over the city we're getting complaints. So uh, I think we need to deal with the bigger issue and not just the Ross camp. I don't, I don't. Okay, so um, 
uh, before we get into a discussion on this topic, I, I think I, wait, I, we've already kind of voted to agendize this as a topic that I think can encompass what the next motion, this motion is about to come back, at, uh, ideally the next meeting in November. Um, Councilmember Brown. Well, I am interested in having that conversation as well. So if the, if this is about um, inclusion of a discussion about uh, the Ross camp in that agenda item, I would support that if, if your interest is simply in making it explicit. So moved. So the clarifying um, language is that the interest in learning about any updates around the Ross encampment would be included in the item that is was voted on prior to this now motion. For the 26th. The 26th, correct. correct. Mr. McIndotty? Yeah. Okay, without further discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Do you have questions? I did. <laughs> uh, I brought up the point of... Um, discussing the encampments that are occurring throughout the city. I think, it, in this I, I think it's fair to assume that in discussing an ordinance um, in, and uh, winter shelter opportunities, um, part of that discussion will have to at least be uh, with, with the thought kept in mind that we have um, <coughs> unorganized homeless encampments interspersed throughout the city and that the and that the situation seems to be becoming more and more visible. So I think it's implicit that the council will have an opportunity to discuss not just the, the Ross encampment, but others as well, including the one on the other side of Highway 9. So the purposes of how we are right now for this meeting calendar agenda item without getting into discussion, how would we proceed under the Brown Act in terms of, is that just noted for consensus I, by the council? Yes, I think the motion's withdraw. been made and I believe it's been adopted. So. Okay, okay, any further comment? Any opposing? Okay, so that was adopted unanimously. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. So um, first up is our consent agenda, and we had items 12 pulled from the consent agenda. We had item 17 pulled from the consent agenda, and we had a um, recommendation from our city attorney's uh, office to um, not uh, incorporate the James... Um, right, the, the item, do, item 11 does not need to be pulled, but I would just request um, that... Uh, Subsection B, the James Giannopoulos claim be removed from the agenda. Okay, so that's noted. So only items 12 and 17 have been pulled. Okay, so um, our consent agenda items are six through uh, 16 now with item 12 omitted. Um, is there any member of the uh, community wanting to address the council on our consent agenda items? Okay, seeing none, um, are there any council members who wish to speak to the consent agenda? Councilmember Glover. I'd like to pull item six. Okay. Councilmember um, Matthews. I have a couple of comments on seven and 10. I don't need to pull them, but I'd like to make the comments. Okay. Okay. Any other items to be pulled? Councilmember Glover. Just want to make a comment on 16. Okay. <laughs> Councilmember Brown. Um, I have a question on number 13. Okay. So we have item six pulled um, from the consent agenda. I jumped the gun on the community um, public comment portion. Is there any member of the community who wants to speak to us on either item six or any of our consent agenda items at this time? Item six or the consent agenda is at large. Six will pull. Six, we'll, we'll, six we'll deal pulled. separately. We'll deal with separately. So you're, you're not speaking to item six? Oh, yes. I, I thought you were asking if I wanted to speak to Okay, item. we'll go ahead and why don't we go ahead and take, we'll go ahead and take that later, okay? We'll get you, we'll get you in a second. Okay, so we had a question um, on item seven. Um, is that correct? Yeah, okay. that was oh, me. Matthews. Uh, that was the minutes of the last meeting and it had to do with an item. It's on our page seven um, dash or hyphen. 20, uh, a friendly amendment. This is the public hearing on 190 West Cliff, and um, it was having to do with um, 
being explicit about the affordable units, pursuing a preference for those who live and it reads who live and work in Santa Cruz, but my intention and the way it actually goes on the tape is who live or work. Okay. And that's a pretty important distinction. So uh, with I, I talked with the clerk about that. So uh, if we can just, when we make the motion, incorporate that correction, that'll be fine. And is, this, oh, um, is there any, before we move on, is there any objection to that change? Thank you for catching that. Okay, go right ahead. And then um, regarding item, <coughs> 10, which is setting the dates for the annual advisory body interviews, appointments, and reappointments. Um, I do notice that there's an appointment for my appointee to the CPVAW, and um, I got a communication from my appointee, Leela Kramer. Um, there have been some just speculations out there about the motivation for her um, submitting her resignation, and um, she did write to me, and I told her I would read this, um, and this has to do with the vacancy. So uh, I'm reading now her comment. Thank you so much for your understanding. I'm disappointed, uh, more disappointed than anyone about not completing my full term on the commission. You're right that I was reluctant to step down as I strongly believe in CPVAW's mission and the work we are doing. I submitted my letter of resignation from CPVAW because my father has been in the hospital seven times this year and isn't doing well. He's in palliative care and frequently in the hospital. His ill health did not leave me with any available time to continue volunteering as vice chair on CPVAW, which is the only reason I tendered my resignation. It was a very hard decision and not taken lightly. So I wanted to share that with council members and the public. Thank you. Okay, and then um, there was a question, um, or did you have additional comments on item 16? Okay, and there's a question on item 13. 13, yeah. Um, so this is uh, for those who are watching the uh, an item on uh, resol uh, resolution to um, amend, re revising a resolution for a prior amendment to the general plan, acknowledging our local hazard mitigation plan effective date. Um, and so I just, the, it, the question that has been kind of on my mind, which I wanted to ask is, um, to try to get some, and I know that the local coastal plan is something that the planning department has been working on for quite a while and is hoping to um, get finished um, as soon as possible and we keep giving you uh, additional items which uh, waylay the process. Um, so this is not uh, any commentary on the, the timing, but I'm just wondering, in as of now, how is the, um, how is this handled is uh, when a uh, coastal related item is appealed, what general plan applies when there is an item that's appealed? I know this has come up. Um, as I read it, um, where the local coastal plan is dependent on an outdated uh, general plan. So I'm just kind of wondering how you approach that, if you could. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Mayor. Lee Butler, I'm the planning director, and that is correct. Um, the in the coastal zone, the uh, land use transportation diagram that is applied is from our prior general plan. Similarly, there are a set of policies from our prior general plan that um, represent the local coastal plan um, component of our general plan. And that reverts back to, again, portions of the prior general plan and not our current <coughs> general plan. We have initiated an effort to update that and um, we've talked about that a number of times with the council. I will say um, even with the many competing priorities, this is something that is very important to um, <coughs> the city in terms of getting the most up-to-date um, policies in place and the work that um, Dr. Tiffany Wise West was discussing earlier with the coastal resilience would be updating a portion of our local coastal program to address sea level rise policies in particular and um, coastal erosion um, and related topics. Our intended goal is to move those in parallel so that we can build on the work that has been done over the past few years and have those come uh, before the commission, uh, before the council and then if 
the council approves it then before the Coastal Commission at the same um, or very close timing. Um, the grant requires that it's done by the end of next year. There's still a lot of work to be done, particularly in terms of outreach and um, coordination with the Coastal Commission on our overall update. And so that is our target. There are certainly constraints in meeting that target, but one that we're hoping to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, perfect. Okay, um, last I have is a comment for item number 16, Councilmember Glover. Yes, great, thank you. Uh, so uh, good to see, really appreciate the work that's being done in um, rejuvenating and restoring the revegetation work that's going on around some of the different projects associated especially with the water department. So shout out to the water department and making sure to revitalize and rejuvenate the locations. I just wanna make a statement on the record with regards to uh, any mo um, contracts moving forward, I would just urge that we uh, in all work plans of installing and doing revegetation work that is applicable to try and incorporate low income if not, uh, if possible, unsheltered or unhoused folks to participate in that work if, if possible. Okay, so I think that concludes um, the council comments, <coughs> questions in regards to our consent agenda um, items uh, with item 12 and 17 um, being removed. Um, any uh, further discussion? Seeing none, I'll, I'll entertain a motion at this time. Uh, well, I'll move the consent agenda, I think six was, was also pulled. pulled. Yeah, yeah. Pulled. I'll second that. Okay. Yeah. So I'll move consent agenda with everything except 12 and 17. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, that's a motion by Councilmember Matthews, mm -hmm. seconded by Councilmember Myers. That incorporates the modification mm -hmm. that Mr. Condotti brought up for the library. As well as Councilmember Matthews. And the and correction and to the minutes. As well as correction Councilmember minutes, Matthews' right. correction to the minutes. And item 17, I think. Yeah, was I said that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Did you have a question? Yeah, okay. So. Did the clerk catch that all? Okay, great. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. So we'll go ahead and um, revisit item number six, which was pulled by Councilmember Glover um, to go ahead and address us on that. Thank you. So this has to do with the bail schedule associated with fines um, that are connected to citations that are given out. Uh, I, as the chair of the Public Safety Committee meeting, was a little confused to see it on the agenda today uh, because the motion that was given and the direction that was given to staff at the Public Safety Committee meeting was to have the city attorney consider the addition of a study session and the item that would take a broader look at the impact and enforcement of fees and fines on homeless and low-income individuals. So it seems, uh, I, I just want to get a little clarity as to why we're voting on this now since we haven't had the opportunity for that more robust study session and or uh, to solicit more community input or involvement associated with that. Also, uh, in the agenda report that was submitted with this item, there is reference to the Finlandian model from okay. Finland that has uh, citations and fees associated with an individual's income. So I would be ex uh, interested in exploring that implementation of the bail schedule as well, um, especially pertaining to some of the, uh, the costs associated with uh, the fines that are listed here, which include $1,000 of failure to appear. And looking at the analysis that has been put out, I think it was uh, in an email by the police chief in a response to um, a community member, uh, but looking at the amount of people that don't appear, so the potential impact that could have on low-income folks could be rather large. So I just wanted to get some clarity on that as to why we haven't had an, a study session before this came back before the council, or uh, if you could kind of enlighten me on that. Thank you. Um, fair question. This item is uh, one that comes before the council on an annual basis uh, in, in which we take a look at ordinances that the council has adopted over the prior year. And in order for them to be enforceable, um, we need to provide the court with an update to the bail schedule, which lists the amount of the fine that is um, to be imposed by the court. If we don't have it in <coughs> the bail schedule, when a case comes before a judge, the the case will just be dismissed because they don't have guidance from the city as to what the amount of the fine is. Um, we did talk at the Public Safety Committee um, about having a broader discussion about the impact of enforcement of the municipal code generally on people who, um, who don't have adequate means um, and 
and in my view that was a broader discussion that um, I didn't interpret the direction as having it precede council action on the on the bail schedule which is really sort of just a ministerial uh, action on the on the part of the um, on the part of the council so um, so I, I think having such a discussion is a, a great idea as the report points out um, the Finlandia model has not been implemented in the United States and probably or we we believe has potential um, vulnerabilities to a legal challenge on equal protection grounds under the um, both the United States and, and state constitutions. Um, but that being said, um, perfectly appropriate for the council to have a discussion in a workshop or whatever forum the council um, prefers. We just think that that is a discussion um, geared more towards um, a broader discussion of enforcement of the municipal code generally than it is the bail schedule. So that's how I interpreted the council direction. I apologize if, if I misinterpreted that. Councilor McGovern and Councilor Myers. Yeah, no, I, have, I appreciate that. Thank you, um, City Attorney Condotti. I think uh, I, as well as uh, uh, at least one other member of the committee, was surprised to see it come back without it coming for a study session, especially since that meeting took place on October 14th. So it seems like we could have, if we wanted to, potentially discussed and or structured some kind of a, a study session prior to this meeting of it coming back. And I do want to acknowledge your statement of it just being a ministerial action, which I totally understand. My concern there is that in moving forward and approving a ministerial action without adequate analysis of the impacts of people, then in the interim, after we pass the ministerial action, those people that fall through the cracks in the meantime before we hit the study session and before we're able to adequately evaluate it to make sure that everyone is protected uh, from disproportionate impact. So that's just my concern around here and I'm happy to make a motion for us to schedule a, or to prioritize a, a study session if that would give clear, uh, clear instruction or how would you like to, to approach that? Um, well, I, I think the council certainly has the prerogative of, of delving further into this question of enforcement and, and how we can effectively enforce <coughs> the rules that the council has um, prepared for a, a vast uh, number of different issues and areas, um, not all of which um, result in citations that are that are issued disproportionately to lower income or homeless individuals. Um, so for us, this is, you're right, it's a, it's a housekeeping matter. Um, and I would just take direction from the council as to how to schedule that broader policy discussion. I would just remind the council that um, this is not the first time this item's been on the agenda. I think it goes back to May or, or June. Thank you. Right. I would just say, and then I know Councilmember Myers has to, like one of the things that I see here is also the fact that we would then, we now are adopting some um, new updates to some of our policies as you suggested, for example, the flavored tobacco. So I'd like to see this move forward because absent us, I think adopting this now, right? Correct, the uh, courts would not be able to impose those fines for the vendors who are um, moving forward with selling flavored tobaccos uh, products um, with our ordinance in place. Is that correct, Mr. Condotti? That's right. Okay. Okay, um, Council Member Myers. Yeah, I'll just um, reflect just as a member of the Public Safety Committee. Um, this is a ministerial action and, and, I, and, and there's many, many um, pieces to the bail schedule that, that, you know, have to do with other types of uh, infractions. And so I think, I think it's important to move forward with um, what, is, what has become you know, an annual update regarding um, schedules uh, per uh, new ordinances. Um, I think that uh, we also learned during the Public Safety Committee discussion of this um, that the court does uh, really consider quite extensively the uh, one's ability to actually pay <laughs> these fines. And so there's a pretty extensive program uh, that the court does use uh, with people who do come forward with uh, hardship around doing the fines. And so I think that there is programmatic approach to making sure people are able to continue to um, to um, be successful without having having these fines weighing them down uh, or uh, in conflict with, you know, their their housing or employment or what other kinds of things that that um, 
they're worried about. So I just wanna make sure that that's uh, publicly stated that uh, there is there is ways that people can uh, get relief from from this, but uh, I think if I, I, do, I think we're sort of falling out of the, the uh, realm of the public safety task force or public safety committee when we're starting to move into homelessness and other um, issues or people who um, are, are lower income communities. So I, I, I just I hope we're I hope we can get the bail schedule done and then I think maybe there's a larger um, strategic planning discussion about some of these other policy topics. I appreciate that. Mr. Condotti, did you have No, something? I think that was a great um, comment and, and uh, it reminded me of a couple of things. First is that in, in many of the uh, additions to the bail schedule that are presented here, the fines are actually specified in the ordinance that the city council adopted. So we're just taking the policy decision of the city council and implementing it into our schedule. The second point is that um, you know, judges, notwithstanding this technicality of having a bail schedule, have broad discretion in imposing fines and penalties. Um, and and if, if a person takes the time to appear in court and, and ask the court either for um, a, a payment plan, which can be very, um, um, manageable uh, or a reduction in fine due to financial circumstances or the need to attend to uh, a loved one or to um, uh, for work related purposes. Courts are very uh, um, flexible and and um, and really do try to to take that into consideration in imposing penalties. So so the so the numbers that are listed here don't necessarily get. Um, applied by the court in every instance, particularly when someone takes the trouble to go to court and plead their case. The judicial discretion, okay. Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Crown and then Councilmember Garner. Yeah, um, so I was happy to hear that, and it it makes sense that the court um, does and or can and, and they do consider hardship in paying fines. However, um, my, it is discretionary. I mean, I think it's worth pointing out that is that is discretionary, and um, so that is up to individual judges. It's not necessarily programmatic. I mean, I I like it to be. Um, I would be interested in um, seeing if there's an additional conversation to be had with the courts uh, regard, and maybe the public safety committee could um, try to work on this to figure out what might be needed to. Um, consider an income-based fine method um, so that uh, we can address those equity issues um, through some kind of means testing. I understand the concern about constitutionality, but if there's a way to do it, um, they the report back is that they currently cannot do that, and perhaps it's um, something that with some attention and commitment could be addressed. Um, so I'd be interested in uh, the council, maybe the members of the council who are most interested in this might um, pursue that. Um, I also understand the that this is a ministerial and cleanup item and so I am inclined to move forward on that today, but I don't want to leave it to just say, well, we'll consider the policy, kind of broader policy questions at a future date without some kind of um, commitment that, you know, and I'm happy to work on an agenda item with other council members to do that, to bring it back. But I do wanna not just say, well, we'll think about it later and then not do go in that direction. I think it is a conversation that we ought to have. If I could just, <clears throat> add a little bit more to that. Um, I, I don't mean to take or make light at all of the circumstances that many people, lower income people especially have with um, racking up fines that they're unable to pay and then having that be turned over to collections. And, and, and you know, we've read about not um, just in Santa Cruz, but in, um, areas all over the country about what a vicious cycle that can become for people uh, of lower or moderate income um, and how it really impairs their ability to, to function in society. And so we take that uh, very much to heart and I am, you know, and 
partly as a result of the Public Safety Committee's discussion, um, I've begun to work with the Chief of Police on uh, coming up with a program to, to try to rectify that situation in some way, whether it's an amnesty program or uh, some other mechanism that we can use to help people get back on their feet if they are willing to step forward and take some reasonable measures um, themselves. And so uh, I don't have um, that in a, in a uh, digestible form yet because we've just started the discussion after the last um, public safety committee meeting, but I do hope to bring something along those lines forward in the coming year. Seems that it would be also really behoove us or you in your efforts to reach out to the courts to understand what they're doing, to understand what's available and then any potential partnership or gaps to be filled. We will be doing that and, and um, I, my deputy city attorney, Stephanie Duck is here and she's been um, uh, doing, spending a lot of time in the courts lately and she's, um, she's gonna be part of that discussion and in part of the communication with the judges, public defenders and the district attorney's office so that we can um, hopefully have a productive discussion about how we can address some of these issues. Sounds like that'll be forthcoming. Um, did you have additional comments, Council Vice Mayor? No? I'd just like to say that I agree with you know, what my colleagues and the city attorney are saying around you know, trying to address this issue and look into it more. And um, and personally, and I don't know how the members of the Public Safety Committee feel, but I feel like that's a, a great forum for having these kinds of discussions. And it's a reason why these types of committees exist for our community so that these discussions can be had um, by members of our city council and they can bring back recommendations to us. And so I really hope that um, something is able to be addressed in terms of um, kind of looking at our bail schedule and how it's set up and whether there are ways to see if we can make this something that um, isn't dis disproportionately um, negatively impacting low-income people. Um, I do, however, <clears throat> looking through this, I've seen that there's a number of updates that I think that we really care about. Um, we have violations for non-payment of relocation assistance for displaced tenants. I think that that's something that we want to see that if there's landlords out there who aren't um, you know, providing relocation assistance to their tenants that they're held accountable. There's also, um, you know, having illegal short-term rentals. Additionally, um, as was mentioned earlier about tobacco. So I think that there are a number of things on here that we, it would be in our best interest and the community's best interest to update today. And then we can continue working with the county to better understand how we can revise our bail schedule so that in the future um, we're maybe coming at it in, in a different way. So that's um, kind of, why I'm feeling like we need to move this forward today and continue these conversations moving forward. Councilor McCrum. Thank you, thank you for um, what you said, Tony, too. I appreciate that uh, type of thought that you and the police chief are, are putting into it. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm looking at the thing, like sometimes it'll, uh, it says, um, uh, may be charged as infraction at discretion of city attorney for example, that's 9.36.030. I'm just taking it as an example, and it's on page 6.3 of the uh, staff report. Um, is that, so when it says um, 150.75, does the, is the 150 uh, what the fine is, and the 75 has, is the discretion of the city attorney, or the 75 is a new, is a new fee? That is an addition, and um, to just provide a little bit more background on this, um, the municipal code generally provides the city attorney with the discretion to charge any offense that is listed as a misdemeanor as an infraction. And so um, where we have may be charged as an infraction at the discretion of the city attorney, that is the result of our office filing uh, a charge as an infraction based upon a misdemeanor uh, citation and having the court say that they can't process that because we don't have an infraction listed in the bail schedule. <laughs> okay, so now the 75 would be so the infraction? So it's what we do already, but the 75 would be the infraction. Okay, right? um, and the entering condemned property and failure to appear or post bail, are those new fines or have they all been updated? I don't see a previous, but it, it, there are the first two on page 6.3. I don't know if you have the same thing that I'm looking at, 4.02. Point zero eight zero. One and three. Yes. Um, in addition to 
adding municipal code sections that have been amended by the council over the prior year. We also almost every year identify um, violations that weren't for whatever reason incorporated into the bail schedule. So, so this is just um, correcting a clerical error. To me, that those two aren't, aren't aren't the kind of things that I would like to see go forward as far as you know what we're doing here. Um, that's a thousand dollars on each offense, and I, I want to compare that to the. Um, did you did you was the surf school changed or has it always been a hundred, two hundred, and one thousand? The surf school Violation penalties surf? are specified by the municipal code. I know, but it, has it changed from? Uh, I thought it was a thousand before, and now I see. For the first offense, it's 100, and the second offense is 200. It hasn't, it hasn't been changed recently. And why wouldn't we go for a um, uh, entering condemned property 100, 200, 1,000? Why would we just go right to 1,000? This, this is um, the circumstance that arises when the building department determines that there's an, uh, an immediate uh, hazardous condition, such as um, uh, faulty electrical leaking gas, you know, that constitutes um, an imminent hazard to the occupants of a residence and it gets red tagged. And so when that occurs, um, generally in the uniform building code, it specifies it as a misdemeanor with a thousand dollar fine. And um, as re with respect to uh, the mayor and vice mayor's comments about, you know, maybe moving forward with flavored tobacco or with the short-term vacation rentals or other things the vice mayor mentioned, C can we just move forward with certain things that council members want to move forward with now and then later after our study session, bring this back? I suppose that's up to the discretion of the city council. Okay, maybe, and, we, could, maybe we could pause and then um, entertain a motion after we hear from the public in the interest of time with that, uh, unless you had additional questions that you needed to have answered. Well, I just wanted to say that I, I was hoping that the council might, um, might direct the Public Safety Committee also to meet with the courts or, and, and, and have that, that discussion as well to find out, because I haven't seen any numbers. I don't know how many people are, you know, that, 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 that they're dealing with and uh, as far as uh, infractions and then what the judges are uh, deciding. It's not, it's not clear at all. It uh, hasn't been made clear to the Public Safety Committee at least. Or to, or to this body. Okay, why don't we go ahead and pause, and then we'll, I know Councilmember Glover wanted something to say, and so, so did Vice Mayor Cummings. We'll go ahead and see if there's any member of the community who wants to address us on this item. This is item number six on our consent agenda. Please come forward and you'll have two minutes. I'm not sure. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, the problem I see here is what's been addressed is the these fines affect uh, people with very little means a lot more than somebody that has a good job and is pulling in, you know, working for Google or Facebook or somebody and pulling in big, big bucks. Um, the other thing is that this bail schedule as listed in the staff report is kind of uh, dishonest because it shows like, say, there's a $20 fine for doing something. Well, actually, if you go to court, there's all these court fees that get piled on top of that, which turn a $20 fine into a $200 fine. And that becomes even more unreasonable for people with no means. So there's gotta be some solution, either that they could go to the finance office and pay this $20 fine and not have all these court fees piled on top of it or do something to reduce these fines and the, you know, the court costs are astronomical when you consider a $20 fine turns into a $200 fine. So if there's some way to alleviate that, um, it would go a long way to helping people with uh, no means or very little means. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the community, we'll go ahead and read. Oh, did you, would you like to speak to the council? Please come forward. Is there any other members of the community wanting to address us on this item? Please come forward. I mean, if there's others, you're welcome to line up to my left or if you're my, our, our last mic, you can be our last over there. Go ahead. Hi, okay, uh, this doesn't affect me personally, but it affects a friend of mine. A friend of mine was accused of committing a crime of assaulting their partner. 
and got into a verbal argument and they were arrested for this crime. They went to court and they had issues with missing work because they had to go to the court case for this crime that they did not commit. Ultimately, my friend had to pay bail for the crime that they did not commit. That meant because they didn't have the money, they had to go to a bail bondsman and they had to pay them a percentage of this fee. Then later, when this person went to court and they were acquitted of this crime, they still owed the bail bondsman money. And this is a person who is low income, who was previously a member of our community, who is now no longer a member of our community because this person couldn't afford to pay bail and had to miss work for a crime that they did not commit and they were not recompensed for this loss. So thank you for listening. Okay, Mike. Is there any other members of the community wanting to address this on this item? Okay, seeing then you'll be our last speaker. Hi, uh, excuse me. I'm Mike Rotkin, a citizen of Santa Cruz. Um, I'm just responding to uh, something that Scott Graham had suggested to you about the court putting its fees on top of the bail schedule that the city passes, which is definitely the case, and it's many times more than the actual bail fee the city passes. I tried to address this issue when I was on the city council decades ago. And the reality is you have no choice but to go to court. A person has a right to go to court to defend themselves or to be found guilty or innocent of whatever they've been charged with. So there's no way to have the city apply a fine that doesn't have ultimately the courts making the decision about whether it's fair to find them at all. And once you find them, the court controls what their court costs are. And I, I tried very hard to sort of say, well, you know, how come it's three times or 10 times as much for the, the court cost added on? We have no control over that as a city. And so while it seems like a great idea, it's ultimately not, it's not a fruitful path to sort of go down. You're gonna have to look more at the issue of, you know, what kinds of things could be done in lieu of giving people fines or things like that, which are possible. But that, that's one that won't work, even though it, I, I appreciate Scott suggesting it because I thought it was a great idea myself. It just can't be done. Thank you for that. Okay. Any, uh, seeing no other members of the community, we'll go ahead and return back to um, the Council for Action, Council Member Glover, and then Vice Mayor Cumming. Thanks. Uh, so first I want to compliment Mr. Graham on his shirt. That is a fantastic shirt. Uh, super, super relevant in today's day and age. Um, so uh, I just want to assure it was mentioned by uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, I totally agree that there are things on the on the bail schedule that we want to move forward. Absolutely. So I don't want to hinder or block our ministerial responsibility, especially to issues, say, like protecting renters and holding landlords accountable for uh, some of the different things that may be taking place in our community. Um, so if we can figure out a way to pass the majority of them, except for some of the more problematic ones, like the ones that Councilmember Crone brought up, and then re uh, refer them to the Public Safety Committee. I think that might be uh, a good way to move forward, at least for those first two, which um, were the inhabit in, in, inhabiting a condemned building, and then f I think failing to appear in court. Um, yeah, and then also, just to, uh, I appreciate the perspective of. Attorney Kandati, as well as some of my colleagues up here on the council with regards to the courts and their willingness to forgive uh, fines and everything. I personally went on the court website and kind of pretended like I was someone that was trying to find how to get my fines reduced. And even getting to the page where you have to put in your citation information to find out your fine was a little confusing, uh, for especially for someone that may not be used to using technology, so if there's a liaison or something, then that is another reason why I think we should have a clear conversation with the courts and as uh, maybe not to change the fee system on their end, as Mr. Rockin just mentioned, but to be aware of the, the amounts that, or amount of times or the frequency or the data just associated with the forgiveness. Also, uh, there was the term used for someone, they just have to take the time to go to court. And I was recently at a public meeting addressing the issue of homelessness where the main kind of coordinator of the event who works at Housing First, or Housing Matters rather, which formerly the Homeless Service Center, said the quote uh, that experiencing homelessness is very time consuming, which was very, it stood out to me because for what us might be a morning in court, which isn't that big of a deal, if you're someone that's experiencing homelessness, you have to find a place to store your belongings for the time that you're in court, as well as having to potentially miss a food distribution or other kinds of things that are associated with someone that is surviving outside. Um, 
so I think it's really important. And also something that um, Mr. Graham said doesn't affect people who work for Google. I think that's very relevant, especially with the entry and occupy in a condemned building. Now, I get that it's reg tagged for health and safety issues, and I get that that's there for a reason. But if someone is looking for shelter, say out of the elements, and then has to take refuge in a condemned building to immediately go to a thousand dollar fine, which is not something that's going to affect someone that has a affluent income, should be something that we're taking into consideration when we're looking at these bail schedules. So I'm, um, I'm happy with most of them. There are some that are concerning, so I would uh, like to make a motion then, unless you have something that you wanna say before then. Just wanna point out that the entering or occupying a condemned building citation is almost always issued to the property owner who has a building red tagged and attempts to enter it to do work on it or uh, something of that nature. Mm. I've, I've never heard of that being enforced against a person who's seeking shelter um, because they're homeless. Totally, I think, a study, it's worth. I think with a study session that might be amazing. Um, but in general, uh, then I could make a motion so that we move the proposed bail schedule as listed, um, but withhold the 14.02, uh, Point zero eight zero and four point oh two point oh nine zero. Uh, excuse me, four point oh four point zero one five. So that is the entering, occupying a condemned building, and failure to appear in court. But then move all the other ones and adopt them, and then uh, instruct. I guess it would be the city's attorney's office or to uh, schedule a special study session in which to analyze in greater detail the bail schedule and also uh, refer to the Public Safety Committee the opportunity as, uh, to engage with the courts in a conversation to acquire the data associated with payment forgiveness. There's a motion by Councilmember Glover. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Crown. Mr. Condotti, do you want to speak to the motion on the floor? I, um, I, I think I understand the motion. I, I'm a little bit concerned about direction given to the city attorney to schedule a study session because I think the council um, can set its own schedule and I'll, I'll accommodate um, whatever schedule the council decides. Mr. Just to add to, I think also the council will be cognizant of your workload and, and work plan as well as, uh, you know, you'll be starting to um, put that together uh, for the next year. And so I think, again, considering that, because depending on the scope and what you'll be reviewing, that could be quite a bit of time, depending on what issues, not just the city attorney time, but the other staff time that's involved with respect to the various uh, issues that uh, potentially could be discussed. So just to be considerate of that as well. Uh, Vice Mayor, did you, did you, Vice Mayor Cummings, did you want to speak, or I had Council Member Matthews tell us, so. Uh, well, I was actually going to um, do two things, uh, propose splitting the motion and also, um, proposing an amendment um, that would include back those first two items. I think it's really important that we get this bail schedule on the record. Uh, we have heard uh, explicitly about the um, uh, existing uh, opportunities within the courts to uh, uh, dramatically <coughs> alter the fines uh, um, in the case of low-income individuals. Um, but um, there are a whole lot of uh, fines here, I, I would like to see us just pass the whole um, bail schedule intact, and uh, then we could come back and, and learn more. So that would be my amendment, is that we uh, add back into the original motion um, items 4.02.080, 4.02090. So that's a motion to amend the motion. And does that need a, the amendment need a second? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The amendment okay. does yeah. need a second. Okay, is there a second to the amendment? Councilmember Brown. I'll second it. Okay. And um, then Councilmember Brown. Well, in response to some of the information that some of the things I've heard uh, about the feasibility, and I appreciate um, Mr. Rock and your. Uh, your input into the potential for uh, negotiating with the Santa Cruz County Superior Court on this matter. Um, you know, it, that's helpful to hear. It's also helpful to hear what um, the city attorney's office is considering. And also with respect to the staff time involved, I'm wondering if um, it might be possible to direct staff to provide a report on these items, the item codes 
4.02.080 and 4.04015 so that we can evaluate um, what the impact is for those in particular. They sound like they're of concern to um, other council members and they are of concern to me um, as well. Um, so maybe just asking for a report back rather than scheduling an a whole study session at the moment. And then um, also uh, directing and then get also getting information about um, any efforts with to find out more about how the um, courts, uh, the, the process, the extent to which it's actually programmatic that the courts uh, will uh, forgive fines. Um, so I'm wondering if, if we might agendize it as just an agenda item so we can get more information and have some discussion, but rather than suggesting a whole study session today. If, if I could Matthews. just speak to that, that was part of my desire for separating the motion because I would prefer to go along that line than doing a whole separate study session. Um, I think we can get a lot of information on the flexibility of the courts for reducing the fines or setting alternatives, which, which are significant already and which can be um, uh, further developed. So I, I think there's a lot of interest in doing that and probably uh, uh, a focused report on that um, will get us there faster, is my guess. So that, that was my hope, was to separate the motion, add back in these two items, and then also look um, fairly in a focused way on the alternatives for reducing fines in specific cases. Okay. Mr. Gandhi, I have a quick question for you. In terms of the um, proposed items to be removed, what yes. do you um, feel or what, do you, what are your concerns about not moving forward with those at this time? Well, again, um, it simply uh, gives rise to the situation where we may have um, people cited for violations and the court simply doesn't have a mechanism within which to process their citations. So it, it, it renders our job, you know, it, it, it makes it um, impossible for the court to, to implement the ordinances that the city council has. If we don't have any with okay. regard to those specific violations. Okay. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. I will refer us all back to the motion that was adopted by the Public Safety Committee, which was to specifically uh, explore an additional study session that would take a broader look at the impact and the enforcement of fees and fines on homeless and low income individuals. So I'm a little concerned that we're that we're shifting away from a study session and we're moving into just a report, which is not a study session and which was not the recommendation of the Public Safety Committee with regards to these fines. Also, I would advise us not to move forward with the proposed amendment with the re-addition of the two lines because uh, it would ideally behoove us to move more quickly on the process of figuring out the situations and having that study session because in the interim, I'm gonna say it again, people will be subject to these fines and however long it takes us to address them. And I, I don't want to give people that are low income or currently sleeping outside or seeking survival shelter in an abandoned building a thousand dollar fine with that because we haven't talked about it or we haven't looked at the impact on low income people. Why not move the bail schedule so everything else except for those two codes are put into motion and then we can intentionally move forward in doing this. And we talk about workload. What's our, I mean, what's our job here? Yes, to keep the city going, but also to protect our citizens, which include the low income and the homeless individuals that we're trying to serve. And if, if time is the argument, which has been used in so many circumstances when we're dealing with issues of homelessness, we don't have time to deal with it. We don't have enough time in the meetings. I, I don't like that we're using time as an excuse to allow the possibility of the oppression of low income people. It just doesn't make sense. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and hear from Vice Mayor Cummings and then we'll go ahead and start taking the votes on the uh, motion. One of the, the expectations that I thought was supposed to come out of this, because this came to us back in what, May mm -hmm. it was? And so my understanding was that this was gonna go to the Public Safety Committee for review and it's now November. And so there's been almost six months to where people could have looked over these and gotten more information and we don't have any information today. And I'm just curious, I mean, for me, that's, that's disappointing because with all the talk around how we need to be addressing these, there's been six months for, um, 
for people to actually have looked into these and address these. And so it's sad to me that um, there hasn't been anything done to address um, the concerns about around these different fines because there's been six months to do so. So um, I think that we need to, you know, continue having these study. We need to have a study session on this, or no, I'm sorry, not a study session, but I think we need to get more information back from um, the city attorney's office, the public safety committee. Um, but I think that, you know, we've had, I, I would have expected having information come back on these individual topics um, by this date because it's been six months since we agreed to send it to the Public Safety Committee in the first place. Okay. So, so given how um, I think, you know, it, as imperfect as it is and all the constraints that we have, um, I appreciate the input of the city attorney um, bringing forward the concerns around the um, specifics around not having anything in place for some of these items. I'd like to go ahead and just take the vote. We have a motion to amend and then we'll go ahead and hear from you. Um, we have a motion to amend the, um, the regular motion by having a, uh, the additional, the full package of the bail schedule to move forward by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Given the input by uh, Mr. Kandati, I um, understand uh, the need to do that. And we'll go ahead and vote on that I'll first. I'll just point out there was also a comment about dividing the question. And I'll divide the question after. The chair the um, has the prerogative to divide the question. That's right. I'll, I'll divide the question after that for the, for the remainder of the main motion. So a motion to amend the motion to incorporate that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay, that passes with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Myers voting support. Councilmember Crone, Glover voting against. Uh, Councilmember Glover, and we'll go back to your original motion, hopefully get action on that. Yeah, time. just to respond to Vice Mayor Cummings' statements. So yes, it was referred to the Public Safety Committee in May. Uh, it wasn't agendized on the Public Safety Committee until October, which is, sh should be an issue with regards to the direction coming in from the city council, the process of it going through staff, and then that making it on the agenda as a recommendation from staff for it to be agendized. So if you're talking about timeline, then it has to do with the city manager's office. And then secondly, uh, with regards to the study session, we asked for additional information as soon as it came to the public safety committee for us to discuss it. So. I'm a little dismayed that you're using the fact that it hasn't come without even asking why it hasn't been addressed or the process or timeline associated. You're just seemingly assuming that we disregarded this until right now, when in reality, all the public safety committee meetings have been filled with time sensitive issues like fire safety and the like. And the fact that it hasn't been put on uh, any kind of a time sensitive agenda by the staff that's operating to help coordinate the public safety committee <laughs> It, it seems rather strange. And now, uh, because of that and your votes, uh, we're going to potentially have n tremendous financial burdens put on low-income people. It's, it's very indicative of a pattern that we see with this body, but it's really disappointing. Okay, um, we'll go ahead and take the vote on the main motion. Uh, do you need clarifying information before you vote on that motion? No, th well, the reason that we uh, wanted a study session is because so many of these fines, it would take a while, like, you know, we could revamp the whole thing, like use of steel jawed leg hold traps. I mean, when was the, or, or, or putting oil into something, or, I mean, there's so many little fines here, but also just generally, you know, we know that we're not enforcing the camping ordinance right now, but there's a lot of other things that are being enforced that we hear about. I'd like to know, to, uh, as to address your point, you know, get some statistics on how many fines are being, you know, which which fines are being leveled against um, folks. You know, is there smoking fines being leveled? Uh, you know, the, the, the little fines that are in here, um, some of them, you know, don't make any sense anymore. And that's what we're, we're talking about with the study session. All we were saying, you know, just not, to, to not be obstructive at all, is there was two that we said we we'd go for with, um, you know, everything else we could pass except those two. So it doesn't make any sense to me exactly why we wouldn't err on the side of caution in this case. It's only two and they're really, you know, entering a public condemned building and failure to post bail. Um, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to me that, that we would okay. not want to include those okay. or, or wanted, want to include those, like take them out right now and talk about them for, later. Okay. Um, well, for the interest of time, um, we, I'd like to see if we can go ahead and vote on, on the remainder, remaining aspects of the motion on the floor. If the motion to amend um, changed the m original motion, then we would primarily be vote voting only at this time on whether or not to pursue a study session. Is that correct? The motion to amend was adopted 
Uh, and so now the motion has been amended and you need to vote on the motion. Okay, so we'll go ahead and split the motion then at this time and we'll vote to adopt the amended motion which incorporates um, the full inclusion of the bail schedule first and then the remainder of the conversation around um, potentially scheduling a study session for the second part of the motion. So we'll go ahead and take the vote on the first part of the motion That's to adopt fine. the amended motion which incorporates the full bail schedule. Mayor, All I'm those gonna, I'm gonna withdraw my, my second because that's, this is not what, 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 I, what I'm seconding. Um, your second has um, no impact into the motion that has now been amended because the seconding of that motion was adopted was seconded by Councilmember Myers. But, we, but that was an amendment to the main motion, I thought, and okay. we would vote on that, wouldn't we? Uh, Mr. Kandani, not. If the council votes to accept the motion, the council should then vote on the amended motion or substitute motion. So I believe that the council can vote on the motion as amended. Okay, and does that is that impacted by Councilmember Crone's interest in draw the second? Yeah. Well, I don't believe so. When, okay. when do you vote on an amendment to the main motion or not? I mean, the council didn't. We, we didn't. How did we accept the amendment? We just there accepted was a that was the to amend motion made you voted by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by Councilmember Ma Myers. The motion that you voted against. Amend the main motion. Supported by. And the council Myers. voted to to amend the motion. I, I still withdraw my second. Okay, um, okay. so for the record, uh, Councilmember Crone withdraws his uh, second for the now amended motion, um, but we'll go ahead and take the vote on the motion. All those in favor, we need a new seconder. Is that correct, is that correct Mr. Condetti? Um. So let's just put the motion, yeah. okay, Councilmember Myers will second um, the amended motion to adopt the full bail schedule, okay? Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that passes with Councilmember Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Councilmember Myers voting in support. Now the second split portion of the motion, which was uh, Councilmember Glover's motion, um, is still, I'm assuming, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Is that correct, or did you withdraw your second to that as well? What are we voting on then? Study it's the session. second portion study of the study meeting session. to schedule a study session. Well, yeah. I. I Still second that. I still second that. Okay. Yes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 So that passes with with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, uh, Crone, Glover voting in support of a study session. Councilmember uh, Matthews, uh, Myers, and myself voting against it this time. So um, I have a question or maybe a comment about that. It seems to me that. Um, Given that the initial direction was from the Public Safety Committee, and I believe Council Member Glover stated that another Public Safety Committee meeting is coming up on the 2nd of December, um, I think it would be um, my recommendation to bring this issue back to the Public Safety Committee on the 2nd so that the, so that the committee can give some direction as to the scope of the information being sought for the for the uh, study session because um, you know, we were asked to attend and present the bail schedule at the October meeting. We did that um, and a study session was scheduled, but I think in order to provide useful information to the council uh, as part of that study session, the Public Safety Committee may wanna give some direction as to what um, information it would like to have at the study session. So is there any um, objection to I don't think council direction that? is required for that, but that was just a recommendation. Is there any um, objection to the recommendation? Question. A question, Councilor Matthews. So the intent is that the study session would be for the entire council and not just for the committee. Is that a correct? Yeah. That's right, but, yeah. I, but I, you're suggesting that sitting the study here right now, I don't know how to write that report. I, I agree, and I think there's probably a good deal of information that will be a helpful lead up to a lot of this, including what are the current options available to the court and how do they use them. And on a lot of these, I'm just looking at smoking and alcohol and stuff like that. I know just from direction given by, by counsel and experience, a lot of that there's a, a warning before, before there's any citation. So uh, I think it'd be helpful just to get the big picture of how those are um, administered, enforced, et cetera. 
Okay. I think that um, if, if, if there's consensus from the council that if that is further clarified by the Public Safety Committee and then brought forward at a future time, that's, that seems appropriate to me. Unless there's any objection, I don't see any objection. The only additional comments I would add is that, you know, we've, um, uh, we have a lot of big issues to address. And one of the issues was um, recommended uh, to have a, a study session on housing and the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee come forward with some of the recommendations that were brought forward for that group. So, I think um, there's a lot of really important items that we want to focus on, so I hope we remember the context of all of the different items that um, we could have a study session on in, at large. So with that, we'll go ahead and um, conclude that portion of our meeting and move on to um, the remainder of our of our uh, general um, business items. So next up is the consent public hearing. These are items 18 through 20 on our agenda. Any council members who are wanting to pull um, the consent public hearing items? Council Member Crone. Uh, item number 20. Okay. All right, is there any council members who want to just only make a comment on items 18 and 19 on our consent public hearing agenda? I'm seeing none. Is there any member of the community who would like to address the council on item 18 or 19 in our consent public hearing? Okay, seeing none, we'll go back and um, to the council. I'll, I'll go ahead and see if I can have a, a motion on the floor. Council Member Myers. I'll move uh, eight, uh, item 18 and 19 on the consent public hearings. Seconded by Council Member Matthews. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, item number 20, uh, <coughs> Councilmember Crone. Yeah, I had some questions um, just about in terms of the low, very low, and extremely low, and where do we err on when um, that's on page 20.1, and then on page 20.4, um, we talk about uh, making it available for low-income households. So I'm wondering when the very low and extremely low kick in and how is that part of our uh, ordinance and what we're um, requiring of the developer? So we have um, our team here coming forward to answer your question. Um. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council, Bonnie Lipscomb, Economic Development Director. Um, it depends. Our standard inclusionary is at low income, which is 80% of area media, median income. When it kicks in lower, um, it depends on the project. So on a case-by-case -case basis, sometimes we'll actually negotiate with a developer. Sometimes they'll put forward um, certain concessions or public benefits and or request certain things like additional height or something like that. And then we'll negotiate with them to provide um, some lower uh, affordability. So that's something that on a case-by-case -case basis, sometimes we will um, actually try to treat, achieve some lower uh, affordability for some of our projects. Um, but the standard uh, requirement on the inclusion area is based on low income, which is 80% of area median income. Um, another situation that could result in lower um, affordability would be in a density bonus situation. Um, when they are looking to do a project with density bonus, then that kicks in some you know, low, very low requirements. Just a follow-up. Um, oh, right. And then uh, Director Butler pointed out that the SROs are also a very low requirement. Right. Um, so is that, the 80%, is that like HUD guideline? Is that written into our uh, ordinance? Is that, did that come out when we passed the inclusionary ordinance, I guess, in 1979? Yeah, so that's something we can bring forward to you. It, it is a little confusing because we have uh, HUD guidelines, and then we actually have ours, which are slightly lower than some of their guidelines based on median income. So um, those are, they come out each year, and we recalibrate each year based on um, what those guidelines are. Sometimes they don't change, um, and sometimes they do. And when we say slightly lower, how are we lower? Like, for example, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the lower. I have to bring it back to sh show it to you, but when we actually calculate it, um, you know, we have, in addition to the set percentages, which we have, you know, the 30%, um, no more than 30% of income, or if it's low income, we do 35% of income. Um, the HUD for median for our area is actually, is a little bit higher, and they actually recently just raised that. That was one of our concerns. We are in the process of, of looking at that and bringing that forward to you. Thank you. One more question, but go ahead, Lee, if you have something. 
Thank you, Lee Butler, the planning director. And I would just add one thing um, in relation to, um, you asked if it stemmed from the 1979 measure O. That measure, as we mentioned before, actually cites um, that 15% of the units produced are affordable to people of average income, and average is substantially higher than median. And we are at 80% of the median. And so our inclusionary ordinance is a substantially lower, um, it's, it's much, it makes units available to a um, lower income group of individuals versus what's called for by Measure O. And so I wanna make sure that that distinction is clear for the council. Okay. My other question was um, 20.4 uh, letter C, um, fractional affordable housing requirement for uh, rental residential developments with more than 10 dwelling units. If the number of dwelling units required results in a fractional re requirement of 0.7 or less, then there will be no inclusionary requirement for the fractional unit. Um, and I, this is just my colleagues. I thought I've heard some of you say that you would prefer a 0.5 like anything, because uh, that would be right in the middle, so we'd get an, another unit, anything under we wouldn't, and anything over 0.5 we would. Um, are you, you're asking? It was a question, yeah, because okay, this slipped by me, and I didn't bring it up last meeting when we passed this. Okay, does any council member want to respond to this question? Council member Brown? Well, I'm not sure that it entirely addresses your question, but the proposals that we voted to send, that came from the, uh, settlement negotiations, but we're not part of the settlement agreement, uh, speak to that, and those are going to the Planning Commission and coming back to us, so I think that will be an opportunity to have that conversation. Oh, okay, so we will bring this back then. Hopefully this, this will come it, back, the 0. 0.5 versus 0. 0.7. Well, it, it could be potentially. It's, it's possible. It. Essentially, um, if I could, because I, I follow your logic, that what uh, we passed at the last meeting was um, part of the settlement agree agreement, yeah. the additional recommendations for exploration was going to our planning commission. That's gonna come back to us and that's when that potential modification could be addressed. Is that accurate? Yes, that there are several sections in the red line version from the plaintiffs that involve that. Um, and so that's going to the planning commission on the 21st and then coming back to the council on December 10th. I, I will just add that the fractional, um, the rationale for the 0.7 um, also relates to the smaller unit projects for rental. Um, this is rental only, not ownership. And that's specifically because of the 15% inclusionary. If you have that requirement rounding at 0.5, that means that uh, someone who's doing a 10 unit project would actually be paying um, and provide 20% inclusionary. And it's really hard to finance that for the smaller projects. So you'd be disadvantaging them over larger projects that can more easily be financed. So the 0.7 um, gets at right at that percent so that it, it, it's a little more rational. So someone that's doing it, for example, a 12 unit project um, would round up to two units and it, it ends up being like 16.6%. So it's still a little bit more than 15, but it's more reasonable than requiring 20 of a 10 unit project. I, I get that, but I think we just, this past council, we passed the 20% already, so we're right, there, we're right in there then on that one. 20% um, inclusionary. We didn't do that at, at the last council oh, that meeting. Going to the, that's going to the planning commission. That, that's going to the planning so commission, commission but this body did pass it as far as I know. It recommended to the planning then commission to, to go planning planning commission. Okay, well, is okay. there any member of the community who would like to address us on this item? This is item number 20 on our consent public hearing. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and um, return back for council action. Motion, Council Member Matthews. Approval. Okay. Uh, motion by Council Member Matthews, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, next on our agenda is item number 21. And I'll uh, go ahead and hand it over to our city manager, Martine Bernal, to introduce the item, as well as the assist interim assistant city manager, uh, Laura Schmidt. And Ron. And Ron, exactly. All oh, right. The so team. I'll do a brief introduction and then turn it over to Laura and Ron. Okay. Uh, earlier uh, this afternoon, you heard from uh, our climate action coordinator, Tiffany, and uh, uh, I wanted to reflect on that because, you know, I think you saw the great work that she does uh, when you have an individual who has the expertise, the background, and the time to dedicate to a particular function. 
um, a lot of great work can be done. And so that really is largely what we're bringing forward to you today. Uh, our, our ability to make progress and to do the job that we really need to do with respect to uh, responding to homelessness and addressing homelessness, as well as our ability to engage with our community, to be responsive and to be proactive to the way we communicate uh, and interact with our community, uh, it really is, is lacking. And so before you is really two uh, attempts to try to really become more proactive and responsive to those really <laughs> huge needs that we have in our community. Um, first, with respect to uh, homelessness. Uh, again, it's an issue that uh, is just impacting us on a daily basis uh, in the community, within city operations, uh, locally and regionally. Uh, we have to interact uh, with you know, multiple agencies, deal with issues uh, on a daily basis. And so having a dedicated individual who has the background expertise would be you know, tremendously helpful uh, to be able to make progress and, and be more proactive with respect to those issues. Similarly, with respect to our communications function and our ability to, uh, again, be proactive about communicating with uh, what's going on in the community on a multitude of issues, to coordinate issues, uh, and to be able to better uh, plan for and address uh, uh, engagement activities, uh, uh, events, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, is really needed in, in, in the city. Right now, we try to do it with some of our existing staff, which also hampers our ability to be responsive to all the other work that we have to do for the council. Uh, it limits our ability. So this has the other benefit of allowing, you know, our analyst, for example, who's now trying to do two jobs, our assistant to the city manager also is trying to do two jobs, who can then really focus on the council priorities, the council goals, goals the council work plan, because right now we're very, very limited, particularly on those issues that involve a lot of interdepartmental coordination, a lot of what we do in our office is that interdepartment coordination uh, and facilitating uh, teamwork and moving things forward. So that really is kind of the goal, the overall goals, but I'll turn it over to uh, Ron and Laura now to kind of give you specifics about the, the positions and, and how they'll be funded. Thank you. So regarding the homelessness response manager and the communications manager, so the first position of the homelessness response manager is a new position. So the agenda report asks you to establish the position and then fund it. The communications manager, that one was an existing position that was titled the community relations manager and we have retitled it as a communications manager and added scope of services and scope of the job description to be a little bit more strategic and an encompassing of all the different functions in a public information office. And then we're also asking you to fund that. I will hand it over to Ron and he'll give you an overview of the work that he's done on the homelessness response manager job description. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Mayor and members of the council, Ron Prince, special projects advisor for the city manager's office. Um, yeah, so today we're, we're pleased with uh, presenting this recommendation for the creation of the Homelessness Service uh, Response Manager uh, for the city. Uh, the recommendation has been several months in the making and uh, it's actually reflected in uh, your six month work plan uh, specifically. And to quote, it's uh, one of the goals was to de the development of a sustainable and focused effort on coordination of city and county homelessness initiatives. So in response to that uh, goal, uh, this new position is intended to fill a much needed void uh, that the city's overall, re that we're currently experiencing with response to uh, homelessness issues. And over the past several years, uh, the city has studied the issue and developed a comprehensive lists of recommendations and strategies uh, to help prevent and mitigate the human suffering experienced by uh, the unsheltered population. And while staff from virtually every city department uh, has been working on different aspects of this issue, um, it's, and obviously it's not just a Santa Cruz issue, it's the entire West Coast is experiencing uh, continued growth in this, uh, this area um, and becoming increasingly, it's becoming increasingly complex. So after working uh, for several months, trying to gain more traction on the recommendations that the city's already uh, adopted, and trying to develop, 
it became clear to me and others that the, a much higher level of coordination with the county and our local nonprofit service providers uh, is just absolutely critical. Um, additionally, one of the key recommendations from the county's focus strategies effort uh, is to increase staff capacity, focusing on intergovernmental and inter interagency coordination, uh, and well, with the hope to uh, have a much more effective uh, use of available resources. Now, with more funding coming from the state focused on homelessness issues, the county and the city have a glimmer of hope uh, that we can actually. Uh, make a bigger difference in getting a shelter for our homeless population and getting critical health services uh, to these folks. If approved today, this recommendation will essentially eliminate the need for most of my services uh, for the city, but I'm certainly excited about to see this effort move forward after several months of working on it. And um, I'll be happy to answer questions later on, but at this point, I know Laura has a, a description for the second part of this recommendation in the report. So the communications manager, we worked with a company called SAE Communications and um, they did a bunch of industry research for us. And the recommendation for them was, as Martine alluded to, that um, but for both of these positions, they're very, they have the same thing in common as far as us needing to have industry expertise and advisement. So somebody whose um, subject matter expertise is homelessness and somebody whose subject matter expertise is communications. These um, people that would hopefully we would recruit and find amazing employees for them would, would give us a view into the strategic planning of homelessness and communications rather than the ad hoc, just reactive nature of the current work that we do. They would be stewards of the relationships with the other agencies in our community. And as Martine talked about, these positions are critical in their management across the different departments. These functions are not siloed within a department. They're very much functions that we need to be doing with a citywide perspective and a citywide hat for our employees and for our community and our, for our community community partners. The communications position itself would um, encompass a broad spectrum of communications knowledge, and that includes me, um, media relations, what we traditionally view as the communications manager function, as well as the modern aspects of website and social media strategy and planning, communi community relations and community engagement processes, so workshops, using different mechanisms to be able to have community feedback and a feedback loop in place and being able to do out reach and then get that information fed back into our programs and projects. We also need somebody who, um, for the emergency communications and crisis communications, think PG&E, PSPS, very real and probably not going away, unfortunately, anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And then also overall graphic design and um, print media expertise, all of which we're kind of doing piecemeal and sometimes not at all as either I or the assistant to the city manager or our principal management analyst as we try to scramble and fulfill these functions, which are not our core competency, obviously. So the cost model to support all this, what we ended up looking at is there are also community relations specialists that do the more day-to-day um, -day work of the community world, communications world. So we integrated the communications functions across those community relations specialists and then we also applied a shared funding model for the homelessness response manager and the communications manager. Net net, what we came up with was cost savings and because of that, we're able to fund both positions with net savings to the general fund while increasing the costs to the enterprise funds. But these are citywide, community-wide positions, so working with finance, we felt that that was very supportable in an allocations model that this was shared across general and enterprise funds. And with that, I'll turn it over to the council and we'd welcome any questions. Well, thank you for your presentation. Um, I know that you meet with the council members in advance to hopefully get some of the questions at, um, answered in advance. Do any council members have questions for um, our city manager's department? Council Member Glover. Wonderful, so thank you for that presentation, both of you, and for all your great work in coordinating uh, the potential coordinators. Um, just curious, 
Uh, with regards to the recruiting process, how is that going? Uh, is it existing staff that may be allocated into the position or are we going externally? Because I do know that there may be, there's some uh, existing emotions between some, especially for the um, homelessness coordinator, which I think may or may not want to revisit the name of that title, but uh, the potential issues that exist between existing staff currently doing that work and the unhoused population with regards to trust and the ability to engage with them. So what's the recruiting strategy for that? And then how will the final decision be made on that? Specifically the homelessness response. Specifically for right now, we'll just talk about the homelessness. It's my understanding, uh, Councilman, that the um, homelessness response manager will be open recruitment. Uh, it will not be internal, it'll, be, it'll include internal interested candidates, but certainly it'll be a, a wide open recruitment uh, and advertised throughout the nation. And what is the determination process with that? Uh, will it be the city manager that makes that decision finally without running it by the council or will the council be able to review the applicants and then make a decision based off of that? Because I'm just a little concerned if, you know, like I mentioned before. If right, the, the, the city charter doesn't, uh allow for the council to 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 be involved in in the the hiring of uh, city employees so it, it's just it's just not a, allowable under our current city charter um, so uh, this position obviously uh, will have an extensive recruiting process for it an extension extensive vetting process we want to make sure that uh, typically we have a variety of uh, panels that can be involved in providing input. Uh, we can certainly involve community members. We've done uh, uh, various p uh, components to be able to and make sure that we have the departments and, and other stakeholders be involved in, in providing input and certainly into also assisting with making a decision. But our goal is to get, again, someone who has really, really good experience, really good background. We don't have really anybody in the city that has that at this point. Uh, that can really come in, you know, really like the Tiffany of homelessness <laughs> is kind of what I envision. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, and then I noticed in the job description there was a lot of information about, you know, providing analysis and evaluation, identifying, implementing strategic short, and there's a litany of things here, but I noticed that there wasn't much uh, verbatim with regards to soliciting input and recommendations from the unhoused community to explore implementation of identified needs from that community. So is there, can we include that in the job description to engage, intentionally engage with unhoused community members to uh, survey and understand their needs so that we can work on implementing those kinds of solutions as well? Well, council member, uh, the catch actually is fulfilling that role right me, uh, right now uh, as far as getting uh, that perspective, that critical perspective. Uh, I would think, and part of the role that this person would, would have would be to work with the catch. They'll be in existence probably through uh, April at least. This Hopefully the person will be on board by, uh, by February at the very latest, so they'll have some exposure to that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it would be, if we if we start specifying that level of uh, engagement, you're right, there is a lot here uh, in the job description, um, but yeah, anything's uh, possible. This, this actually, this job spec was based on other communities all over the West Coast that are doing uh, very similar recruitments, so that, that particular language, this is, it's been pretty um, widely and broadly, broadly utilized, but. Um, I appreciate that. The reason I ask, uh, and you'll have to excuse my concern, is because, is because traditionally, especially in the implementation of certain um, solutions or tools, there's been the criticism from those that are unhoused that their perspective, that's not even what they really need. What they need is like socks and all this other kind of stuff. So, okay, so there's that, thank you. And now just um, shifting to the communication, because you answered my next question, which is what's their relationship with Catch? It was nice. Um, communications manager. Why is the homeless uh, response coordinator staff position paid less than the communications manager? So we did market research on um, within the state of California, SAE did that on the salaries for the communications manager and the market research that they provided us and the salary ranges uh, were commensurate with how we set the communications manager one in order for us to be competitive and to be able to hire externally and recruit and attract somebody. 
Absolutely, okay, thank you. Um, I, I understand that, I understand the importance of communications. I am a little concerned about the price tag associated with all of this. Um, now the communicate or the homelessness response manager totally understand, I think that we need to be aggressively looking at how we can not only work in between agencies but also uh, implement effective solutions. But I am concerned that with the, the two groups combined, it's $450,000 a year that we're allocating in <coughs> total to these two new positions. This is at the same time when we're you know, we could be paying our existing employees higher rates, but also uh, we could be allocating more of that money towards emergency homeless services. So uh, with specifically with regards to the communications manager and shifting it from a full-time position into a half-time position and having them come in and respond to things. So nothing against communications out there for anyone watching. I appreciate communications and understand how important it is. But when faced with a fiscal dilemma like we are right now, anticipating going into a budgetary deficit in the coming year, uh, I would encourage us to be just you know, a little critical when it comes to allocating these new positions and money and whether it's a new position or it was an existing position that was reallocated or redefined. Do we want to spend $234,261 a year on a communications manager? Okay. So. And we'll have an opportunity to discuss that when we move, um, hear from the public and make a motion. Are there any other questions? Um, I have Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Brown. I just have a quick question. Um, you know, we have a, comp, kind of a somewhat complicated reporting structure in our homeless sort of coordination with the county as well as with public health. And, you know, uh, so I'm just curious, how do you see the response manager sort of fitting into, you know, we've got the HAP and the, you know, we've got all these different committees. So I, I guess what I'm wondering about is, really the level of decision making this person will have versus when they would need to bring a policy question or what have you to the city council. So maybe just if you could speak a little bit to that. Right. Well, this is a, this is a, a management level uh, position. Um, I think it's equivalent to the assistant to the city manager level. Right. And so we expect this person to be really involved with uh, the HALP and, and the, uh, the various you know, high level uh, decision making relative to that. Um, that's our expectation. Again, that somebody has expertise, but also has the ability to, uh, uh, and also with it being in the city manager's office to bring together the various departments and to uh, work with officials over at the county and other agencies to be able to sort of move things forward and have some uh, authority to do that. I'll have some comments later. Okay. Uh, questions, Council Member Kern? Yes, thank you. Um, <coughs> it says that, uh, fiscal impact, the general fund will not incur additional costs for either the homeless response manager or the communications manager. But then in the chart that we're given, it says 16.65% uh, is coming out of the general fund. What, or how, how are we making that up or what, what does that mean? So all of the figures in the chart are actually fully loaded costs. So the salary is the salary assuming that the person is at top of the range as well as um, benefited. So it's the salary plus benefits. And then if you look across for the homeless response manager, you see the 16.65% 16 16 to the general fund and down below the communications manager is at 18% to the general fund. So going further down the chart, the cost to the general fund for the communications manager and the community relations specialists in the blended integrated model is 121,000. And then the old communications community relations specialist model cost distribution of separate and non-integrated was 205,000. So that's the salary savings right there. And so that netted out an $84,000 salary savings to the general fund. And then the cost of the homelessness manager of that 16.65% is 35,346. And that nets out to an overall 49,000 uh, benefit to the general fund. And then if you go across, those are the increases to the respective enterprise funds. Counting magic. <laughs> um, a question about uh, why we're not looking for someone with a master's degree or higher. Um, City Manager Bernal keeps talking about Tiffany, and I agree, Tiffany Wise West has a PhD. Um, and 
she's in a position that I think she's utilizing her PhD quite well. Uh, why are we just going for a BA in this case? Um, why not? We're, there's people out there with master's degrees that would um, also fit the bill and maybe be more experienced. Council, I was just say, council member, uh, this doesn't preclude somebody with a master's or PhD. That's just the entry level. That's the minimum uh, to even apply. So certainly, uh, if someone came in with uh, great experience and a much higher level of education, they're going to be uh, very competitive. But it's but th this is just the the minimum entry qualification. But but you might also not attract people with a higher level education when they see that it's you want somebody with a BA. Yeah, mom was a proponent of not creating artificial boundaries, being in the fire service for so long, um, trying to make sure everybody has a, a, an opportunity to apply. So, I mean, that's that's a good point, uh, but that would minimize somewhat our, our pool, and I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend doing that uh, at this point. I mean, the climate action coordinator position doesn't require a PhD either. I think it's a similar requirement. Uh, the top of my head, but I think I think it really is to to be make sure that obviously we want somebody that's qualified, and the the higher the qualified, the higher the 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 um, educational uh, attainment, the, the better. Uh, but it's, we just have it sort of a minimum standard is what this is required. <coughs> I received an email from uh, someone who said that um, uh, I agree that these things are important, but paying someone thirteen thousand one hundred and fifty-two dollars a month, really. That's eighty dollars per hour by my calculation. Is that correct? Eighty that we're going to pay this person eighty dollars an hour. Uh, that would be top step, I believe. Uh, there's, it is top step. step. Yeah. So that's so all the all the calculations were based on top salary, which uh, typically uh, city employees don't start at the top salary. They work their way through a five step uh, and process. My last question would be: um, What if this uh, homeless uh, response manager was um, answerable? as a city manager and the city attorney are to this body, that we would allow them a lot more independence um, and be able to ask questions as we've I've found, I've found anyway, throughout this whole homeless discussion, we have, there's, there's been avenues pursued and avenues blocked and it never, and I never could figure it out. And then, you know, that's somewhere in the bureaucracy that we didn't pursue this, uh, the sports authority building, for example, on, Rivers, uh, Riverside or River, um, yeah. North uh, River. What, excuse me? North River. Yeah, and, I mean, just as a, um, when it was available. I mean, and then, then I found out later like there was other things going on. So I would love to see a level of independence in this person that they could just go out there and, and pursue good ideas, creative ones, and come back to the council and um, share with us what they've been doing and you know get direction in that way and us to go through um, a sort of plan for them that was approved by this body and given to that person. Okay, well, the, my understanding, and I'm um, assuming it the same as what Martine Bernal will say, is that our city charter has us directly hiring our city manager and city attorney only. Correct, it doesn't provide for hiring okay. other individuals. Okay, Councilor Brown. Uh, it, does, it does for the city clerk as well. I, I, don't, okay, right. I, okay. I don't like us leaving that out um, all the, the time. Okay, Councilor Brown, any questions? Yeah, um, so just a, I guess a follow-up, uh, because uh, Councilmember Myers asked one of the questions that I had, just to clarify the, so basically what we're looking at here with this position would be, and I appreciate the, the job description looks great, um, uh, kind of more expansive and proactive efforts on behalf of the city, um, kind of through the same channel. So the same kinds of questions that come to the council with um, the city manager's office, the current work you all do would be coming to the council so no change in that, but we would just have more kind of expansive proactive activities with this position. Is that in terms of the kind of chain of command and you know all of the questions that kind of um, Council Member Crone was also speaking to? Right. The uh, the uh, the position that would be in, in position in the city manager's office. The the the. Um uh, communications manager, the recommendation from SAE is that it report directly to the city manager because it just needs to have that interaction with the uh, city manager and with executives uh, and, and be involved and knowledgeable and kind of up to date on all the issues that, that happen. Uh, with respect to the homelessness uh, response manager, I believe, or is that reporting to the assistant city manager? Yes, it's reporting yes. to the ACM. Yeah, assistant city manager. Um, and, and uh, uh, but would uh, obviously uh, be 
uh, also involved. They would have more more time, you know, full time right. time to really focus on the issue. I think right now part of the challenge is that we've got people splitting up their time and trying to make time here and here with a bunch of other things. And so obviously just having a full time person will make a tremendous difference. Having them have some background and experience, some knowledge on you know effective homelessness strategies, uh, and and also. Uh, would, would make a tremendous difference as well. So all those things I think would just really, now with respect to their, their workload and, and, uh, and what they work on and policy direction, that will continue to come from the, from the council uh, and will be reflective of the council work plan uh, and whatever strategies and direction you provide us and they'll be there to implement and to follow that direction as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, I, so I guess what I was getting at there was just to clarify that it, it wouldn't necessarily have any impact on the, the work the decision making that the council does with respect to the work. So oh, that, that's fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, another question that I had um, was related, I guess if another, a follow up to council member Glover's question about the hiring process. I was gonna ask about the, the use of a community panel or community panels for this process. I know that that has been, that has worked, that has happened in the past and I've heard really good things about that um, as a, as a process, so that, I just wanna clarify, that is something that you're looking at, you're intending to do, so that there's some. Yes, I, talking to the HR department, that's exactly what they uh, recommended. We have a, multiple panels. Great, thank you. Are there any members of the community who would like to address this on this item? Please come forward. Okay, if you can, please line to my left, you'll have up to two minutes. Okay, Garrett Phillip, uh, Santa Cruz. I, I don't really necessarily have any opinion on whether you should or shouldn't uh, have these two positions, but it appears this uh, new six-figure homeless resource manager position is paid for mostly out of water, sewer, refuse, municipal income. Is that right? Sounds like executive action should be based on American principles, not your actions, and as water, sewer, and refuse are a government monopoly, income from charges for these should be exclusively used for those city services, not for profit and not abusively used in this manner, whether they are or have been in the past, as I regard this position as having nothing whatsoever to do with those. You may say that all departments interact with homeless people, but that's not really true. I mean, I encounter homeless people, but so what? You know, water, sewer, and refuse charges are not a slush fund with blank check unlimited application. I regard this position as an expense of a social program and somehow ideally it should be funded by the state or fed and the city's share of property and sales taxes should only be used to fund core city services. In principle, this is because only the fed has constitutional authority for welfare and has the most fair progressive income tax base with proper scope to draw from. Also, the city's tax base is regressive, levied on a small group of people and to apply it or proceeds from utility bills from an even smaller group of city residents whose unrelated water refuse and trash, trash usage is arbitrary to this position as one or any of a potentially unlimited array of social programs that ideal political ideology could dream up is in principle wrong. Considering the city's massive increases in income over the last 10 years with a still overall surprising deficit position with accompanying cuts to city services, recent astronomical water treatment and water rate increases, past and currently requested huge debt accumulation for water infrastructure, one wonders where all the utility money has gone if it's not enough and what kind of reserve planning is in effect or if principled use of the people's trust of their money is justified. Thank you. I don't know what you all be thinking or talking about. But check this out, think about it like this. You talking about giving all this money to somebody ain't in the field, probably never been homeless. They don't know what that is. Why not flip the script? There's people out there already experts and know how to use funds. Put it over here for this reason, because it's right. Oh, they <laughs> 200 grand. You paying them 200 grand for a salary? Golly Moses, $80 an hour? Let's say we took somebody who's homeless and been dealing with this and pay them 50,000. And we pay another person in this section, part of the city, county, 50,000. And there's another person over here, you got four people with 200,000, you didn't save 200, I mean 34, 35,000 right there and you got people 
soldiers. They boots are already on the ground. They in this. They know it because they feel it. They wear it. Instead of um, let's experiment with this. He's high. He's intellectual. Well, that ain't feeding me. That ain't helping me. Well, it's going to take a day or a month to do this. Well, this person over here can do it in an hour. They're already in the mix. Flip the script. Hey, we got this person a job. That gets them out of the people who are homeless that you all say you're trying to help. They know these people because they're hands on. I got respect for you. I'm listening to you. And the people are developing programs that actually work. Saving 40, 35,000 for paying somebody a salary who has no clue what they're doing coming in and having meetings with you. Well, this is what we're going to do. Meeting time is up. Next speaker. My water bottle, man. Hi, my name is Sandra Larson, and I work with uh, as a mental health advocate. I'm curious, I, I'm aware that you received $10 million to address our homeless fund last year. And I'm curious if this money is coming from that or what is being done with that $10 million in terms of addressing the homeless situation, which is nationwide, not just Santa Cruz. And personally, I had a really hard time sleeping at night when it was windy and raining and those are human beings. They're our most fragile section of our society. And yes, some of, there's a divide here where people say, oh, they're addicts, oh, they wanna be that way. No one wants to be an addict. Trauma is the root of addiction. And these people need services. Yeah, $235,000 a year is, I mean, yeah, PhD, whatever, but no one's an expert in this unless you're living it. And what we need to do, I mean, the rains are coming. These are human beings who are, again, going to be out in the cold wind and rain, not by choice, but by us not having mental health services addressing this. Or, you know, tiny homes or, you know, showers. There's things that we can do. And with $10 million, I was hoping to see something in place by the time the rains hit. And I'd like to know what's happening with that $10 million and what we can do right now to avoid what happened last winter, because it's shameful, really shameful. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Rotkin, a citizen of Santa Cruz. Four, four quick points. Number one, um, if... Um, in response to one of the earlier speakers, all the departments in the city have to deal with the homeless issue. Ask the people in the public works department to clean up after the mess that happens all the time. Ask the people in the water department that are dealing with the issues that are happening up in the uh, watershed areas of the city. I won't go through the whole list, but it's a citywide problem, and I appreciate your approach to this, finding a way to fund it, because it's a critical function. Homelessness is almost certainly the biggest issue the city's facing along with housing and trying to do something about it. it's really critical and worth some money because it won't happen for free second point um you uh, the city charter uh, sets out that only right now that the city clerk and the city attorney and the city manager are the three people the city con uh, council controls you can't change that without a vote of the people just to put that away as an issue, even if it was a good idea. And it's not a good idea to have somebody serve two masters as an employee. And should we work for somebody? If you don't like their work, you fire them or you fire the person that hired them, but you don't have somebody to like respond to two different people with very different ideas about what should be going on or two different groups. Third point, um, <coughs> you, don't, you don't get these coordinators on the cheap. Um, you need someone to communicate with the people in this city about what's going on. I follow the city really closely. I pay attention to the council meetings. I don't come down to the meeting anymore, but I still follow what's going on. And I don't know what's going on. I have no idea what, the, what we're doing, what we're not doing. And having a coordinator of, and that 
works, makes the services happen, but someone that explains what the city's up to, what's our strategy, what are we gonna do, is worth paying decent money. And finally, I have a PhD. A lot of people have skills that are much more important than what you get getting a PhD. There are people out there that know how to deal with this issue, they've been dealing with it, and that's who you should be hiring for this job. Someone that's shown that they know how to respond to these homeless questions, and not just because they have a degree. Okay, next speaker. Is there anybody else who'd like to address the council on this item? You do? Okay, you'll be our last speaker. Hi, hello, my name is Emily Sinclair. Um, I've been studying this quite carefully, and I don't know if I'm correct, but my impression is that the county is pretty much responsible for what's going on. Um, the responsibility rests with them. They receive about 1.3 million a year to run an office of homeless coordination. Um, that's one bureaucracy. Uh, they also, there's about 2.3 million a year that's allocated by the county that goes into the HAP, uh, Homeless Advisory uh, Program, or whatever it is. This is basically the money for homeless services, 2.3 million a year. That was fulfilled out this year, it was extended by the 10 million emergency grant from the um, state, federal sources, which was distributed within about a week. So basically you're looking at a, uh, an allocation of 2.3 under the county, 1.3 is already going into a bureaucracy to run this. There's no money, there's 800 people living on the street, 1,600 across Across the county. It's an emergency. You've just modified the city charter, the municipal code, to allow for encampments in the Harvey West and on the bench lands. I don't think this is going to work. It needs to be a something with the county, a coordinated program. The residents not going to tolerate this. And there needs to be money. And you, I mean, you can pay 400,000. It uh, seems fairly cost effective. This is a bureaucracy. We need the money to build the emergency shelters and they have to go up by next year, uh, 2020. All right, thank you. Next speaker. Are you interested in speaking on this item as well? Okay, you'll be our last speaker. <coughs> Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I'd like to address the communications manager first. Um, the police department has a spokesperson and I don't know if that's a part-time job or what, but, but it seems like that person could also do this job because the spokesperson for the police department is only on TV and in the newspaper when there's some big police action happens in town. And I don't know what she does the rest of the time, but she could be the spokesperson, the communications manager and do both of those jobs, I would think. And that, and that would save the city a bunch of money if she was uh, able to do both jobs. And as far as the um, homeless response manager, I would hope that this job would be very autonomous, that it wouldn't be necessarily just a rubber stamp of what city staff and the city manager want, but a person that would be out there coming up with, uh, you know, searching out new ideas uh, and things that haven't been tried yet in Santa Cruz and trying new things to alleviate the situations we have right now with the homeless. Um, and according to the um, thing in there about you know what the, what their resume should be, it said something about three years of. Uh, having worked for the homeless. So it seems like possibly some of the former directors at uh, the Homeless Resource Center would be the people that might be qualified for this job, like Ken Cole or Karen Gillette. So maybe you should reach out to them and see if they want the job. All right, thank you. You're our last speaker. Come on. 
uh, city of Portland just recently hired a homeless coordinator type, something akin to this position. Uh, the reason is, one reason is because 52% of the arrests in Portland are homeless folks. So their first contact, so these folks have, the police department have very solid um, experience with the homeless population there in Portland. So I just suggest maybe looking at um, shifting this position perhaps to a beefed up community, one of the community service officers that we have with the police and looking at it from, you know, that in that department. That's all, thanks. <clears throat> All right, that concludes our public comment. Councilmember Crum and then Councilmember Meyer. Well, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, throw a motion out there. Um, I'm going to recommend the resolution amending the classification compensation plans for FYI 2020 budget personal and compliment for the city manager's office by approving a new job classification with an associated new position of homeless response manager and uh, not. Uh, uh, titling the existing community relations manager classification to communications manager, but instead put off the hiring uh, and discussion of hiring a community relations manager until the mid-year budget review. There's a motion on the floor by Councilmember Crone. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Further discussion? Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember uh, Matthews. I'll oppose this. I think there's been just a huge amount of thought going into the the uh, contemporary needs of both the city manager's department, all the departments coordinating together, and council having um, good access, good flow of information back and forth. And I think this is a, this readjustment makes sense. It's not etched in stone, but I think for the needs that we have now, um, I would prefer to support the entire recommendation. Councilmember Myers. Yeah, I'll um, I'll, I'll echo, echo that sentiment. I think. Um, First on the communications position, I think just the last couple of months and uh, watching other communities in our state deal with um, the threat of fires, the um, electrical shutdowns, um, we, in my opinion, I think one of the, the, the weaknesses that I've seen in our organization is communications and we've assigned it to various people who either may not have the expertise or it's assigned as an additional <coughs> duty. Um, I think that our um, ability to communicate with our community is, is very hampered right now. And um, I think it's a really important um, position to be in place. And I, I don't think we should wait six months. We have a lot of important topics coming up that I'm sure our community will want to understand the ins and outs of. And so um, I think that uh, the position is really important and is critical to uh, put into place immediately. On the, um, so I would support also uh, both positions in, in the motion. And um, so I won't be able to support the motion as proposed. Just briefly on the, um, on the homeless response manager, I, I was a little bit on the fence about this, but but I um, I am supporting it, and uh, I I think um, we really need a a professional clinical mind around all of the needs that we need, and um, so I'm I'm uh, pleased to see that in the description that we have um, expertise uh, sought with regards to mental and behavioral health and other other qualifications. So I think it's a good fit for us. And I think we both, we need uh, both these positions very soon. I guess I'll, I'll just um, say that as long as I've been on the, the, my entire time on the council, communications has been a challenge for our city. And I think that this is an opportunity for us to uh, prioritize that, not only communications internally, but communications externally as well with our community members. So I won't support not um, moving forward with that position. That's a position I think we've, I've anxiously wanting, have been wanting to see filled. Um, I will, I do support the homeless um, response manager. I think I shared the um, comment made earlier by Council Member Glover that uh, the name, I think it'd be nice to have like homelessness prevention and response manager or something like that. It seems like maybe we can incorporate some proactive language there. Um, so maybe we can, uh, you know, I'll officially go on the record that I support the homeless response manager position, although I will not be in favor of not pursuing the um, communications manager as proposed by the motion on the floor. Unless there's any further debate um, for clarification, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Croner, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, I mean, it just struck me, it was a kind of uh, suggestion by Mr. Willis with regards to splitting the $234,000 into multiple positions and then 
figuring out a way to give uh, someone with lived experience a job and insight to be able to provide a paid position uh, in acting as a liaison between the city and uh, the population outside. So I don't know if that's necessarily appropriate in this moment uh, because of all the work that's already been done by the fantastic planning staff and putting all that together. But I do think it mm. should go on the record of me feeling that that should that that's something that I think we should be exploring is funding going into the hands of people that have the lived experience, that have the existing relationship out on the street, and who can ideally adequately and intelligently get the information that we need to implement programs that are actually going to impact people's lives. All right, well I just wanna remind the council, we have one more item on our agenda before this evening session. I'd like to have um, us conclude uh, uh, at latest 10 after, so for we could have a break for dinner. Um, so if that requires maybe just hearing from the public for the second item and then deferring action until later, that that might have to be the, the case. Um, so unless there's any additional comments for clarity to move the uh, item, um, I'd like to go ahead and see if we can do that. I have uh, Councilmember Crone and then I have City Manager Martine Bernal. Can we incorporate what you and I think Councilmember Glover is alluding to as far as a little bit more proactive approach to the name of this, should we, can we call it the Homeless Response and Prevention uh, and the, Manager? Is there I, any I would put, I would put that in the motion if, the, if it's okay with the second. We can reconsider the job title. It has gone back and forth quite extensively mm -hmm. and we understand the concern raised as far as the proactiveness piece of it, okay. so. Yeah, okay, I understand that. Are you There's just gonna take that as a suggestion or should we incorporate that into I mean, the motion? I'll, I would take it as a suggestion because ultimately the work of the person really matters if, yeah. if it's already gone back and forth personally. So, but you heard you heard the, what, what may be prevention too and think about it. Personal preference. Yeah, we, we were just simply trying to make a distinction and there is a lot of confusion in the community about uh, the role of the city versus the county. county. Yeah. And uh, we're not in the direct services business, although what we do is support uh, you know, rapid rehousing and a lot of preventative measures as much as the city can. But it's, it, one of the thoughts was to, and we did play with several different names, but was to make sure we made the distinction between county and city. I appreciate that. In the interest of time, I'll call the question. Second. I just wanted to clarify that with respect to the costing uh, here that the homeless response manager position adds to the general fund. The uh, communications uh, manager uh, reduces the general fund. So the net, the reason for the net savings is because we're saving from the communications manager. Just to be, be clear about that. Okay. Okay, we have a motion to call the question. The question is. And the question is, it, do, would you like to repeat the motion on the floor? My understanding of the motion of the floor is to move forward with the hiring of the homeless response manager and to postpone the hiring of the communications manager position for another six months. Is that accurate? Postpone, but also the the, the discussion and the hiring of that person, yes. The mid, I think it was mid-year. Tell mid, me which mid, mid, mid happened in January. Review. Okay, okay. Okay, um, all those in favor to call the question, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. No. That passes with Councilmember Crone, Glover, Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings voting in support, Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. Okay, we'll uh, go ahead and hear the next item before we take our dinner break. Um, I realize the number of members of the community are here to address us on this item. I know that this item was brought forward by uh, several council members. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that um, we can hear from the community and then reserve, if necessary, the conversation um, for uh, de debate um, until uh, later, if, if need be. Okay, do you wanna introduce the item briefly or? Sure, okay, so um, I brought this item forward with council members Brown and Glover. Um, back in June, um, Decriminalized Santa Cruz, a group of um, local uh, community members who were concerned and wanted to see this item come forward. Um, they contacted me and they emailed um, my understanding, a number of other council members and I um, decided to start working with them on this. Um, they presented a lot of research demonstrating how these types of plants and fungi have been used by indigenous groups throughout the world. And currently it's been very much being explored for medical treatment. 
Um, the, the use of these kinds of plants and fungi have shown to treat a range of mental illnesses, including PTSD, depression, anxiety, among many others. Um, and by decriminalizing these plants and fungi, we're allowing people within our community to know that we respect their desire to explore alternative forms of spiritual, emotional, medical treatment, and recommend that this be done under the guidance and supervision of trained professionals. And I just wanna point out that yesterday, I went to the Veterans Day celebration and I was actually approached by a number of vets who said that there are members of our community who have been participating in some of these clinical trials and have been um, very much um, getting a lot of benefit from um, being able to utilize these types of, of treatment. And so what this um, item is really intending to do is decriminalize the possession, cultivation, and use for adult um, uh, medical reasons and um, really allow people of our, in our community to explore utilizing these for um, personal health. And so there's a number of members from Decriminalized Santa Cruz here today who are gonna provide a short presentation to uh, the city council. Mm -hmm. so. right. Okay, please come, come forward. He's gonna sit up over here so while I'm, I'm speaking. Okay. Um, and my understanding is it's a brief presentation. Is that accurate? Uh, no longer than 10 minutes. Is that right. correct? So, okay. so between about four of us, there's going to be a t total of 10 minutes. And then I, okay. there are a few other folks who I think want to get onto the uh, onto the sign up sheet and who have a, a few other things to share, if that's okay. But you, yeah, we'll you said we comment. keep it under half an hour. Okay. If that's if that's okay. Okay. So um, anyway, I'm uh, I'm Athonia Capelli, and um, I just uh, real quick want to say uh, thanks to Justin Cummings for kind of championing this and, and taking it the way you did, and uh, of course to, to Sandy Brown and to Drew uh, for for helping bring it in today. Um, you know, I'm I'm elated to be here and that this is that this is happening. At least it's getting heard. Um, so. This talk has a little, there's a lot of areas that are, I'm unfamiliar with, I'm not a botanist, and I'm not, um, I don't work in the, in the medical mm -hmm. profession, so I do have to kind of refer to my, my notes here as much as I tried to memorize everything. Um, so, uh, so, oh, and I also wanna mention, I do have uh, Dr. Fiducia here, so she's gonna go on, and I'm gonna kinda watch my time, I wanna make sure uh, that I take less than three more minutes. Okay, so 5.48, kinda wink at me. Um, so uh, I guess the first thing I want to say is that uh, you know why you know why decriminalize uh, these uh, you know so-called plant medicines and entheogenic plants. Entheogenic, if anyone's not familiar, just means that it's a plant that uh, you may be able to engage with and, and encounter a spiritual uh, um, uh, uh, experience. And um, I just learned that word last year, so this is I wanted to, to throw it out there in case anyone didn't know about it. Uh, so why should we de decriminalize these uh, plants and fungi that are on the federal schedule one? Uh, so the first thought on that is, as Justin was pointing out, uh, they're used to treat anxiety of all sorts, and um, they're also used to treat addiction, and they themselves are not addictive. So that's that's an interesting, um, um, that's an in interesting way of, of, I mean, you know, they're very different from any kind of, um, you know, poppy-based uh, uh, a plant in that respect. Um, we also feel that for thousands of years, uh, practices across the globe have highlighted entheogens and their healing and spiritual potential. Uh, so thousands of years. This has only been criminal for like 30 to 40 years. Uh, so we also feel that we have the inalienable rights to engage with these naturally occurring plants and fungi. And, um, you know, it's it just, it seems like a shame that you know during the Nixon era, there was this criminalization of of plants for no particular reason that anyone can figure out, and um, and it, it seemed to be, and and people have said that it was done in, as a way to kind of suppress uh, African American um, a little bit of an uprising that was happening at that time, uh, and a way to 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 suppress uh, their activities. So um, I've got. You know, plenty, plenty of documentation that speaks to that, but clearly we won't be able to go into that here. Um, all right, I'm going to go on for just like one more minute here, if you don't mind. Um, so I just want to talk about real quick about uh, decriminalized nature and what the group does. Um, it's actually a nationwide group, and um, we successfully decriminalized in uh, Oakland, and we're not related to the Denver. Uh, 
uh, uh, organization. But we are now national, and this is concurrently happening in in Oregon. It's um, we have groups that are doing exactly what we're doing um, in group in areas like uh, in Chicago. Uh, we've had success in uh, Port Townsend, Washington. I could go on and on. Uh, just real quick, I wanted to, to speak to our philosophy. Um, we have, uh, we believe in grassroots education and that community is the best approach to addressing the set and setting uh, that is culturally relevant. So having, you know, a good mindset and having a good setting with, with which to, to use whatever uh, these plant medicines are. Uh, we'd like to empower the people to engage with their elected officials at the local level to affirm their own sacred relationship to nature. Um, I think most importantly, we want to decriminalize home grows and natural foraging, which would exclude harvesting endangered plants. Uh, we believe in the model of grow, gather, and gift. Uh, we emphasize exchange over commerce. Um, I'd like to emphasize our inalienable right to develop our own relationship to nature. Um, we encourage equitable access to ensure disenfranchised communities are not left out. Um, uh, we understand statements like we don't have enough research or we need regulations, ignore long traditions of ancestral relationships worldwide with plants and fungi. Uh, and we recognize entheogenic plants and fungi have a long history of use compared to psilocybin assisted therapy. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna leave it at that because I've exceeded my three minutes. Um, let me uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Fiducia up next, Hello. if you're ready. Oh, you go. Go. oh yeah. sorry. Okay. Hi, my name is Julian Hodge. I'm one of the co-founders of Decriminalizing. Hi, my name is Julian Hodge, and I am one of the, one of the co-founders of Decriminalize Santa Cruz, and I am also the president of Students for Sensible Drug Policy at UC Santa Cruz. Hello, Santa Cruz City Council. My name is Sean Cutler. I am also the co-founder of Decriminalize Santa Cruz, and I am an officer in UC Santa Cruz Students for Sensible Drug Policy. Thank you so much for hearing our testimony today and about why entheogenic plants and fungi decriminalization is so important for the community. Entheogenic use has already existed for thousands of years, back before American imperialization, when Europeans were fermenting fruit and barley and such to make alcohol and create their altered state, their altered states. Uh, indigenous Americans were using ayahuasca and peyote and mushrooms to achieve their altered states. There's also uh, <laughs> studies that show that uh, these things, that entheogens can be used to treat people with problematic, with uh, opioid addiction. There are clinics in Mexico and New Zealand where Americans have to travel out of the country to receive this miracle treatment because it's legal to, for them to have it in their own homes. There's also a, a research done by Johns Hopkins Medical School and the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies that <laughs> The entheogenic plants and fungi like psilocybin mushrooms can be used to treat PTSD, anxiety, and depression that's uncurable. Also in 2001, Portugal decriminalized all drugs and there have been many benefits to that. Since 2001, as a result of Portugal's decriminalization, the number of people voluntarily entering treatment has increased significantly. <clears throat> Incarceration for drug-related offenses has decreased and rates of problematic drug use have fallen. In a moment when the United States is facing an overdose crisis, learning from Portugal's accomplishments is especially timely and valuable. Additionally, the war on drugs is a war on us. Santa Cruz City Council should pass the resolution decriminalizing personal usage, possession, and cultivation of entheogenic plants and fungi because a drug war is immoral. The war on drugs was not created to preserve public safety or to preserve public health or to protect children. Rather, it was created intentionally to imprison minorities, imprison peace activists, and imprison those who oppose the United States military industrial complex. In the 1960s, as drugs became symbols of youthful rebellion, social upheaval, and political dissent, the government halted scientific research into their medical safety and efficacy. In June 1971, <coughs> President Nixon declared a war on drugs. He dramatically increased the size and presence of federal drug control agencies and pushed through measures such as mandatory sentencing and no-knock warrants. A top Nixon aide, John Ehrlichman, later admitted the following. You wanna know what this is really all about? The Nixon campaign in 1968 
and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or to be black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did, end quote. Hi everyone, <clears throat> my name is Daisy Orozco. I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran and a current student at UCSC, an officer for Students for a Sensible Drug Policy. I've suffered from PTSD, severe anxiety, and depression for many years. Um, but the reason I'm still here today is because I had got to try psilocybin two years ago. Um, before that, I abused all my med medications. Uh, I binge drink every other day. I lost all my relationships along the way. Um, so I really want this measure to pass because it's really hard to try to heal when these substances are criminalized and stigmatized. Um, thank you. Is this part of the presentation that was the organized presentation? And is, are you the last speaker of that presentation as part of the council members uh, presentation for the item? Because if not, we'll go ahead and have public comment open up at this point. Does that conclude your presentation on behalf of the council? Oh, you're part of the presentation? Okay, you, oh, please come forward if you're part of the presentation. I just wasn't sure. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna open it up for public comment, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Jackie, and I'm a student at UCSC and a member of Students for Sensible Drug Policy and Decriminalized Santa Cruz. My first experience on entheogens was life-changing and has been the one thing that directly changed my outlook on life forever. At the time, I was planning to end my life just a few months later, but this experience showed me how grateful I should be and how beautiful life truly is. Research, as well as my personal experience, shows that entheogens can play a significant role in treating depression, and with decriminalization, we could help others who need it experience this treatment. Okay, so if that concludes the presentation, I'm gonna go ahead and ask my colleagues to reserve questions um, until either later or after our evening item. We're gonna go ahead and open up public comment on this item um, until about 10 after, so for about 15 minutes. Um, if anybody wants to briefly address the council in one minute, I invite you to come up first. You'll have one minute. For those that want the full two minutes, um, you can take that time after, um, just being uh, kind of mindful of the fact that we're gonna close public comment at 10 um, after. Uh, after six. So you'll have one minute if you'd like to briefly address. Sandra that. Larson again. Many of my clients are involved in this and I just want to say that we don't need trained professionals. These are, this is nature and we're adults and we should be able to choose responsibly. Some might not and that's a part of life. It's already a part of life <coughs> with pharmaceuticals. Also, I think that our law enforcement officers are overloaded and they don't need to be dealing with um, drugs. That's a mental health issue, and it shouldn't be criminal. So I'm all for people making their own sovereign choices, whether they want to do plant medicine instead of pharmaceuticals. We have a huge opioid crisis, and we need hope. And we're seeing a lot of success with people coming back home to themselves and re restoring their wholeness in their lives without pharmaceuticals. Thank you. Any other members of the comment for one minute? Are you interested in the one minute, one minute time frame? Any interest in one minute briefly addressing that? Please, Pat, come forward. <laughs> um, hi, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure working with all of you and all of you on this issue. Um, I grew up here. It's something that uh, Santa Cruz has led historically in these type of issues. Um, everyone in the room is familiar now with the, you know, the history of these type of issues, so we won't get into it. But um, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, um, with you know, I know a lot of people in the cannabis community that went to bed every night not knowing if their decision to try to save their grandmother was a stressful one. Hope you know we've taken that off there. You know people's. Um, <clears throat> 
minds for a bit, and so this is wonderful now that we've got folks that don't have to make that tough choice over mental health issues and things. So, um, so yeah, I'm on the WAM board. We're very excited about this, um, and I just um, you know couldn't be more positive about these steps to unravel unravel the racist drug war. So, yay. <laughs> Would you like to speak for one minute briefly? Please come forward. Hi, good evening, City Council. Thank you very much uh, for taking time to um, address this topic. I think it's an incredibly progressive Santa Cruz to take this uh, consideration um, to decriminalize nature. Um, I'm, I'm a veteran of the, of the U.S. Navy, um, and um, I'm a local business owner of, uh, uh, with co-founders of SC Laboratories, a cannabis testing analytical lab here in town. And for the last eight years, I've also been on the board of directors of WAM. And I've personally uh, been witness to profound miracles in, in uh, being witness to, to healing um, through plants, through nature, not through pharmaceuticals. And to witness the devastation that pharmaceuticals are bringing into this community of benzodiazepines, oxy, oxycontin, the fentanyl. I mean, these, these should be criminalized. Production and, and distribution of them should be criminalized. And uh, I, I, yeah, plants decriminalized nature. This is an amazing moment in time, and um, I just really appreciate uh, the consideration and uh, the leadership Santa Cruz County is taking. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. And if you have a sign, please lower it just so you're not blocking or obscuring the vision from the person behind you. Okay, you'll have. Good it. evening. In 2009, I was discharged from the United States Army after a parachuting accident it left me with uh, spinal injuries that were pretty severe. Um, this occurred only a couple of months after returning home from a 15-month tour in Afghanistan. So I was pretty lost. I, I was broken. I was homeless. I, I had spinal injuries that I was trying to heal while being homeless. Uh, I didn't have the slightest idea what I was going to do. After my experiences with entheogenic medicines, not only was I capable of dropping my dependencies to alcohol and nicotine, but I became free from the depression that unknowingly barred me from enjoying life. Since then, I have been able to improve myself with a new sense of direction, a direction backed with a purpose of love. With this new purpose, I have helped myself break away from stagnation. Uh, really quickly, I've seen these things heal everything from people that wanted to commit suicide to people scared of dying from cancer. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Hello, thank you for this opportunity. My name is, is Peter. Um, I am here to support decriminalization of entheogens, otherwise known as plant medicines. I have per personally witnessed how it has positively transformed the lives of many people people from all walks of life. Personally, I have worked with ayahuasca in South America and it has transformed my life from one of depression and suicidal thoughts to one of thriving and mental and emotional clarity and personal success. Ayahuasca is non-addictive and the benefits it can offer this community are absolutely immeasurable. Entheogens are natural healers and at least in the States, their potential to bring healing to our communities remains untapped. Thank you very much. Um, are you all who are lined up here on the left interested in speaking in the two minutes time frame? Okay, so you um, will be our last speaker. Is my, You're going to be our last speaker on, uh, okay, so we'll have the remaining uh, five there. Okay, please come forward. I think that was a clown show and I didn't see anyone of any expertise speaking and uh, anyway, I noticed some of the justification for the progressive leftists on the, the council for the item to decriminalize federal class one mind altering natural drugs was a mention of the UN cultures throughout the world. As a reminder, taking directives or justifying actions from entities outside the United States or even outside Santa Cruz, simply because some entity or other outside authority does something, does not respect your obligation to represent the people of Santa Cruz. It is actually a leftist globalist philosophy similar to, for instance, sanctuary city status, which disrespects federal law authority, the concept of nationalism, and violates various meta principles of the United States. The various mentions of the UN, the World Health Organization, et cetera, as justifications for many of the council's policies and actions suggest an anti-American leftist globalist ideological bent to the council, which I find disturbing since I grew up a patriotic nationalist. 
Equally disturbing is the focus of this decriminalization of natural mind-altering drugs. While I tend to agree a supply-side only war on drugs has not really worked, I see zero in the way of a demand-side war in this ordinance, so it's a loser. Drug use in general is way out of hand, leads to poverty, it's very costly to society. I seriously doubt anyone has read the voluminous citations included in this item, and as far as I can tell, is a near verbatim copy of Rigel Robinson's, a 22-year-old youngest ever Berkeley City Council member of the UC Berkeley District 7, who seems to have copied it from Oakland. It seems like lazy legislation, and since when does the City Council of Berkeley write our resolutions? Some other, in this case, uncredited authority does not represent the people of Santa Cruz. Unfortunately for us, leftist copycatting legislation seems the rage. From personal experience long ago with the very such substances you're discussing, uh, they can indeed be transformative in much the same way placebos or tragic events are, such as the death of a parent. Your next speaker. <coughs> First, I'd like to go on the record saying that I'm actually in favor of decriminalizing all drugs, treating it as a health uh, issue. However, <clears throat> there's meth and heroin, which are in a class of their own. They have their own self-destructive powers, if you will, on the, on the person using them. Marijuana, mushrooms, these are fairly benign. Um, they give you the giggles, they do whatever. But the problem is, this would be all, this would be fine, except for the one fact that the majority of us drive these two-ton hunks of metal called vehicles. And decriminalizing this, which I just spoke with Chief Mills and there's very, very few arrests for mushrooms um, that he can recall. But decriminalizing this sent a kind of as a dog whistle to folks saying, hey, it's okay to use and yeah, by inference, possibly driving the influence. And unless there's some type of test for somebody under, under the influence of mushrooms, so whatever they are, the various names, uh, it, it, it kind of it troubles me. Especially, all, for instance, um, particularly when my four children, every time they got a driver's license, my concern wasn't with them uh, getting into a wreck and killing somebody. My concern was with somebody under the influence killing them. So, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Ali Fiducia. I work as a senior clinical data scientist with the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. I'm also the co-founder and director of Psychedelic.Support. This is a website that uh, has licensed <coughs> health professionals and also has educational material around harm reduction uh, around psychedelics. Um, there's also um, working as a director of a new foundation that's been started by a local philanthropist to use psychedelics to treat substance use disorders. So um, all of this work um, is something I'm a part of, but I'm here to speak of my own opinion of, about this topic. And um, <clears throat> that is, you know, I've been doing this research for 15 years, I have a specialty in substance use disorders. Right now we have no good treatments. Um, the ones we have uh, fail many people. So we have a lot of good research and evidence suggesting that these um, plants can be used to treat addiction as well as other mental health disorders. There's also some fascinating research coming out about how it could increase neuroplasticity and neurogenesis in the brain, which offers, are, and as well as reduces anti-inflammatory effects all over the body. So there's really a lot of scientific basis now to support the healing that people speak about from taking uh, psychedelic substances. And, um, you know, it's all about, I think, giving the right information to people and education, um, as well as um, the work we're doing with the clinical trials. Um, it takes a long time, and once these trials are completed, if they're successful in bringing them forward, then we will um, also be then facing the cost of getting this out to the public. Um, it's very inexpensive to grow mushrooms and plants, and so this is a, a separate opportunity for people to have access that may otherwise not be able to receive it in clinical trials or even post-approval due to the, the cost associated. Um, I think I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Hello, my name is Justice Earl. I've lived in Santa Cruz my whole life. I graduated from UCSC with a degree in um, biology and environmental studies in 2008. After that, I worked in high tech at Silicon Valley for, the, for seven years. And then I started my own company where I'm um, full-time employed here in Santa Cruz. Um, however, previous to all this, I was on probation for seven years and I was in and out of jail during that time. Uh, behaviors that I believe stem from trauma that I experienced as a child. While a delinquent teen, I would often take psychedelics as an escape, as it was one of the few places I felt peace and safety in my chaotic life. Not one time did I do anything illegal or harmful while on psychedelics, nor were they addictive, while the road with alcohol and other substances was fraught with abuse, harmful behaviors, and arrest. While I attribute my drastic conversion from a life of destruction to a fruitful life as a result of following a loving God, I attribute these psychedelic compounds, which I believe to be made by God, as helping to lead my way back to God. Due to my history and the stigma around drugs, I was 100% abstinent from anything considered an illegal drug for 15 years by the time I had started researching the science behind psychedelics. <coughs> Since then, I've applied my uh, rigor for my scientific background and I've been studying this movement very closely and passionately for over 18 months now. I currently hold the belief that through proper use of psychedelics, we're on the verge of a monumental breakthrough in treating some of the most severe conditions plaguing humanity that we currently do not have adequate solutions for. Conditions like PTSD, CPTSD, addiction, depression, anxiety, OCD, and more. I believe that Santa Cruz has the opportunity to be pioneers and going where the science and if I dare where the spirit lead rather than being stuck in outdated and ill-informed stigmas of our past. You'll be our last speaker. Good evening, Scott Graham. Um, a number of anthropologists have put forth the, the theory that most major religions came out of psychedelic use. That, that that's actually their origin is the uh, use of psychedelic plants. And uh, Timothy Leary thought that magic mushrooms actually came from outer space. That there was uh, flying saucers that came down and dump the spores for magic mushrooms on the planet so that humans could evolve. It was a, a, a tool left behind by uh, the space people to help people evolve and open their minds to alternative rea realities. Um, much of what's happened in Silicon Valley as a result of the use of psychedelics. Um, I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie about uh, Steve Jobs, but he, he was doing psychedelics and a lot of his ideas came out of his psychedelic use. So th there's a lot of information out there that points to the positive effects of mind-altering psychoactive drugs, or you, I, I don't even want to use the word drugs really because that gives it a negative connotation. Um, but <clears throat> these substances have done a lot to bring humanity and civilization to the point we're at now. Without them, we may still be dwelling in caves. Thank you. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, close public comment at this time. I wanna thank those who have been here uh, waiting to have this item come before us. I know we've been delayed um, with hearing the item. I also wanna thank just um, having honored and having taken the moment yesterday to um, respect and honor our veterans, the veterans that are here in the room and thank you for your service and your sacrifice as well as those that may be watching at home. Um, we have been going uh, since 1 p.m. this afternoon. We also have an evening item and um, we'll, we'll need to take a dinner break. I'm not sure um, how much debate the council wants to have on this item. I know the recommendation um, has it to be directed to the Public Safety Com Commission um, for additional kind of 
of uh, discussion. Um, if that's the direction that uh, the council is feeling comfortable with, um, perhaps we can take action on the item at this time. If there is more interest in a, in a more extensive debate, then I would ask that we reserve this item for after our evening item. And I think that's okay to postpone it if that's correct. Okay, Councilmember Matthews, um, Vice Mayor Cummings, and Councilmember Crone. I have just a basic question, and that is, is the recommendation to refer the resolution to the Public Safety Committee? That's Do I understand the... Initially, we weren't sure how much, um, what the response would be when we, put, when we were putting this forward. So the recommendation um, was to send this to the Public Safety Committee. However, um, over the past few days, and given since we've been having you know, TV interviews and um, since this has been proposed to the public, we've had very little, if not only maybe two or three letters of opposition to this, and we have a lot of people in the community who are in support of this. So, um, I, and so if I would actually be more inclined to move the recommendation tonight, um, just given that we haven't had as much um, opposition and need for more public engagement. So, but I'd, I'd like to let that you know, I don't know if we want to discuss that or if it should come back later then. I think, we, I think given that, I think we should have that come back later. So we'll go ahead and pick up this item at the end of our evening session. <clears throat> I, I would just, um, bear with me one second. Uh, I'm just a little concerned that the description in the agenda packet is to direct, uh, to refer it to the Public Safety Commission to take up the item for additional discussion and consideration. Um, given yeah, that description, uh, I'm a little concerned about the council taking action on it this evening, um, but perhaps one alternative would be to refer it to the um, Public Safety Committee with direction to bring it back to the council for action at the December 10th meeting. Mm -hmm. sure. I think I appreciate the interpretation. I, of I don't believe there's any burning urgency on this item, and I think there's been a good public uh, input and. Okay. And it could come back even on the consent calendar if that's the recommendation of the Public Safety Committee. Okay, so given that information, is uh, is it uh, the will of the council to move this item as uh, directed at this time? Sure. Okay, do you want to go ahead and... May, could I just ask? Because my understanding of it was um, the, the uh, language says receive a recommendation to consider a resolution, and then there's a lot of language, and take up the item for additional discussion and consideration. The item, I assume, to be... The resolution. So we can have the clarification in the minutes that it's that it's the resolution. The item direct the, the item public safety commission to take resolution. up the item is the resolution. Yeah. Yes, not the broad. No. Okay. <laughs> to the resolution. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the clarity. That's, yeah. that's how I interpret it. Okay. Given that information, I'm good. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'll, okay. It's going to the public safety committee. That's I'll correct. just say I hold my questions till then. Okay. So we'll go ahead and entertain a motion. Okay, I'll go ahead and second the motion. Any further discussion, Councilman? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say, you know, I have a degree of ambivalence on this. I'll be perfectly honest. And I think the um, the uh, uh, resolution as presented is uh, very enthusiastic. And um, uh, personally, I'll look it over and um, I think it could probably be um, tightened up a bit. That would be my suggestion. And um, I was really surprised to see this whole long um, bibliography attached to it. Um, I understand that um, those are all references, but I, I've never seen those in resolutions before, so I don't think they're necessary. That's just a comment. And those could be um, included as an appendix to an agenda report, but I don't think they're appropriate in the resolution. So those so, are just my comments on what we've got right here. So Tony, if a council member has, um, uh, ha uh, Tony, if a council member wants to weigh in um, on some of their concerns, should they email you their concerns uh, to inform the conversation around uh, the Public Safety Committee as a Brown Act? Yes, because a council member um, could attend the Public Safety Committee, but could not participate at all. Um, and so if there are concerns, you can go through you. Right, okay. and I can distribute okay. that. Okay. Uh, okay, any further discussion? Let the audience know what we're doing exactly. I don't yeah, know I will clear. clarify. Yeah, thank you for that. So um, thank you for, for 
pausing for the interpretation. We agendized, the item was agendized as essentially having this um, concept and resolution go back to our public safety committee, which is comprised of the three council members to my right. Um, they will be taking up the item to, uh, uh, one, incorporate any con uh, concerns or ideas that was brought to our city attorney from council members um, on the item to hear from the, com the public um, as well as other interested uh, community members or staff folks that want to weigh in, fine tune, and then return to the council for um, final adoption. We are advised by our city attorney that it's not wise to take action on final adoption of the resolution at this time, given the fact that we agendize it as a item that would go to our public safety committee. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, city clerk, the, the motion was made by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by myself. Come back on December 10th. Ideally, after it goes through the public safety committee. Which is December 3rd. Ooh, we have time for staff report on that. Um, so if it doesn't work before December 10th, um, if there's not enough time for the staff report, given the time constraint, then it would come back uh, at the, its earliest. January. January, January. yeah. January 1st. So just uh, at the earliest convenience after the public safety recommendation. Okay. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We're going to go ahead and adjourn our meeting until 7 p.m. Okay. Can I ask for clarification on that? We'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting if you want clarification. Oh, you Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, yeah. The other one was me. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm going to ask that you uh, stop your conversations. We're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to our 7 p.m. session of the November 12th, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. <laughs> Um, we have oral communications first, and then we have a um, an item that is going to be a joint item with our water commission after that. So um, I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Okay. The first two items are not the joint water, but I'll take one. I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, Council members Crone. Here. Weber. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cumming. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Here. So to clarify, we're gonna have two items that are gonna be council items, and then we're gonna open it up to a joint um, water commission item. So right now um, is oral communications. Oral communication is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. Um, I'm assuming those that have lined up to my left are here to speak to us on oral communications. Oral communications is generally about a half hour. We're getting started about five minutes after, so we'll try to go till about 7.35. I hope to hear from everybody. I want to remind um, all those that are inside the council chambers of our <coughs> rules of decorum, it's my responsibility to ensure that no matter who wants to come to speak to the council can do so without threat or intimidation. It was also my understanding that before we began tonight's proceedings that there was an incident that occurred to um, between community members. I want to remind you all, we want to hear from you, even though we don't, dis we may not agree with each other. We need to respect each other their, and their ability to address the community, address the council at, at this time. And if I see you disrupting the council proceedings, intimidating, or disrupting our ability to do, do um, our business, then I'm going to go ahead and give you a warning. If I see you repeat that behavior, then I'm going to go ahead and ask that you leave. I hope that does not happen tonight. We want to have an opportunity to hear from each of you, and we ask that you are able to do so in a respectful manner. So with that, I'll go ahead and um, start the oral communications, and you're welcome to come forward. You'll have up to two minutes. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Um, we would like to request the city of Santa Cruz City Council perform due diligence regarding the proposed demolition of the Circle Church by adding an item to your next agenda to discuss requesting the Historic Preservation Commission as an unpaid neutral party review the 111th Eric Circle Historic Report. 
The HPC has requested to review this report and make recommendations to city council, but staff will not allow that process. There is no language in the HPC bylaws nor the zoning ordinance that prohibits the HPC from doing this. The Historic Preservation Commissioners were appointed by the City Council to advise you because of their expertise in local history and their intentions are very different from those who prepare the DPR 523, which is the historic report. They are hired by the developers and their future work depends on garnering a reputation for favoring developers' outcomes. We want something more neutral. We believe it is imperative that city actions are congruent with the city's 2030 general plan, which actually coins the phrase demolition neglect as a problem for the city due to lack of sufficient historical evaluation. And what we've provided you tonight is binders with objective justification to support you in making this request. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. You'll have two minutes. Are you in line to speak? Yeah, you're welcome to come forward. You'll have up to two minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer Smith. I'm also here on the topic of the 111 Eret uh, Circle um, demolition. <coughs> and um, I, I'm here a little different appeal, um, really for the same purpose, which is to preserve it. Um, and that's our intention as a group is to do so and to attempt to purchase it back from the folks who have bought it and to do so at a reasonable cost so that there isn't um, a loss to, to that group. We see it as a potential cultural and art center that could benefit the entire West Side community as well as all of Santa Cruz, as well as all of the Central Coast with the uh, facilities could um, host speakers and music events and classes and STEM and art and culture and radiate out from the center of the west side, the very culture, tradition and spiritual heart of Santa Cruz, that which holds many of us here. We'd like to combine that kind of effort with the brain trust of the university and bring that power down into the community <coughs> to benefit all people in the community, rich, poor, and everyone in between. Um, and uh, you know, we feel that by you reviewing this, it, it allows you to ask the HPC to review this. It allows you the opportunity to make an objective um, decision on it and to potentially, in our opinion, come out on the right side of history. We can't go back once it's gone and we want to preserve it. I'd just like to say that we are here at somewhat of a cost because we've been threatened with a lawsuit by friends of the owners. Um, and so at, at our own peril and our own concern, we're here today for the community and to speak out, to attempt to come out on the right side of history and think of the many instead of the few and to community rather than community me for a closed housing. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor and Council Members, my name is Sue Powell. I have talked a lot about the Circle Church in um, the last few months. Um, just want to give you a little bit of background about myself. I settled in Santa Cruz 40 years ago, and I also spent the first 17 summers of my life here. I have deep roots in California with Latino heritage going back to the 1850s in the Central Coast area and indigenous ancestors as well. I am very interested in local historic preservation. In my 30 years of community activism here, I have worked to support public process, participatory democracy and environmental and social justice. I am currently very concerned that city planning staff is blocking public process on the Eret Circle development proposal. From my observations, it looks like staff is advocating for the developers without adequate concern for community input or community history. The planner for the Eret Circle Development Project is also staffed to the Historic Preservation Commission. He has repeatedly refused to allow the HPC to add an item to their agenda to review the project historic report submitted by the developers. As, as you're very aware, the role of the HPC is to advocate for the cultural and historic heritage of our city, to listen to community concerns and to advise the city council about sites that merit preservation. The HPC wants to review the Eret Circle historic report and they want to hear 
from the community so that they can assess the historic significance and cultural importance of the circled church. I am voicing a request from nearly 1,000 petition signers, neighbors, and friends that the city council allow the HPC to review the Eret Circle Project Historic Report as an agenda item at a public meeting. We're asking the city council to add an item to your next agenda to discuss this request. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Freya Sands. I wanna thank you for your service to the city. I would deeply appreciate the council ask the Historical Preservation Committee to look at the history and future benefits of the entire property at 111 Eret Circle. My understanding of the City of Santa Cruz 2030 plan after reading it carefully is that vibrant neighborhoods should be supported and enhanced and that city government wants to take, wishes to take into account the desires and perceived needs of the neighborhoods. Our neighborhood will be continue to be strong and become more vibrant with a continuing treasure at 111 Eret Circle. Thank you. Mayor and City Council, I did not come here to talk about the Circle Church, but I'm a neighbor. So I have to put my two cents on that one and say, it's a, been a great resource. My grandchildren have been to many events there, but that's not my topic for today. So now, um, dear City Council, in view of the escalating climate crisis, the city must accelerate our efforts to address the emergency. We are aware of the Santa Cruz City Climate Action Plan, the Climate Emergency Resolution, and the Green New Deal Support Resolution. We acknowledge the continuing hard work of City Sustainability Manager, Dr. Tiffany Wise West. However, due to the urgency of the climate crisis, we must continue to act decisively. The recent September global climate strike actions and demonstrations were well supported by much of the community, including over a thousand young people. They are very aware that their future is at stake and we cannot lie to them on this. Meanwhile, a number of cities are stepping up with their own Green New Deal plans to address both the climate crisis and many social justice issues. Santa Cruz needs to continue its leadership by taking further steps. The Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, which at this point is about 1,500 strong, has been looking at the resolutions of other cities such as Portland, Chico, Los Angeles, New York, San Luis Obispo, and others. We have emailed this request to you today. You probably have not had a chance to look at it yet, but we emailed it with links to all these cities at the bottom so that you can uh, find out more about those. And now I will hand over to my friend who will continue. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council and uh, assembled people. Uh, everybody on the TV feed too. Uh, my name's Carol Long, I'm a resident. Um, we of the Santa Cruz Climate Action Network request that the following be placed on the agenda for the year November 26th meeting for inclusion on the ballot for March 2020. We want a ballot initiative in other words and I know that the city council can place this on the ballot by themselves. We don't need a petition if you do that. So what we want you to put on the ballot is this. We hereby establish a climate action commission to oversee the design of a Santa Cruz Green New Deal and lay the groundwork for tackling the climate crisis. This group of leaders will support the development of a climate action plan that exceeds current state greenhouse gas emissions targets. <clears throat> the engagement and education of the public on, on the local issues related to the climate emergency. The collaboration with other city departments, business leaders, and community organizations toward a greener future and economy. The inclusion of a broad spectrum 
of, uh, of, of the community and at least one youth representative. The convening of public assemblies to involve the entire community in this Green New Deal effort. Thank you very much. In the interest of trying to get to everybody, I'm gonna go ahead and reduce the time to 90 seconds and we'll go ahead and have you come speak. Well, I'll have to talk really quickly. Um, I just saw an altercation that was really disturbing and Alicia Cool was basically, somebody went after her verbally. What I witnessed was it took the police in the room a long time to respond. We all watched it and hopefully it's on your cameras. So what I did was speak to the officer about the fact that this is a double standard. If I had done anything like what was waged on Alicia Cool, the woman was with an inch of her nose, I would have summarily been escorted from the room. And I think this double standard is really rampant in Santa Cruz and it really needs to be addressed. I'm here to talk about 190 Westcliff Drive. The plan is a social and environmental disaster. Apparently our city council does not seem to be grasping the meaning of climate change and the consequences that we're all facing. That plan is absolutely egregious in terms of climate change. It shows absolutely, practically zero comprehension in terms of the design toward climate change. After church this past Sunday, a gentleman, I'm gonna get totally cut off, so I don't appreciate that, Ms. Ms. Watkins. You're cutting into my free speech, and I, sit, I consider that an affront and an assault on my constitutional rights. You've done it ever since you got into office, and I have to say it's abysmal, and I would just like to say that what I've witnessed in this room tonight with that violent assault on Alicia Cool. And then, as if I was the problem, the way he acted, and the way you cut my time is just typical of you, isn't it? Next speaker, please. That's right. Yeah, hello, City Council. Yeah, um, I'm here, Bruce, from uh, Do Four Neighbors, where we've had ongoing problems for a year. I passed out the memo that went out a year ago, and our issues haven't been addressed. But I'm coming here tonight on behalf of the new projects that are in the pipeline and the, Gar the Garfield Church. I really want the City Council to encourage community input. I think it's so valuable to get something that's long-lasting and will really enrich this community and not have the same kind of problems we're having on Do Four Street. And I do want to point out, there's a real paradox here that the church, the former Comerica Bank building to which two restaurants were put in is deemed a historical structure and for that reason the city has been unwilling to put an obvious loading zone behind the building because it would require removing a little bit of a roof line whereas the Garfield church is not considered historic. It seems very, it seems like the city's making decisions that are convenient to their purposes instead of listening to community input. So please listen to community input. Thank you. My name is Stephen Stewart, I'm a resident of Woodrow Avenue, and uh, yesterday was Veterans Day, and I'm literally wearing my veteran status on my sleeve to raise an issue that uh, came up in September when I went to uh, get a new license that was uh, compliant with the new Real ID uh, requirements. I decided to get the veteran status uh, put on my driver's license, which is an option you have in California, and I needed to produce this item, which is a DD-214, Department of Defense form, which is the most important form that any veteran has. Uh, I had to take this over to the Veterans Hall on Front Street, and I was repelled by the pungent odor of urine far before I ever got to the door. And it just, made me think back to the day where when I served, you didn't get thanked for your service. You got spat upon or called a baby killer. And so that actually had a very dramatic effect on me because the last time I had been at a VA facility had been 43 years ago and I was so disgusted by that experience, I vowed to never go again. 
So this is on you because I talked to the staff and they deal with that every day. And they've pleaded with the city to clean up that that area, and I'm asking, do you have no shame that you would served. treat your veterans that way? Thank and that I exchanged six years for 90 seconds ask. worth of free speech. Your time is up, sir. Thank you for your service, and I'm sorry that you served. Please go right ahead. Yeah, bathrooms would be nice, wouldn't they? <clears throat> Instead of sending them to the catch committee, how about opening them up? 431-7766 is the phone number, the support number to call. Tonight, next to Highway 1 behind Ross, a vital community self-help project is taking place. Homeless people themselves have created and staffed the Desiree Quintero Survival Camp. 431-7766, act where city council and the supervisors have not. This is addressed to you, the community, and to you out there in the audience, since the council is hopeless on this issue, thanks to the defection of soon-to-be mayor Justin Cummings. Lots of money, but no winter shelter. The Quintero camp costs the city nothing. It uses vacant, fenced-off space. It created a protected survival place for disabled seniors, threatened women, it does so tonight. Those who had no place to go but sleep in storefronts, bushes, sidewalks, see for yourself. Support this restored, reimagined encampment. Again, it's the community that has to do this. This council is not going to. What do they need? They need tents, they need survival camping supplies, they need tarps, they need regular dumpster service. They've already gotten porta potties today, which Food Not Bombs placed there. Democratic Socialists brought food. The health department, the police, and the fire department have all checked the campground and found it not illegal, okay. Thank you. I'm here again to ask you to make the pedestrian bridge truly for pedestrians. First, I request that you start with the lettering on the Water Dragon Gate. Please direct the artist to make it say Chinatown Footbridge. It was said at the October 8th meeting that changes can be made and are expected to be made. Second, I request it be mandated that riders get off their bicycles and skateboards and walk across the bridge. The small signs do not work. They are not seen and or they are ignored. Please attach enforcement and consequences as you, as you did successfully with smoking in the park. Third, I request that you paint Walk your bike in large black letters, ladder style, at both ends of this footbridge. If any of you is willing to talk with me about this and the increasing problems with pedestrian safety and stress-free enjoyment of this lovely short span over the river, please tell me. All pedestrians of all abilities and ages should be able to walk across the bridge peacefully and comfortably through the park over the bridge in a leisurely meandering fashion if they so desire, stopping to linger for the pleasure and renewal offered by nature, the wildlife, the waters, the trees, the views of town, hills, mountains, sky. Your Thank time. you for your attention and consideration. Next speaker. <clears throat> Awful lot to think about <clears throat> here tonight. <clears throat> Susan Worth Sokel. Well, <clears throat> I don't know when the decision is going to be made on the library facilities across the street, but that beautiful plan by Jason Ar Architects was, to me, great. And uh, I hope we get to keep the library where it is and keep our farmer's market where it is and put that that parking lot in a trust. But I was still wondering, I don't think any, well, one quick question, what happened to all the water lilies that was in San Lorenzo's beautiful little 
<laughs> duck pond and the water lotuses, they're all gone. I was, <laughs> I'm missing them. I just walked through there today and there's not a flower left. Anyway, um, what about that beautiful Toys R Us, which we could change the T to a J and put Joys R Us. Couldn't we move folks into Toys R Us? Hardly any neighbors to, to give us the NIMBY response. It's a, it's a beautiful big building, nice parking lot for all the folks that are living in their cars. Couldn't we do something with that? Toys R Us is not coming back. And I'd love to see Joys R Us. Thank next, you. Next speaker. <laughs> Hi, my name is Alicia Cool, president of the Santa Cruz chapter of the California Homeless Union. As you know, a survival encampment has popped up again behind Ross. I am asking um, you to support this camp and not fight against it. Do everything that you can to offer supportive services. We have, we're use, currently using the Dignity Village rule model. So we have five basic rules. We are having people sign in and out. It's really an attempt to take all of the concerns that happened last time and have them addressed so that they are not repeated. Uh, we're reaching out to the people that are living at the tannery in order to bridge that gap so that we're all on the same page and they're working with us as well. And so we're really here to ask for your support and maybe you can deliver some um, garbage cans. Today we got our porta potties delivered, uh, Food Not Bombs and the California Homeless Union is providing the funds for that. And so we're not asking for very much, we're doing a lot with no budget. And so we're just asking for minimal support from you. Thank you. And I'm going to close oral communications after Pet, uh, Pat uh, in, the, in the back there. Go ahead. Hello. I'm Crystal Olson, and I'm here for support for the, we're going to change the name, the old Ross Camp. We no longer, it's no longer a Ross Camp. It, um, what, how should I say this? I'm not really sure how to say this. Um, but we want to show the city that, you know, we're not little kids. We don't need you know, a ride in and out of camp. We're not in jail. We just want to live and survive in a safe place. And we are trying to um, change everything. We're asking for support from the community. And I'm going to work at the homeless garden and I'm willing to take people to work with me that want to work. I'm willing, I go to school at Cabrillo, I'm a full-time student. I'm willing to take people to school that want to learn. You know, there are success stories that people just need to get a chance. You know, we're not allowing the same stuff to go on. This is not going to be okay. This is not a chop shop. This is not a drug place. This is a place to stay safe. And we are not okay. We, like she said, we have rules and we're going to try something different. And if, you know, we just get a chance and maybe some support from the community, that would be great. Okay, well, since the time was reduced, I won't get to read everything I wanted to read. But so I'll, instead, I would just say that uh, you can't possibly trust the homeless to, to do anything different than last time, can you really? I mean, and you, you wanna wait till there's 200 tents there to find out that, oh, guess not, you know? So I, that's, a, you know, that, that's a big bet, you know? Um, and, and the idea that they do no, they, they cost nothing and there's no harm in having a camp there, I, I don't believe it. it it, it didn't work out so well for the Ross, Ross merchants. It doesn't work good for the, our city's image. It, it entices homeless to come here. Uh, it's a bad deal. There, you know, some other place, I don't know. You know, you did it at the beach, you could do it there. Um, I don't know where to start. The 240-year-old American experiment in a free people was injured October 29th with rent control adoption in Santa Cruz. I hope to never again hear the leftist victim oppressor garbage justification of tenant protection spoken. One half of the problem here is mass poverty. In 2018, Santa Cruz County was ranked the third highest in its supplemental poverty rate of over 21% in a state ranked first in the nation with a national SPR poverty rate of over 18%. That is awful. 
Poverty occurs for several reasons, not really related to normal investor, retailer, landlords, and here are two. Well, I'm out of time, that's enough. Hey, and maybe uh, start uploading oral communication speeches that are actually read, you know, instead of throwing them away. Next, next speaker. Good evening. Uh, my name is Candace Brown from East Morrissey. I came here today to speak about um, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Um, on September 25th, and then again on October 9th, the commission, I believe, did violate the Brown Act. Um, within 24 hours, they were asking commissioners to ask for, to validate the censorship of two uh, city council members. Um, they were asked to, to vote on this, to go back to the city council. Um, after thinking about it and actually watching the video, they realized that they, they were sort of being had, so, you, so to speak, and wanted to rescind their votes on October 9th, and they asked for that to be considered, and they were not allowed to do so. Um, there were agenda items that were presentations, and yet they were making motions, which is, again, against the Brown Act. Um, there were 20 of us women that had listened to the videotape and were horrified about what happened on September 25th. So we went to the October 9th meeting. It's all on audio. I really recommend that people um, listen to that video and that, that people from the city manager or the city council's office investigate this. Because basically this was a kangaroo court where they actually required that the commissioners vote for start by believing, and if they didn't, then they were asked to resign, which is against the charter of the of the ordinance of this commission, which was voted by the people in 1981, and that is also not on the website. Please investigate this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hillary Martitius, and I live at 1139 Walk Circle, and I've been there since 1994. And I have enjoyed the circle for what it is. And I'm very simple, I've had four years of art history at Cal Berkeley, and what I have to say to you is that the center of the circle is like a cake, and nobody puts anything but the cherry in the middle. So you don't just dump anything, you put the right thing, and let it be something that reflects our wonderful neighborhood and its history, has a beautiful history. Okay, that's that. Okay, you know, I came here originally to talk to you guys about uh, reopening a Ross, but I had, who's got kids here? Who's got nieces, nephews, things like that? We'll go ahead and pause okay. the we don't, we don't respond to you. This is the opportunity for us just okay, to Okay, it, it, it was a rhetorical question. So I have this lady that's a director of the homeless, you know, the director of ad thing, whatever, Alicia Kuehl, posting pictures of my kids online with derogatory statements. And she's done it to a bunch of other people. So the people that are causing a hassle earlier were me and my wife. And I'm not, I'm done playing with everybody here. I'm done screwing around. You guys open that camp again. It took me a year to, uh, to correct my sales. It took, a, uh, it took six months for us to get rid of those rats. We haven't had to call a cop in five months. Open that camp again, fine. but. It, you gotta think about everything else that happened last time. It cost you $300,000 to maintain that thing. And a person that's running it now is posting pictures of my kids and other kids online and making derogatory statements. I mean, w w what's up with this? I mean, this is just bizarre. And for her to think that we're not coming after her civilly, I mean, this is just a joke. I mean, my landlord, every, you know, this is just stupid. My business will close in April. My lease is up. I will walk away from my business. I will no longer support Beckman's, Pizza, uh, Pacific Cookie Company, Aldo's. Uh, I go down the list, Carrie's Cookies, um, Kind Grind. I buy products from all local companies. I've had people working for me for 28 years. I put thousands of kids through school and to have somebody tell me that I don't pay my staff fairly, this is just fucking bizarre. Excuse me. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I understand that uh, one of the items was postponed having to do with the purchase of a backhoe and a dump truck for the water department. And um, I am the president of the Electric Auto Association Central Coast Chapter, Beverly Day Show is my name. And um, I invited you in the past to consult with me about any uh, new vehicle purchases uh, 
that were not planned to be electric because I said there were electric vehicles to serve all purposes. However, I was mistaken. They, um, the backhoe and the dump truck are not available in electric yet. However, um, something that would something that would be an improvement on uh, running those vehicles. Well, anyway, one step back. I want to encourage you to hang on to those diesel trucks and make an, uh, a, a modification because uh, they will be coming soon. We already have the semi trucks by Tesla and another company and Ford has gone ahead and is uh, making the F-150 which is a complete game changer for electric vehicles. So um, I don't know how long you plan to keep those vehicles but certainly uh, I'm sure they're a long time. So I would encourage you to keep it and use biodiesel. The biodiesel station has closed down but one of the former owners of it is still selling it and I can give you that information. Thank you. Next speaker. You. I've been coming to these meetings a long time and I've never seen so many people jumping up, clapping and, and hooping and hollering and supporting the stuff that you say. They come up to me telling me Drew's doing a great job. Well, I like Drew. He's doing good work. Brother thing. Um, when a person is voting on housing issues, they should not have a conflict of interest like this human over here does. She always waters down, takes out the teeth of any measure pertaining to housing, which helps her bottom line, her dollar amount. People, life and death situations, but she put her dollar amount ahead of these issues that are real, people are hurting and dying. I've been coming, like I said, a long time for the meetings, and I remember coming to meetings, and one day this was this mayor, the next day it's a different mayor. So I don't know how this mayor is still in office all this time. I'm wondering, is there like some kind of thing she's done where she don't have to change to give somebody else the power of the, the, the seat of the mayor? So I think something should be looked into legally, state, somebody from the state, city office, look into how long has this person been in office and why is she still there? Should she have left? And if she had not, let some legal consequences come and happen to that. Um, when it comes to... Your time is up. All right, next speaker, please. Tonight, I went to Ross Camp and I brought a couple people from our local chapter, the ACLU. Actually, sorry, one person, the president of the ACLU local chapter. And we walked around the camp and I suggest every single one of you walk around that camp. It is so well organized. It's not like last time. It's, they have a front office. <laughs> a tent, they have everything more organized than any of the other city-run camps. So I beg you, every single one of you, I, I know some of you will go, but I appreciate if every single one of you will go. I think you might be impressed with how it is run, with the people who are staying there, with the rules they have in place. So that's all I'm asking. Please sanction, please go there and see for yourself how it's run. That's all I ask, thank you. Pat Kittle, Santa Cruz. I'm not here to talk about uh, the homeless situation, but I'd like to quickly say, and I've run this by uh, Robert Norris, he and I get along quite well, by the way, but I've continuously over the years told him, you know, there's nothing you could do that would generate more goodwill for the homeless then if the homeless would simply not trash wherever it is they happen to be, whether it's a sidewalk or the Poganip where they shouldn't be in the first place or wherever, just don't trash your place. If you see somebody else that's trashed it, pick it up. I've done that 
for years when I'm doing forest work and frankly, kind of gnaws at my patience. Having said that, the reason I originally came here is to discuss something that uh, I often discuss, and that is the undue power of the Israel lobby in uh, both international, national, regional, and state and local affairs. The Israel lobby has far more power than what it legitimately deserves. We are at war since 2001, and frankly long before 2001, for the reason that uh, supposedly Arab hijackers uh, destroyed the um, World Trade Center. <laughs> it wasn't uh, Muslims that were primarily responsible for that, folks. Okay, your time is up. Oh, one minute tonight? You, you had 90 seconds in the interest of trying to oh. get to everybody. Okay. So that concludes oral communications. Thank you. And we're going to go ahead and uh, move on to our uh, evening agenda. So I'll just go ahead and close oral communications. I'll allow a moment to transition and we'll have some folks from our water department come up. So those are no, who are not interested in staying, this would be a good opportunity for um, you to leave the council chambers as we move forward with our regular scheduled evening agenda. Oh. Jen, go Jenna Coleman. Yeah. There's a little transition time. You know what the name of it is? Because I did see a bunch of presentations, but it didn't look like Well, it should be in the M drive when the, you know. The oh, council right. presentations under the um, short term stuff, right? Sure. Right here. I don't think yeah. yeah, so it should be uh, uh, this one in your, in your department, right? Uh, the council presentations should be, yeah, two minutes. Okay. And then it should be. Uh, Okay. Okay. So we'll go ahead and move on to our general business portion of tonight's evening item. And um, for the community and for the council, we'll do a just quick reminder of how this will go. Um, the presentation from the staff will first occur, then we'll have an opportunity for council members to ask uh, questions of the staff. Um, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment and members of the community who would like to address us on this item, and then we'll return back for council action and deliberation. We actually have two general business items that are just gonna be with the council weighing in on. We're gonna go ahead and take a short break after we hear those two items and um, we'll allow for an opportunity to have our uh, water commission come up and join us um, for the remainder of our, our evening. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our uh, water director, Rosemary Bernard. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, so we're here tonight to do a couple of items before we have the joint meeting with the water commission that are related to a bond issue that we would like to um, uh, put onto the market here just fairly, fairly shortly, a water revenue bond Bond that would have us be um, basically finding a way to uh, get money out of uh, for, from investors to invest in our water system and help us to finance the improvements we're making in the capital improvement program. So before we get into the revenue bond portion, though, I want we want to talk a little bit about um, 
using green bonds to finance this particular piece. And also before we, uh, we get too much into the presentation, in addition to the staff here tonight, myself and our finance manager, Jeremy Becker and Heidi Luckenbach and uh, Chris Coburn, our deputy directors for uh, engineering and operations respectively, we have with us tonight um, our city's financial advisor and the water department's financial advisor, a gentleman named Bob Gamble from uh, PFM, which is a national firm that does this kind of stuff specifically for uh, public agencies, and also our bond counsel from Jones Hall, uh, Chick Adams, who has advised us on the, um, both on the green bonds and also on the, um, on the water revenue portion of this. So we will probably be calling them up if there are questions that you would like to hear from them on as they have been a part of our really important, critical important part of our team as we've done this work. So um, first we wanna ask the council to take an action to establish guidelines for the issuance of green bonds. And green bonds are a form of municipal bonds that are marketed to investors who are interested in sort of putting their financial resources to support environmental sustainability, climate mitigation, or climate ad adaptation activities. And they, the programs for green bonds started in about 2007. Um, typically, issuers of green bonds will uh, set a set of guidelines for the kinds of projects that could be um, used to, you could use green bonds to finance, and then they would also commit to annual reporting. Um, so what we want you to do tonight is to basically uh, adopt the guidelines. We've given you a set of guidelines and um, also the reporting that we would propose to do on this would be um, concurrent with the work that you hear from for, from Tiffany Wise West on the city's climate action plan and the climate adaptation plan as our work is really very um, connected to that work. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you a graph here that is a little bit about the uh, growth and issuance of green bonds. Um, I believe the number from 2018 is something like 150 billion, and you can see that the kind of brownish purpley color as opposed to blue, which is what it should have been, but the water piece is about 13% of that. And um, others in the state that have used green bonds in the water agency, uh, San Francisco PUC, Public Utilities Commission, San Francisco, their water wastewater entity, and also East Bay Municipal Utility District, and a number of other agencies similar to us have used this as a way to um, get investors who are aligned with the kinds of work that we're doing to improve water supply reliability and uh, infrastructure resiliency as part of our climate adaptation strategy. Um, the, uh, the kinds of guidance that generally, go ahead, Jeremy, to the next slide. Um, these are the kinds of things that you'll see in um, the kinds of projects that are eligible for green bond financing in the guidance we're suggesting. And it's pretty much the kinds of things that you would expect to see that are environmental sustainability, things like reducing pollution, um, you know, implementing, uh, reuse, reduce, recycle kinds of uh, strategies, um, reduce the, con the consumption of fossil fuels, et cetera. So these are the basic um, principles that are being used. And then we have some guidance specifically about the kinds of projects in the city that would be qualified. Go ahead to the next page. Um, we wrote these kind of broadly um, because we want them to be applicable to any part of the city. Obviously the water um, items would fit in here very nicely. And I included in the staff report some a pullout from the um, climate adaptation plan that included the kinds of things that were included for the water department in that uh, plan, and they're very aligned with these kinds of activities. Um, I think with that, I'm gonna stop on this, and if you have questions, we'd be happy to try to answer your questions. Great, thank you very much, and thank you always for reaching out in advance to help us understand the topics. Are there any questions from the council at this time? Council Crone. I had asked you an earlier question, you were gonna look into it. Um, how much at the end of the, the term, how much will we have paid for the bonds? Right, so um, I'm gonna let Jeremy Becker, our finance man manager, at, answer that question. Um, he's gonna tell you how much that we're going to make in the bond sale and then what the amount we estimate we would pay over the life of the bonds um, in total. 
Uh, yeah, the issuance we, we put in the resolution for 30 million, but we're actually only going to ask for 21 million. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we were kind of covered. Uh, and then uh, what we're expecting from uh, what Bob Gamble has told us and our financial advisors, they expect us to get more money than 21 million, basically 26 million. So that would reduce the interest costs that we're gonna have on the bonds. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, basically all the debt service costs at the end of 30 years will be close to 42 million. So you're talking true interest of about 15. So one of the things I mentioned when um, we were talking in advance with a number of people is that the, some of these projects are very expensive, they have very long lives, and it makes a lot of sense, even though it does cost more to finance these through debt, issu debt issuances, it makes a lot of sense to spread those costs out uh, over a longer period of time because there are beneficiaries uh, in the future who will um, have the value of these projects for many years to come. And debt financing them does help to sort of spread those costs over the whole multiple generations of beneficiaries. Any questions, Councilmember Myers, then Councilmember Matthews. Just um, have a little bit of, uh, just, just out of curiosity, what kind of investors are um, sort of investing in these green bonds? So I'm gonna ask Bob Gamble, if you'd come up to the microphone here, please, Bob. <laughs> that is a good question. And if I could add another question, because I think it'll be the same answer. Um, my understanding from talking to you is um, the di the interest rates aren't different between these and conventional municipal bonds. That's correct. Choice. But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good evening. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh, so, um, to the to the first question, investors in green bonds are are still institutional investors by and large. So, large bond funds are creating funds that are intended to attract investors who are interested in environmentally sound investments, basically. Um, and uh, it's, it's a growing area. It's, it was, it's fair to say, you know, three or four years ago, it was fairly embryonic. It has grown very substantially, as the slide showed. Um, and, and currently, there essentially is no, you know, what we call spread between the cost of a regular municipal bond, tax exempt bond, and a green bond. They're essentially priced the same way. There's some expectation going forward that there could be, at some point, if, if the investment base grows in green bonds, that they could actually become cheaper than regular bonds. Thank you, thank you for the clarification. I assume that was, uh, yeah, Council yeah. Members, okay. Any other questions from the council at this time? Okay, thank you for your presentation. Thank you for the clarifying um, responses. Any other questions? No? We'll go ahead and open it up to public comment to see if there's any members of the community who want to address this on this item. You'll have up to two minutes. Please come forward. Hey, Garrett Phillip. Uh, once again, I see in the justifications of this item references to globalist authorities and their guidance as justification for action on your part. You cite again globalist entities such as the World Bank or the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, or green bond <coughs> principles that were developed by the International Capital Market Association as justifications for your actions. Taking directives from globalist authorities does not do the job of representing the American people or Santa Cruz in particular. You apparently take your directives from outside the city and country. By your own admission, a bond is a bond, but not really. To be a green bond, you march to a foreign authority's template, such as the International Capital Market Association's definition of a green bond. What foreign directive strings or project templates are required or attached to be a green bond? We don't know exactly, but they're not products of American authority. You don't need, and the people, if they aren't rabid globalists, don't want foreign input into environmental projects or foreign strings attached to financing. I see in the next agenda item, a Japanese bank is now writing or modifying our city ordinances to obtain financing. Is our credit really that bad? Uh, that is an example of what I'm talking about. We don't have to bend to the left of socialist globalist ideologies and shouldn't since our own people's wisdom, America made of principles and beliefs are more than enough for any task. Well, actually better since the USA is up till now and I'm worried about it staying that way, the most powerful, prosperous, longest lasting democratic republic in the history of man. Thanks. Okay. Next speaker, please.
Good evening. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I'm a resident of the Aptos Hills, and um, I always worry about taking on huge amounts of debt without really knowing what projects are going to benefit by it. So. Um, I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to thoroughly look at that, but I would like to support your council and um, very astute water manager here to do all you can to support alternative recharge. We, uh, working with Dr. Andy Fisher at UCSC and the Recharge Initiative, do some groundwater or stormwater capture and uh, let that infiltrate into good areas that could uh, naturally recharge the aquifer. I also support in terms of green buildings that I saw, um, I have heard Ms. Menard say that UCSC has in their new buildings um, the ability to have sort of internal, um, it captures the water that you let run to get the water heating up and it recirculates it and use it, it's a separate system. And I want to encourage your council to work closely with the city's building codes and upgrade that so that it is actually a requirement in all new building. Um, I also want to take a, a objection to the water department using a quarter of a million dollars to do phase two study of recycled water here. I think there is, and we will talk about this later, I think it is un unnecessary other than to use for irrigation and I urge you to look at that expanded into the golf course area. Um, and above all, replace your infrastructure. I saw that, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, losing 0.2 billion gallons a year with leaks and that's uh, that really needs to be changed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other members of the community wanting to address us on this item? Seeing none, you'll be our last speaker. Um, <clears throat> Beverly Day Show again. Uh, I'm curious about a couple of things. I don't really know how the water department works. Does the water department include wastewater treatment as well? No. Okay. Um, could you tell me what uh, percentage these bonds would be and what the cost of the actual loaner bonds would be? And um, I'm going to go ahead and pause your time. This is a chance for us to hear from you. We'll try to take note of your questions, but we're not going to get into a dialogue and respond. I understand. Right no, okay, I understand. Right yeah, I'm just looking at people. Um, and uh, I'm also curious uh, if there's uh, transportation involved in what's being asked, because something I didn't say was that 82% of our emissions are coming from vehicles, according to the Monterey Bay Community Power's recent inventory. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, um, I want to thank. Oh did, you, oh, did you have a comment? Did you? Okay. All right. You'll be our last speaker. I, first of all, we whatever projects you end up eventually deciding on, and you'll have control over that. We have a huge backlog of needs in the water department in terms of our basic infrastructure at the water treatment plant, and all these 150-year-old pipes. Uh, that need to be replaced. I appreciate you're spreading the cost of this over future generations who will benefit from it. And I see no reason you shouldn't take green bonds. It's a, what a wonderful idea. And the idea that somehow you're gonna be under the control of international forces seems a bit far-fetched to me. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay, we'll go ahead and bring it back then, Councilmember Matthews. Well, thank you. I wanted to just clarify for one thing, this agenda item is simply enabling setting up a framework for when we do decide to uh, uh, issue bonds for uh, major capital projects that we will uh, look for opportunities to use green bonds for financing. It, it defines no specific project, no, no specific amount, no specific interest rate, et cetera. But I wanna thank our staff for bringing this to us. Um, we have said um, so many times no one can count them. We wanna look for every way we possibly can um, uh, implement environmentally friendly policies throughout the city's operations and this is one more. And uh, it's very uh, explicit in the uh, guidelines that it can be used uh, only for those types of projects that do have a green or environmentally beneficial um, uh, purpose to them. Um, uh, to Ms. Deshaux's question, it could be environmentally uh, sound beneficial uh, transportation policies, if I understand that correctly, uh, and in many other departments as well. But um, this is just one more wonderful option that we now have available to us. So I'm gonna go ahead and move the recommendation before us. Yeah, I'll second that. 
Okay. <clears throat> Due to motion by Councilmember Matthews, um, seconded by myself. Um, I know Councilmember Brown um, wanted to speak, but before we do, did you have any response to any of the questions that were raised during public comment? Or if you remember them. If not, maybe no. offline they can get back to you. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I think it would probably would be for our um, <coughs> investment advisor if there is an answer to that question at this time, but I m imagine the price of bonds would depend on yeah, it would depend on what the, you know, when it's issued, what the offer is. Right. So um, I just wanted to make a quick comment saying I absolutely support this. I really appreciate the work that the Water Department has done uh, to, to de kind of move us in this direction for the city as a whole to be taking that leadership, <coughs> uh, you know, I think is going to be, you know, definitely uh, worthwhile for the city. And so I really appreciate it. My lack of questions does not... Uh, refer to my a lack of interest in this issue, but I and I so I also want to say I really appreciate you taking the time to answer a lot of questions and walk um, council members through this in advance, so um, we could understand uh, to the extent we are able a very complicated set of questions and issues. You're here, okay. Uh, seeing no other um, interest in, in commenting at this time, we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we want to move on now to the water revenue bond sale, and this is a this particular um, item asks you to do two things. One is it asks you to uh, authorize a resolution that would um, allow us to do the sale. And as uh, it's noted here, the resolution is for up to 30 million, but the actual number is going to be uh, smaller in the neighborhood of around 21 and a half million. It would be a competitive uh, sale. So in other words, it's kind of a little bit like an auction, if I understand correctly how it runs. And there are a list of projects here that are listed, including the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant, replacement of University Tank uh, number five, uh, improvements in the Newell Creek Pipeline and other capital projects. Some of you will remember a couple of years ago, we brought you a um, short-term line of credit that uh, was bridge funding. And so that would this loan will also take the money that we've expended out of that short-term line of credit and uh, will reimburse that and uh, basically, you know, long-term finance the the resources that we've um, spent that money on, which is all capital related. Uh, so that's the first item. And if you have questions about the terms or conditions of the resolution, um, Chick Adams, our bond council can answer those questions for you. And the second one is a, a, a council policy, it's a change to the council policy that would explicitly add an additional purpose to the use of the water reserve, the rate stabilization fund that uh, we already have on the books and would add the green language that you see there and specifically allocate, uh, allow for the allocation of those funds without following the council um, approval process that's in section um, three of that council policy. This is in lieu of providing the trustee for the bonds with a million dollars in sinking funds so that we would give them that and then they would hold on to that million dollars for a really long time. Instead, we maintain the sort of guarantee, if you will, in our resources and are able to provide the same purpose that the sinking fund would from the trustee um, using this mechanism. So those are the two things we're asking you to do in this process. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Any questions from the council? Councilmember Myers? Just um, real quick, uh, I, I took a all day tour with your staff yeah. um, about six weeks ago and uh, actually Vice Mayor um, Cummings and I were both on that trip and I just, uh, in looking at the list of projects, um, I'm seeing most of the locations and the projects that we visited that day as being as being part of this list that would be funded through these. Through right, the, and the and I think when we we spoke, we've also um, I think the council's taken action this year, this calendar year in particular, on a number of um, actions relative to loans from the state revolving loan fund, various kinds of uh, revenue 
you know, dedications, those kinds of things that would allow us to borrow money from for some of the bigger projects, the concrete tanks project that's planned for um, the Graham Hill Water Treatment Plant and the Newell Creek Dam Inlet Outlet Project through the um, State Revolving Loan Fund, which currently has an interest rate uh, at about 1.8%, so substantially lower than market rate uh, and would as we anticipate those projects have a price tag of around 130 million, I think, uh, that the lifetime benefit of financing those through the uh, state revolving loan fund versus market rate is about $45 million. And I just, uh, just for clarification, you use the term uh, sinking fund, and I'm just wondering if you could maybe just explain how about, that. Um, how about one of my um, esteemed colleagues out here can answer that question better than I can. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My uh, name is Chick Adams. I'm with the firm of Jones Hall in San Francisco. We're your bond council. Um, the sinking fund actually refers, it's an older term. The, the newer term is rate stabilization fund, and, and that's the one that Rosemary was referring to. It's a mechanism whereby if you get to any year where in order to make your debt service uh, payments, you need to raise rates precipitously, you can cushion that by using prior year's funds. That's what a rate stabilization fund boils down to, and that's all, that's all it is. And uh, by modifying your policy, you're enabling yourself to do that. Um, about it. Thank, thank you. Any, any other questions? Thanks for the clarification. Any member of the community wanting to address this on this item, please come forward. You'll have up to two minutes. Is there any other members of the community wanting to address this on this item? <coughs> okay. Okay. I, I see you're going to use uh, MUFT Union Bank as trustee, a wholly owned foreign Japanese banking corporation with interest in wholly owned subsidiaries in the United States. Would it be too much to ask what is the justification for this instead of using a more American owned bank and keeping the considerable estimate of 15 million dollars or so of interest of Santa Cruz ratepayers money in this country? Is there any chance locals can buy some of these water bonds as a hedge against the astronomic water rate increases that will probably follow? I see you're going to modify by resolution city policy, giving up your authority as a city council to suit this foreign owned bank's demands and is an excellent example of your following globalist directives of a foreign authority instead of the people of Santa Cruz. I see you're going to use a bank that has paid huge sums of money as settlements for wrongdoing and violation of US sanction law. While I would tend to agree you would be hard pressed to find an American mega bank also not guilty of essentially a ton of criminal activity, hey, give it a try, you never know, you might find one. Surely some must exist. It would have, have been nice to know the simplified cost benefit analysis of these water projects in a bit more detail to see what ratepayers are actually buying with an estimated $41 million, the maturity of the bonds, the lifetime of the improvements, and the estimated pipeline of future debt demands. You know, hard questions like the ones that weren't asked at the May meeting where water treatment increases were rubber stamped after a chamber clearing radical grievance monger hissy fit and some progressive city council members abandoned their duties. I'm still wondering why the rate increases put in place for that didn't include rolling them back after the improvements were over in five years. I'm wondering about that same issue again here when the inevitable rate increases come a calling. Thanks. Next speaker. Hi, forgive me. I don't understand how the water, whole water thing works. I'm trying to figure it out as you're speaking. Um, so I did hear some mention of wastewater. I'm sorry, I keep looking at her because I know she has the answer. Um, wastewater. Anyway, um, I'm curious if, um, because I see from the meeting earlier about the cogeneration engine, I just want to make sure that the cogeneration engine is cogenerating on reusable or renewable energy. And that's all. Right, seeing that uh, no other members of the community wanting to address this on this item, we'll go ahead and return back to the council for action and deliberation. I'll go ahead and see if there's a motion on the floor. I'll, I'll move the staff recommendation. Second it. We have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Myers. Any further comment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, that passes unanimously. Councilmember Matthews. I do have a question. These are such big projects. Big. Mm -hmm. what, what's your timeline? Or I guess that's, we get to that on our <laughs> side, don't we? <laughs> well, yes, um, but, I get, but I will tell you that um, for the projects that are, are, we're looking at the financing from the State Revolving Loan Fund, uh, we're going to be bringing the authorization for um, the council to approve the plans and specs and authorize us to go to bid on the Mill Creek Dam Inlet Outlet Project to the council on the 28th of January. So that one is coming and we expect that one to be in construction next summer. Um, ne at your next meeting, you will be getting one of the uh, projects, the approval for one of the projects uh, that is would be paid for out of these funds, which is the um, replacement of the pipeline between the coast pump station. It's under the river pipeline. This is the project that we've been talking about related to uh, the site that the uh, River Street Camp is on that um, requires us to access that site for the micro tunneling process that's going to be done to replace that pipeline. It's a critical piece of infrastructure that if we if it fails, we cannot get water really from any any of our river sources, our flowing sources, to the Graham Hill water treatment plant, and things can go bad pretty darn fast if that happens. So it's a critical piece of infrastructure we know is in bad shape, and that project is gonna come for approval of the plans and specs at your next meeting. And all these bond proceeds are expected to be spent in three years. That's and that's, uh, that's basically the, the maximum length of time we're allowed by federal regulations. And it also helps um, to just make sure you meet that period of spending because it costs money to issue bond proceeds. So the longer time that you can spend those or make sure that you're covered, uh, the better off you're gonna be in terms of interest. Councilmember Myers had one last. So it sounds like we have a, a bit of a Green New Deal uh, kind of coming on here. <laughs> Definitely do. And and uh, again, a lot of our um, issues are very, this is all about water supply, reliability, and infrastructure resiliency, both of which are necessary for us to add up, adapt to climate change that we already are experiencing. And um, we're gonna be talking more about that in the next part of this meeting. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So with that, we'll go ahead and take a brief recess while um, the council chambers are prepared for our joint uh, meeting with the Water Commission. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started again. Um, so good evening again to those who are now tuning in to our November 12th, 2019 Joint City Council Water Commission meeting. Um, so I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll and welcome up our commissioners. Thank you. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Meyer. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. Mayor Watkins. Here. Commissioners Baskin. Present. Meckes. Here. Ryan. Here. Schwarm. Here. Will Shoes. Here. <laughs> I do that every time. Vice Chair Wadlow. Here. And Chair Angford. Here. Before we begin, I have just a few comments and then um, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, the purpose for tonight's meeting is to review and discuss the proposed revisions to the city's work plan to achieve water security. I'd like to begin tonight's meeting with a re recap, a quick one of how we got here. As many in the audience and those who may be watching from their homes tonight um, may remember, in 2014, the city council appointed 14 members of the community to a committee to develop solutions to the city's ongoing water shortage problems. The Water Supply Advisory Committee, or WASAC as it's known, met for 18 months and took a deep technical dive into the city's complex water system. 
Supported by a technical advisory committee made up of consultants and staff, WASAC members were able to come to agreement on five recommendations to achieve water supply security. Those recommendations included increased water conservation, water transfers, aquifer storage and recovery, recycled water, and desalinization. The WASEC set an ambitious course recommending that the Water Department evaluate all recommendations concurrently with final decisions to be made on which course to take by 2020. Work began in earnest in 2016 and the Water Department has made tremendous progress on evaluating alternatives. Through their analysis and pilot testing, they've developed a revised work plan. Tonight, we'll hear about their recommendations for integrating new information, taking advantage of near-term opportunities for supply augmentation, and adjusting the timeline for decision-making. But before we start tonight's meeting, I'd like to ask if there are any WASAC members in the audience, and if so, please stand to be recognized. Thank you. You understand those who are involved here? Please. Please. Those that are here with us tonight, as well as others, put hundreds of hours into this very complicated and very productive process. I'd like to thank you on behalf of our entire city council for all your service to our community. So thank you so much. So with that, we'll go ahead and move forward with our presentation this evening or any additional remarks that may want to be said by the chair. And um, we'll follow a similar structure as we did earlier. Okay, yes. Please. Thank you, Mayor Watkins. And I would like to take just a couple of minutes uh, before Rosemary gets started. Uh, and first off, on behalf of the commission, express our gratitude to the council for the opportunity <laughs> to work with y'all on water policy and for inviting us here this evening uh, to join you at this meeting. This meeting's a little different than past joint meetings we've done recently. Uh, the most recent water supply augmentation strategy meetings have been mostly informational in nature. And this one, we're asking you to make uh, a big decision. Uh, we're at a crossroads in implementing the strategy. Um, and uh, specifically, we're proposing a, uh, a major change in uh, the roadmap. What the Water Supply Advisory Committee called an adaptation um, rather than just an adjustment. Uh, specifically as regards the timeline over which we're going to be implementing uh, the roadmap. Uh, by way of background, Rosemary and her team uh, over the last, uh, well, several years, but particularly this year in an iterative process, have been diligent, thoughtful, and creative in taking a comprehensive <coughs> look at our existing system, uh, as well as uh, our need for uh, supply augmentation. Um, and uh, mindful of some of the points that Rosemary made earlier about um, uh, delayed system rehab that we need to undertake, um, some supply benefits that we're gonna that are gonna accrue as a result of that work, <coughs> uh, positive piloting results we've been getting on aquifer storage and recovery uh, in the Belts well field, uh, demand uh, actuals that have fallen short of our original projections, uh, meaning we have a little bit less uh, demand we have to try to meet. Uh, the establishment, both imminent uh, and recent, of uh, groundwater sustainability plans uh, in our basins and our still evolving understanding of the impact of climate change on our uh, largely surface-based uh, water supplies. Um, we're bringing forth a proposal, uh, staff is bringing forth a proposal that the commission supports that'll make uh, moderate but impactful uh, increases in our available supply by leveraging existing infrastructure, taking advantage of the investments we're gonna be making uh, in our existing system and some modest additional no regrets investments um, that'll uh, get us some additional supply and buy us some time during which we can get smarter about the things we need to get smarter about so we can make the right decision to spend the right money at the right time to, to fully solve our water supply needs in the future. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Rosemary and her team. Thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate the hard work of everyone who's been involved in this, really, from the Water Supply Advisory Committee. When they were finished, the Water Commission kind of seamlessly took up their role as the overseers and partners with us in the work that we've been doing. Um, really, I think Doug's, um, Doug's comments are a lot of, um, uh, covered the details 
And I was recently at a presentation where someone said, in case you nod off, here's the takeaways. That was the first slide. So I didn't want to put in case you nod off here. But I did want to put the sort of key takeaways up front. Um, so we're going to find our key conclusions. I think Doug just said them for you. In between is a summary of the work we've done that resulted in our arriving at those conclusions. And I'm really providing you that uh, as much to give you a range, a, a, a feel for the sophistication and the level of detail of the work. And then uh, we're going to um, ask you to take a motion to do the adaptation. So with that, I will get going. But uh, before I do, these are the, these are the, what we've learned in the last four years and what we think we need to do uh, to make some significant pro progress in improving supply reliability if we focus near-term efforts on using existing uh, infrastructure in the belt system to create a ASR program. We work with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency on its groundwater sustainability plan, explore opportunities for additional groundwater storage in that basin, leverage the system reliability benefits of upcoming water treatment plant improvements that we need to do anyway, and then continue working, and really this is maybe the first and the last and the over and over again, continue working to understand uh, the potential impacts of climate change on our region's ability to use surface water and groundwater resources to meet our goals in the long run. This is a really, really important question with many big consequences and understanding it better is in our interest and it's something that we really feel uh, confident that we can do. So I've kind of divided the presentation into two parts. The first part is a summary of where we've been and it's a little bit of the longer parts, but again, I want to, um, I'll try to move through it relatively quickly and, and when I show you a slide with lots of numbers and things on it, I'll highlight why I'm telling you that and so you won't have to be trying to figure out everything about it. But so with that, I'm gonna get going. So update on the status of the work. Um, first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, a little bit more background about the WASAC and its recommendations, including the work plan that we've been, we've been uh, implementing. And then talking about some updates that we have on their assumptions about supply, demand, and climate change and then talk about uh, surface water augmentation strategies and analyses we've done looking at this sort of uh, available supply, kind of typically wintertime supply that is more water than we have and we don't, certainly don't have any place to store it. So what, how could we possibly leverage that? And then give you a quick update on the work we've done on recycled water and desalination strategies. Um, these are the key dates for the Water Supply Advisory Committee. Council decided to do it in October 2013. November, they created a, uh, the council took action to adopt a Drought Solutions Citizen Advisory Committee. February 2014, that group became the Water Supply Advisory Committee. It included 14 members chosen by a subcommittee of the council. Uh, we met for 18 months starting in 20, April of 2014. And then in November of 2015, the, there was a joint water commission city council study session on the 10th of November, so four years ago now, and then the council accepted the WASAC agreement and recommendations and directed us to integrate it into the upcoming urban water management plan. So we, did, we have done that. Parties, uh, the, the group included a whole diverse representation chamber, the folks who were against desal, the folks who were for desal, uh, some number of environmental groups, uh, water commissioners were represented, members at large uh, from the community, ratepayers, what have you. Um, these are these are they. Um, we were a professionally facilitated group, and uh, it was a group that probably. They did a lot of exploration and they came to consensus on their recommendations. Um, this is their problem statement that our problem, our key problem is that we have limited storage for a system our size. Uh, really our water supply reliability problem is not about growth, it's about meeting supply reliability for the people who live here now. Uh, we have fish flow requirements and potential climate change impacts which could further exacerbate the supply situation. We have a fairly good size gap off of, at that time, an estimated 3.2 billion gallons 
per year total demand for water. Uh, we had a potential peak season, worst case uh, hydrology, 1.2 billion gallon gap, which is a big uh, hill to climb if you find yourself in that situation. And that while we have been a committed community to water conservation for decades, and we've done a tremendous job on that, the group concluded that water conservation alone could not solve this problem. Um, their recommendations, as, the, as you were sort of summarized, uh, heard earlier, additional water conservation efforts um, in lieu of water transfers and exchanges with Silverado Creek, with uh, Scotts Valley or San Lorenzo Valley, uh, potential future partners in using our water in the winter time and resting their wells to create a bank of water for us to use when we were in a drought situation and then aquifer storage and recovery. Those were the winter water harvest strategies. And then the alternate water supply strategies of recycled water, some kind of advanced treated, either a non-potable reuse for irrigation or potable reuse uh, strategies for like groundwater replenishment or surface water augmentation. Uh, those strategies are, are on the books as well as desalination. These are really what you see on this list is pretty much the list of the resources we have available to us in Santa Cruz County. We're not connected to any of the other state water infrastructure. When it rains here, we that's the water we have. And when it doesn't rain here, that's the water we don't have. And that's a problem. Um, the one thing I want, this is their work plan. And I know you can't read this. Um, and uh, this is actually a poor kind of a cut and paste slide. But I will tell you, it was lined up so that in 2020, the information on all of the key alternatives was available simultaneously to allow for uh, a kind of an apples to apples comparison of all the options. And that was a really, really important piece of this analysis that we've been working very diligently to create information that would inform this kind of analysis. And it's one of the main things that we're proposing to change. We're proposing to keep the apple, the commitment to the apples and apples comparison of all the options, but we're proposing to move that back a couple of years and for reasons that we'll talk about. So I wanna talk a little bit about what we've learned in the uh, years, particularly as it relates to the um, key WASAC assumptions. Um, this is our demand forecast for uh, the 20 years following uh, in the window that we we're talking about, 2015 to 2035. This part right here is blank because we're just coming out of the second year of a drought here. Uh, typically what would happen is there would be some kind of a rebound. It would take some time to do that. Um, but the long-term demand forecast was basically flat, slightly declining. And um, this was flat and slightly declining, including um, additional 20,000 people coming into the area to be our customers over the 20 year period, uh, as well as uh, there's water in here that would have accommodated US UCSC growth as has been kind of talked about over this kind of a time frame. Um, the, uh, the basic situation, the reason it's flat is basically three things. One is uh, existing building and plumbing codes that result in more efficient use. The second one was price elasticity of demand. Our water has been getting more expensive and our customers have been responding to it, particularly as it relates to discretionary use, like irrigation or longer showers. And then the third thing was additional uh, programmatic conservation, mainly focused on things like uh, rebates for turf removal or uh, washing machine rebates or dishwasher rebates. Uh, most, in our case, most, not perhaps all, but most of the low, uh, the high flow toilets, high flow shower heads, those things are long gone out of our system um, over the last sort of 20 plus years. Um, this chart is really hard to look at, but I think if I, I want you to sort of focus on the color uh, palettes, anything that's kind of the blue, gray, black, um, those are, those are annual, daily, the squiggle line is daily um, over that year from 2013 and before. So that was our pattern and that's roughly about 3.2 billion gallons of that, the kind of average demand of that set of curves is about 3.2 billion gallons of total usage. The red, brown, kind of darkish brown, purple color, I guess at the bottom, that's our, our demand pattern since 2014. 
And what you, 2014 and 2015 were years we had water restrictions in place, but fundamentally, even after we took those restrictions off in 2016, we have not rebounded to the same level of um, demands that we've had historically. Um, the good news about this is this makes the size of the gap smaller in the near term. It doesn't make it go away, but it makes it smaller. The bad news is we've wrung a lot of the discretionary water use out of the system. So if we found ourselves in a situation where we had another 2014, uh, getting a 25 or 30 percent cut to respond to that would be a more challenging situation. I'm not saying you can't get there. I'm just saying it would be more challenging. One of the uh, things we're doing right now, and, and as kind of on another parallel path, is we're working on an update to the 2009 water shortage contingency plan that uh, the council adopted and uh, was developed and sort of based on data and customer use patterns in 2005, six, seven, the council adopted it in 2009. And that plan lays out a five stage plan for cuts up to about 50%. We're in the process as part of the planned urban water management plan update we have to complete in the middle of 2021 of updating that plan uh, because we're required to have a six stage plan that goes up to 60% uh, reductions, but also because we know that our customer use patterns have changed a lot. And so we need to adapt the kind of um, uh, cut strategies or restriction strategies we would build into that plan in order to get sort of demand reductions if we need them. And understanding customer use patterns is a big part of what is necessary to do that. So that work is kind of getting underway now and probably we'll be bringing something forward on this in the spring. But again, this pattern kind of the signal here, one of the signals is supply reliability is even more important than it has been historically because we have such a conserving community and those patterns of behavior seem to have really cemented themselves in many ways in our community. So this is, a, this is a major issue in the sense of thinking about particularly near-term strategies and what we can do to improve, improve supply reliability going forward. And you'll see some more of that as we get further on in the presentation. So the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is climate change. We've developed a number of new scenarios. This, this one that's called GFDL 2.1A2. It's like, I love this terminology, right? This, is, this one is developed uh, and used in the Water Supply Advisory Committee planning process. But subsequently, we've developed this one that's called Four and Symbol Model. You can see those little orangey dots in here are from that one. And then this one called the Historical Catalog. This was not so much a downscaled global climate model as a, a picking out of the historical record, the warmer and drier years, and interspersing them with a handful of the wetter years, and then randomizing that and creating a new record. So this is kind of uh, taking, using the historical information as a basis for what we would do. You can see that the one, the bluish one that we used in the, um, in the Water Supply Advisory Committee uh, process is kind of the warmest and the driest in general. Um, but this uh, historical catalog one is also uh, fairly warmer and drier. Um, these are things we've been using a lot of analyses looking at all of these options of, as well as historical data and you'll see some examples of that in a little bit. Um, so the, the key changes, the modeling assumptions here we've done is we've, you know, recognized that we've got some near term demands that are lower and we're looking at those and building those in, uh, including the fact that the annual peaking profile is flatter than the 3.2. We're maintaining the 3.2 billion gallon uh, demand forecast. That was actually a forecast that's created and we'll be updating that forecast also as part of the development of the updated urban water management plan next year. So until we get a new forecast, we're gonna maintain using that number. You'll, again, you'll see a lot of analyses later on in this presentation that will show you what the problem looks like at 3.2 billion gallons demand or 2.6 and under these various climate change scenarios. So it makes it for a chart with lots of numbers in it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Was, um, I know that you have time for the questions at the end, but I saw a, a council member get my attention. Yep. It looks like yep. there was a brief um, question here. Could you kind of briefly and simply explain that? 
Yes. Or not, or should I, just, I can. just later? And maybe Heidi, you can be prepared if I... Or not, I mean, should we say, just keep going? It's okay. Oh, that's fine. So the basic thing, there's two dimensions here. One of them is uh, departures from average precipitation, uh, so drier, wetter, uh, that's on this axis here, medium precipitation. You can see the ones are here. And then this is uh, temperature. So increase in temperature, uh, median temperature, and this is where this one is. So you can see that most of these climate change models are giving us information that says it's basically in this warmer and drier quadrant of this. There's a little bit from this, uh, this four, un four model ensemble that's in the more moderate, kind of down here closer to the, to the averages here. But typically they're on the drier side there's one or two little spots over here that are in the wetter side. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. So it's it's trying to kind of see, you know, by by developing additional models, you're helping to understand whether or not the blue one that we had is close, it's not close, it's, you know, the other ones are similar. Um, and that is one of the questions that we're gonna be doing some more work on as we go forward. So these were three different models using? Yes, created in sort of, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this is a summary of the changes to the key modeling assumptions, and that's, those are really important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about surface water augmentation strategy, and there's two elements of this. One of them is the transfers and exchanges, and the second one is the um, is the <coughs> upper storage and recovery. So uh, roughly a year ago, we celebrated uh, the valve turning of the opening of the um, inner tide that we have with Soquel Creek Water District at their O'Neill Ranch well, and we started the first ever sort of water transfer project. It ran uh, until April 30th. That's kind of the window, November 1st, April 30th is the window we have in our CEQA um, document for this particular pilot project. And a number of the WASAC members, including there's Mike and there's David and there's Doug right there, and this is Rick Longinati and Greg Pepping. These folks are all here celebrating. There's Erica in the audience. Um, and then uh, this is some details. The direction we got was explore these transfers. The actions to date include developed an agreement with them in 2016. In 2017 and 2018, with the backdrop of the Flint kinds of, uh, and the Fresno colored water issues, there was quite a bit of study going on looking at the compatibility of surface water and groundwater exchanging and not wanting to create a situation where we sent water to them and then they had wet, red water problems or other kinds of corrosion problems because surface water is typically much more corrosive than uh, groundwater systems are. So we did a, a study that came out with successful results that said we could um, you know, do this exchange, uh, send water to them without there being any negative consequences on a water quality perspective. Um, the, in winter 2018-19, uh, we did it. We had good success and we're planning a second round uh, this coming winter. We haven't started yet because the flows in the North Coast uh, streams aren't really up yet. We haven't had rain yet, but as soon as we have some rain, we'll get going on that again. This was the area for the first uh, exchange that or uh, transfer that we sent and the planned area for the, this time is quite a bit bigger, so it's larger. This was kind of was in this little hourglass kind of shape down here. It's going to be this whole service area one, this go around. So this has a more demand on it than the last time did, and we're hoping to, um, you know, basically be able to move water further into their system. Um, the other strategy we're looking at is aquifer storage and recovery. It's where you push water uh, through with pressurized um, injection pressures to push it into the aquifer. It creates a little sort of space where your natural, um, your your water that you inject is there. Doesn't mix with the um, with the native groundwater, and then later on you recover that. You take it back out, and pretty much you can tell by the water quality changes between the surface water and the groundwater uh, when you've moved beyond the collection of the water you put in, and now you're talking about 
water in the, um, that from the native groundwater. So we have successfully done a lot of paperwork looking at the feasibility analysis of, of this strategy. We got good results and last winter we pilot tested in the belts um, 12 well, our belts 12 well, successfully completed a pilot test of this technology and we're planning a second test in this year in a second um, one of the belts wells. So this is a really, and you'll hear more about this a little bit later on as we talk about something we could do with an existing infrastructure that would improve our supply reliability. Um, this is a, a section where I want to talk a little bit about some of the analytical work we've done to look at these things. So now you're going to see a lot of charts and graphs and numbers and things, but I'll try to make it easy for you to, to understand. So. We do a lot of modeling. We use a number of different kinds of models, but we do a lot of modeling to help us understand the probability and scale of droughts, the water availability to do things like uh, meet the demands of other, co other communities for transfers to um, be able to put water in the ground, how much do we have, um, infrastructure sizing, how, how big does the, the um, pipes have to be to take water to a place to get the maximum amount in the ground, how many wells do we need, those kinds of things. Operational approaches in terms of things like, well, shall we operate the reservoir differently, the Loch Lomond Reservoir differently than the groundwater, shall we operate them the same? Those are kinds of questions we have to understand. And then how to collaborate with other um, entities and how that could work. So those are the kinds of things we do for modeling. We use a, a major uh, sort of system planning and simulation model called Confluence. We've been using it for decades. Uh, it's a uh, model that uses a daily time step. So when we run a Confluence run, it runs every day of the historic record that's probably, you know, 70 years. And every single day, it puts hydrology into the system based on actual record data. It puts water demand into the system based on the projected demand uh, scenarios we're looking at. It simulates how the system will function. And then it will feed that information into things like the groundwater models that we've been using in the Mid-County Basin and also uh, we'll be using up in the um, Santa Margarita Basin and then also to the fisheries uh, effects analysis uh, models that we use. So um, this is our major model and a lot of the results you're going to see come out of Confluence. And again, it, they're really important in helping us understand are we on the right track or are we not on the right track. Um, I, to just give you a little bit of background about how it works, the, there's a dispatch order that is this one that you see here. First start with the North Coast, et cetera, go down the list. And every day, so it says, okay, today we have a seven MGD of demand, and so how much can we get from the North Boat course? We take that, then we take the next thing, we take how much water is available from the Tate Street diversion, and then the Tate Street groundwater, and if it's uh, summertime, we'll take the belts wells. And if we still need water, we'll go to um, Loch Lomond. Uh, now we don't have the groundwater storage yet. And then finally, if we can't still meet demand, it will uh, identify the the shortage. And so at the end of the year, when you see some of these numbers that are accumulating 1.2 billion gallons, that means that there were many days during that year when we couldn't meet demand with the um, available supplies that we had. And so as a result, they accumulate over that whole water year to produce that number. Um, we live in the real world. So our um, <laughs> Our daily dispatch is constrained by fish flow requirements, by infrastructure capacities. You can't put more water through a pipe than a pipe will take. You can't treat more water through the water treatment plant than the water treatment plant has the capacity for. Available flows from the various sources, water rights, flow rates, volumes, and places of use, and then water quality, turbidity, and first flush flow requirements. So, so we have a lot of things that are taken into account in the way we model the system's performance, and these are the key ones of those. Okay, so here's a really good example of one of these charts with lots of tape with um, lots of numbers on it. Just to point out, so these are the four basic um, sort of climate scenarios, the historical one and the three other climate scenarios we talked about. This line here is the 3.2 billion gallons of demand, the, two point, the 2016, 2018, that's 
And then the, the question that was asked in this model run is, what are the worst case droughts in each scenario? And it typically it's a, tip, it's a two year back to back uh, strategy or in the case of the CMAP five, there weren't as big of a one, but there were three together that were back to back. So that's why this one has three. And so you can see that uh, this is a total that for the historical item with the, the 3.2 billion gallons demand, this is a 1.8 billion gallon over two years. Um, with the lower demand, it's a 781 million gallons, which is not inconsequential, but it's certainly not as big as 1.8. And you can see that the others have, again, this is 1.8, this is 2, this is 2.4, this is 2.3. So the good news about these numbers is really probably they're all about the same number. Um, and the second thing is there's not a three billion or a half a billion one on, on this list, which means that even though none of these are right, we're probably in the right ballpark, let's put it that way. So this is an example of the kind of results that tells us how big the droughts would be and uh, you know, what, what their characteristics would be under different demand and climate scenarios. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Mid-County Groundwater Basin and the modeling of the city uh, aquifer storage and in-lieu projects, in particular because it leads to some other analysis about what it is that we told SoCal about our availability to provide them with um, surface water to meet their needs. So. Um, our primary purpose was to validate the assumptions we had regarding the feasibility of groundwater storage. We had some parameters about storage losses. We had an operational scenario that said inject the water over a three-year period followed by a two-year withdrawal, um, drought withdrawal at a level necessary to meet the drought shortages. So put a bunch of water in the ground, um, accumulate, and then use it over a period of two years while you're having a drought. That's what this scenario looked at. Um, this is a very geeky piece of um, drawing, but for those of us who love this groundwater thing, uh, this, is the, this is what the Mid-County Groundwater Basin looks like. And the reason I'm showing you this is because one of the references is shows um, to the TU formation. That's this really deep one, and you can see this well right here is actually screened in that formation. The city's wells are all screened in the A, the double A, or the TU formation. So Cal has uh, wells screened in those same wells, in those same formations that we do, as well as these formations over here, which we are not, that don't underlie our part of the service area. This is an interesting issue for some other reason, but um, basically I want you to see that we're gonna look at what happens to groundwater levels in this uh, strata and in this strata in the next two slides. We did an example of a um, injection and a withdrawal, um, looking at in lieu only, ASR only, and then some combination, and then a baseline. So that's what you're gonna see in the next um, slide. So these are, these are three monitoring wells on the coast strategy here is to try to maintain the level of the uh, groundwater in these monitoring wells to keep seawater intrusion at bay. And you can see the baseline uh, is these yellow lines. And uh, these are then the little dotted green line is just in lieu only. The blue line is ASR only. And then the, or the pink line is, oh, I'm sorry, this is ASR only. And then the other one is the combined one. One of the things I'm showing this to you for is you can see that this is the um, this is the measurable objective from the the um, groundwater sustainability plan. This thing right here is the level we're trying to achieve, and you can see that when we fill up the aquifer for three years and then we draw it down for a, in a period of two years, we actually make the situation and the groundwater elevations in that basin, this particular monitoring well, which is one right here, we make it worse than the baseline. That's a takeaway message from this. And this is the deepest layer, which is the one that is most subject to seawater intrusion because it's, uh, seawater is heavier and so it can come right in in the, the lower area. So this is a, operating like this is not a workable solution in this, this basin with this strategy. 
This is another one looking at uh, these, these monitoring wells over here in the Soquel area, but it shows the basic same pattern. It's, this one's in the A unit. <laughs> and you can see again, this is the minimum threshold. This bottom line on this one is the minimum threshold means we've told uh, DWR, Department of Water Resources, we're not gonna go below that. And yet we're seeing when the fill for three years and the withdraw down for two years, that um, that's gonna be a problem in this scenario, which is this one here, this one uh, here, I think. And in this scenario, these are all show that that's a challenging situation for us to be in. So when we started to talk about how much water we could provide to Soquel, we made a decision about making sure that since we have to solve our drought problem before we can solve a neighbor's problem, that this would be the dispatch order. We'd meet the fish flows first, Santa Cruz's daily demand, put water in storage for our, to meet our needs, and then if we have leftover after that, we would provide water to the neighboring agents. That produced this result. And the really important takeaway here is looking at meeting the, what SoCal has defined, defined as their 1,500 acre feet of water a year is what they need to keep seawater intrusion at bay in their part of the basin. This is a probability, what it says, even with the lowest demand and the best case situation of these various climate scenarios, we can only achieve that 45% of the time. Now in a good year, a year like we had this year or you know even last year, we could probably have done it although we weren't putting water in storage for ourselves, but we probably could have done it. But when you take a long-term view of what you're trying to accomplish and, you, and the answer is only 45% of the time could you count on that, that doesn't seem like a very good way to go. Smaller volumes and provided off-peak winter only are pretty reliable. You can see these numbers. And then we have a, a strategy for improving the robustness of the water treatment plant process that will result in some reliability benefits, the water supply reliability benefits that will allow us to um, use more water, particularly in the wet situations and in the dry situations. And that improves the condition, uh, you know, to 55%, but still is not really uh, workable. Explain this one, what NA is. Yeah, this, this particular climate um, catalog strategy had all the water, the precept condensed somewhat serendipitously con condensed into like a single month period. And so when you're trying to do a water, um, uh, uh, sort of a transfer project or something where you're taking water out of the river every single day to put it in storage and all the precip is in one month, it doesn't support that. That's why this says not applicable. And you can see at the lower demand, it works to some degree, but in this situation, the, the precip pattern is too condensed to even work for a, a aqua storage and recovery or you know using that supply for our own purposes, right? That's this is this was an interesting result. It's you know again none of these are right in terms of what the climate change scenarios are, but to get a result like that is kind of a little eye opening and something we should pay attention to. Okay. Um, so I, this is a very quick summary. Uh, pilot testing of INLU and ASR in the Mid-County Groundwater Basin appear feasible. That those results, they say these things are uh, feasible. Um, we uh, have a, um, we need to design any ASR project we would work to meet both the protective groundwater elevations to protect the basin from seawater and to provide drought storage. So that's one of the things on our plate. And there continue to be a lot of opportunities for collaboration in both of the groundwater basins uh, to work with other partners on various kinds of groundwater uh, sustainability strategies, as well as um, possible supply augmentation strategies using surface water and other activities. And we're definitely involved in those things. Okay, moving on. Anybody have questions on that before I go? Any questions? Okay. Keep remembering that first slide about if you nod off. <laughs> I know there's a lot of stuff here. Um, Thanks, Ruth. Quick, quick update on uh, the work we've done on recycled water and desal. Um, we did a recycled water project with pub, joint project with Public Works. Other stakeholders were involved. 
Um, we finalized the study about a year and a half ago, shortly. Uh, basically, we looked at a lot of different options. This is the Santa Margarita groundwater basin, by the way, this purpley one. And this is the Mid-County Basin, this green one over here. So we looked at a lot of different kinds of options. And one of the things we looked at was uh, the, the market for non-potable reuse for irrigation purposes. And if you have a question about this, you can see, Heidi can answer this more, but um, large landscapes with uh, that are these dark ones, so Del Viega Park, et cetera, um, and then um, some of them have water budgets and some of them have water audits on them. But they accumulated, they identified every one of these sites and what the use pattern was and accumulated that to determine how, um, how or whether the degree to which some kind of non-potable, you know, a purple pipe system might help solve our problem and it didn't really pencil out um, in most cases. Let's put it that way. So the project did recommend a couple of things. One was uh, right next to the treatment plant, there's La Barranca Park. That would be uh, a project there potentially. And then this project called Bay Cycle, which would have taken recycled water, tertiary treated recycled water up the hill to the UCSC campus for them to use both in irrigation. And um, I think earlier there was a commenter who mentioned that the, some of the buildings on the campus had been built to have um, use alternative sources of water for toilet flushing. So they have dual plumbing in those cases. And so this would be a usable for those kinds of projects as well. Um, and then a number of indirect potable reuse projects, which uh, are listed here and really would be things that we would move forward with uh, in the future um, to dive more deeply into these, these particular projects. We were asked, particularly after the work on desal that preceded the Water Supply Advisory Committee, to give an update about what would be involved in this project. And we, one of the key things was to assess the possible, possible change conditions since 2013. And so we hired a con local consulting firm, DUDAC, to update that information. That work was completed in August of 2018. Um, not surprisingly, since the ocean is quite large, uh, a project could produce, could be developed to fit, you know, to meet our need. Uh, costs were refined based on change conditions. A major issue that has emerged in the time between the work that was done earlier and where we are now is that uh, the ocean plan amendment now requires all desal plants to have subsurface intakes, which means buried as opposed to a big open pipe that's sucking seawater in. Um, I guess Heidi would sort of cringe at my saying that because they're a little more subtle than that probably. But anyway, that's the, um, the view. But uh, you have to be able to prove that it's not feasible, but they don't tell you what feasible means. So um, it's really like, well, I don't like that rock, bring me another rock, right? So it's a whole strategy that says this. And that led to this conclusion that not only would it be more expensive, but timeliness to actually get a project like that built probably would not make it a feasible project to, to do in the time frame we were talking about. Uh, a year ago, the council took action uh, to basically deprioritize desalination as the alternate water supply and prioritize further work on desalin or on recycling as the alternate. So that took place. It didn't have anything to do with the Pure Water SoCal project. It had to do with how recycled water might possibly meet our needs. Um, okay, that's um, that's the main part. But I want to. I've got just a couple more slides to talk about what else we've learned in the meantime. That um, I think we'll then we'll take a little break with, for time for questions and answers. Um, so this is the um, this is the the re kind of the repeat of the slide early on, which said, you know, we think given the lower near-term demand, there's an opportunity to make significant progress if we focus on you on ASR in the belt system using existing infrastructure and available supplies. Work with our partners in the Santa Margarita to explore options there. 
leverage the, um, the benefits, the system reliability benefits, actually don't leverage them, design them in and then leverage them uh, to the upcoming water treatment plant improvements and then to work on further understanding the climate change impacts, particularly as it relates to how vulnerable is surface water as a source of supply for us to some of the kinds of impacts of climate change that could do the thing like we saw in that climate catalog one where the rain pattern or the precip pattern changes so dramatically that it can no longer support uh, the kind of winter strat harvest strategy where you have to have a long period of time to take water every single day or alternatively you have to have really big pipes and treatment plant capacity and you know, transmission and a whole bunch of number of wells so that you can put the same amount of water in the ground in a much shorter period of time. So that's kind of the trade-off between those two. Um, one thing I wanted to show you just in terms of the possible system reliability benefits of the uh, aquifer storage and recovery in the belt system. So uh, this is the, the, you'll remember from the chart we saw earlier, the size of the uh, with 2.6 billion gallons a year of demand and the historical flows. This is an example. I have the ones for all the ones, but I want to make your eyes glaze over. So um, 780 million gallons was the shortage, um, worst year shortage under the historical flows. With existing wells, you can make that shortage go to 105 million gallons a year instead of 700 and then you don't really need to add any additional wells or uh, required capacity. Um, oh, actually, you can make it go to zero if you do add more wells in the area. Here's the, the warmest, driest flows, and you can see the number here is bigger, uh, 989. With existing wells, you can make it go to 320, and then by, again, adding uh, one well for putting in, um, you can, basically get that to go to zero. Um, this, is a, this is a really solid benefit to gain in a relatively short period of time for a relatively low price tag that is kind of a low regrets, no regrets strategy that is, uh, when we started looking at this, it was like, we need to change this plan so we can get on with this because this makes a ton of sense. Okay, that's the part that about what we've done and kind of what we've learned. Well, thank you for the presentation. Other than needing my um, magnifying glass for some of the slides, <laughs> Sorry. I learned something, no, it's, it's fantastic. The work is just really extraordinary. So thank you for all your time and efforts in bringing us up to speed. We'll go ahead and pause right now and see if there's any questions from uh, the colleagues here. Councilmember Myers? I just have uh, a couple questions. So. With the, cli I attended the, the climate change session you did in August. Um, it was great to see all that work. I'm just curious how, how do you keep that um, prediction up to date? So, I mean, what does that look like? Um, so the, the two models that were created from the global climate downscaling um, were, were used, um, one was, the first one was from what was called CMAP3, which is a whole suite of things that were developed kind of in the early part of the, this decade. And the second one came from CMAP5. Uh, these are all, you go into the CalAdapt website and you can find all this stuff yourself. I mean, it's totally available. But these are global climate models that are created in kind of segments. You know, like here's this one we did and this work and then we're gonna publish that and then a few years later you're gonna do an update. And so the, they came mainly from that and that work is ongoing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. The second way that we're looking at going forward and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that when we get to the next steps is that's all top down. That's sort of, you know, take a bunch of stuff there and one of the things Bruce Daniels, if any of you, you know him, he'll say, well, that takes a 10th out, the, the square size of that model is 10,000 square miles and then you're trying to downscale it to 50 square miles or whatever and there's 
a potential lot of error in there. So the other thing that we're doing or we're proposing to do is to do what's called stress testing the system and looking bottom up. So create a whole bunch of scenarios and they don't have to be refined. They just have to be whole range of scenarios across a whole wide spectrum of more wet, more dry, those kinds of things. And then look at those in terms of how does the system perform in those circumstances? And which parts of the system are struggling? If we ended up in, for example, in a, in a pattern where we had the same amount of rainfall, but it came in, you know, for the 2017 winter kind of a strategy where you're just getting pounded by it, that is really hard on water quality aspects so that the treatment process needs to be, you know, really set up so that it can uh, work better in those conditions. Uh, we have a lot of our pipelines uh, in places where landslide risks or, you know, land movement, mudslides, those kind of things are a big problem. So those kinds of things stress different parts of the system than, for example, a really warm, dry scenario would stress a different part of the system. <laughs> so the idea is to really try to understand where uh, climate scenarios of different characteristics would stress the system and be in a situation where you're starting to create some signposts out there as, you're, as we go actually into the future looking at, oh, we're starting to see that kind of thing. Then we know if it goes in that direction, we could have these kinds of risks. And so, again, designing in as we do some of the rehabilitation replacement work we're doing, you know, ways to move things out of that right of way because that's really a bad right of way for that kind of uh, landslide problem. And some other right of way might be better. Those are the kinds of things we can do and uh, might be informed by the bottom up strategy. So like the Tate Wells for sea level rise, you would be looking at that from that infrastructure question rather than the climate per se. Yeah. Got it, great, thank you. And, and one, of, one of the things I was just gonna, I was said to several of you when we talked was that these, um, these, uh, these climate scenarios to do the stress test, I mean, we're obviously focusing on our system, but they're created and we could potentially consider how it stress tests other parts of the city's facilities, the flood channel, for example. Smart. Okay, Vice Mayor Kendra. I did, well, first off, it's a great presentation. Um, I had a question around, I know earlier you'd mentioned when you're pumping um, surface water into some of these groundwater wells, there's a, an ability to be able to determine the difference between the sources of water. I'm no. just curious, is that, are you all using stable isotopes or how does the water department, are they able to kind of determine what's, what source of water they're actually pulling out and how, whether it's mixing or not. Native groundwater has quite different chemistry from surface water, especially when you're putting it in treated drinking water, right? So the mineral content of uh, our surface water is typically way lower in um, minerals and you wouldn't necessarily look at the dissolved oxygen so much because that's probably gone by then. But um, native groundwater will have a lot more natural minerals in them. So just that's one thing. We don't need to use anything but the real char different characteristics of the existing water. That's how we, that's how we do it. Other questions? You want to proceed Other to commentary two? by any commissioners? Please. You've been awfully quiet. <laughs> <laughs> how, th these folks have been, um, I think I mentioned to a number of you that these folks have been hearing about this on a quarterly basis in some detail for more up to three and a half years now. So mm -hmm. most of them are really up on this. They probably could give this presentation as well as I could. Um, <laughs> uh, before you get started, uh, Councilman McCrone. I was just wondering about the golf course and are we gonna drill a well there and can water be stored from the winter, you know, for the summer to water the golf course then? Um, the you know, I think the main strategy there would be to operate a well uh, there to basically pump water into the pond up there, which is the source of where all the irrigation water comes from. And it would operate during the irrigation season and wouldn't um, operate the rest of the time. We hadn't really thought about the aquifer storage and recovery there because sometimes when you, you know, the thing about the Belts 12 system and the, uh, and the Belts treatment plan eight, nine, 10, I don't remember the numbers. Eight, nine, and 10. Yeah, there's three wells there. Um, 
They have a treatment plant on site that if we need to, uh, well, obviously chlorine would have to be added to bring the water back into the system, but if we need to deal with iron and manganese, for example, those treatment plants are already set up to do that and we would be able to do that. So we don't have that kind of facility at the, um, at the golf course. Um, with respect to UCSC, um, I know they delayed their the sending their LRDP, long range development plan for a year to, to uh, the regions. Does that affect our planning at all? Are we waiting for them to finish LRDP and how much they're gonna grow? No, and um, the, the demand forecast we did in uh, 2010 probably included, well, after the last LRDP, let's put it that way, included a 349 million gallon per year allocation of water that was supposed to be used by them by 2020. So they did that 2015, 25, 20, 2005, and then they were supposed to be at 349 million gallons a year of use by 2020. They're at about half that, and they've doubled the student population. So their, their situation looks a lot like ours, which is their per capita demand is way lower. So what we did with the 349 million that was already in our demand forecast is we stretched it out. That same number is in our demand forecast now, but it's stretched out, I think, to 2050. So the point I guess I'm making with all of that is there's water built into our flat demand forecast for them to grow, not supporting it or anything, but for them to grow in some fashion and there would be water there in the, in the forecast to meet their needs. Thank you. Um, so a, just a quick question about the uh, your the examples of system or by reliability benefits of ASR when we were talking and I think you reiterated that the pilot tests for ASR uh, aqua storage in the belt system are using existing infrastructure and so which is you know why it's uh, low low risk, low fi approach. In tr and then I see, but, and then here it says add, you know, if we were to add wells, then we could reduce. Um, I guess um, just a little bit, it would be interesting to, or helpful to hear what um, that might look like. I know that we're talking about projecting out or moving you know, moving the deadline or the timeline right. forward, but like what what is, I'm going to ask what Heidi. What kind of infrastructure are we talking about? I'm going to ask Heidi to come up and answer that okay. question because I know she's been l looking at that, and I think she answered that question last month for the Water Commission. Good evening, Heidi Lichtenbach, Water Department. Um, the Phase Two work, which would install new infrastructure, is currently looking at just two additional wells. So, like Rosemary said, we're looking at belts eight, nine, ten, and twelve for the low-hanging fruit, if you will, and then two additional wells over in the Capitola Mall area. Um, we did look at most of the um, geology between the river and 41st Avenue, which is in our service area. We did look going north um, to see if there was anything up actually in the De La Viega area and the geology there isn't conducive to the ASR. So um, we still need to do some groundwater modeling to understand if those six wells will, how much of our gap those six wells would um, fill. So that work is still ongoing. Yeah, and that would be part of this, the plan. So you can, um, when we get to this colored chart, you can see that there's some work that would feed into a decision making. So that second part wouldn't really happen until we made this sort of bigger decision in 2022. But we would be developing that along with the Santa Margarita groundwater and recycling options simultaneously to bring all that forward together. I have a quick question, um, and maybe this is sort of a broader question, but it seems, I'm just curious, how common is it for water department, water planning to be incorporating the level of consideration of climate change as, as, as our water department, as you all are, have done, it seems quite cutting edge. In the last half a decade, decade maybe, there's a group that's um, created itself called the Water Utility Climate Alliance. Um, you can find them on the website. and really all of the, certainly all the big Western uh, water utilities uh, are 
members of it and they're they're basically a cooperative where they're working together to learn and understand what's going on with climate in their own situations as well as about other people's situations they're very sophisticated and i think um you know if if you're if you're a groundwater agency you need to understand this but if you're a surface water agency you really need to understand this particularly in a place where you know, we can't depend on the state to do this work and then figure out how to manage all the state water project and the Central Valley project to cover our interests. There's nobody covering our interests but us. <laughs> so we really do have to understand this. And, um, and so I wouldn't say it's unique, but I would say that uh, perhaps a little bit unique. I think it's great. Do you want to continue? Yeah. Okay, so um, this part is shorter, and I guess basically I want to talk a little bit about the assessment process and the proposed adaptation. Um, I mentioned to, so this is the kind of overview of this part, the change management strategy and the overview of the how we developed it and then what the recommended, recommended adaptation is. The Water Supply Advisory Committee were a bunch of wise old birds, and they understood that we were doing a lot of study, and theoretically, if you do the study right, information is actually produced that might influence what you do next. And so they wanted to maintain the commitment of the people and the process that they were creating and the values, if you will. And so they created a two-part process to allow for changes to the plan that they had created. And we worked with them to do this because it made a lot of sense to us too. The first one was kind of an adjustment, what was called, this is, this is something that we were given authority to manage on our own in you know collaboration and communication with the Water Commission based on the fact that we needed to do something to keep the, the plan on track. And if there was uh, something that changed that made us want to change the plan, that was a bigger deal, and they wanted to have it to be a very public process. So they laid out a process, a three-part process, that we would assess the, we would do an assessment, we'd share that assessment with the Water Commission, the Water Commission and uh, us, you know, sort of collaboratively would come up with a recommendation to either change the plan or go back and keep doing this, or bring it to the council and ask the council to adopt a change and update the plan. So um, that's laid out in this language and it, that's in your staff report. Um, over the last, as, as I, I guess the, the big things that I think have really brought us to where we are in recommending this um, are the near-term demands, what is happening with near-term demands, the positive results on the aquifer storage and recovery, the recognition that um, we have more work to do, particularly on the climate change question, before we uh, really want to ask the question of what next, and the opportunity to leverage the existing infrastructure of the system to get more supply reliability. And so in the spring, one of the things we did is we did a much more gruesome and uh, in the weeds and long, um, major sort of comprehensive update of all the work we'd done with the um, with the Water Commission and the former members of the Water Supply Advisory Committee. We invited them all to a workshop and we went through it in gory detail. And part of what's in your packet is the packet for that that included eight attachments that went through some of the major areas. Um, so in April we did that, and then in June we brought the, uh, the first draft of an assessment, the product that we have to produce if we want to make a change to the Water Commission, and had some ch comments about that. We brought the second version of that to the August 26th uh, Water Commission, and we had a major climate change workshop at that meeting also that I think really helped us to talk about what we knew and what we didn't know and some things we wanted to explore more and how that would change the, you know, the dynamic of what we were doing. And then finally, on October 7th, we um, put together the materials, drafts of the materials for this meeting, and the uh, Water Commission took action to agree to make a recommendation to you to change the plan. Any, any Water Commissioners want to comment on this? Just 
letting you, this is your stuff too, you know? Um, okay, so the plan, which is, it still requires um, a magnifying glass, but um, it's bigger. Thank you. <laughs> is, um, this is in front of you, and if you look at the kind of the bottom four swim lanes, it's the, ba it's the same stuff that is in the earlier plan. Um, I have more copies of this if anybody want, needs one. Um, it's the same stuff as in the earlier plan. Uh, it's sort of modified in terms of the way that the timing of certain things. Obviously the, the uh, vertical yellow bar and the red bar, the decision process moved out a couple of years. The diamonds on this chart are uh, supply increments, including a potential supply increment from the belts um, ASR as, as soon as a couple years out from now. Should be really a good thing. Um, a lot of the continuing work to input information into the decision process on Santa Margarita Basin, uh, information on uh, recycled water option. The timing of this allows a uh, whatever we might do in Santa Margarita to emerge out of the groundwater planning work that's going on up there, rather than the city packing its little bag and heading up into the valley and saying, we're here to help you and we're gonna do our project and wouldn't you like to let us and that kind of thing, which is probably not that great of an idea. Um, it includes, that very top line includes information about the um, related work that's going on, particularly related to the two groundwater basins, to the urban water management plan update, which we talked a little bit about, and then finally, the work that's going on on the water treatment plant, which is not the only project that's happening that could influence any of this, but it's a big one. Um, the modeling and climate analyses bar, which is the second one down from the top, includes kind of ongoing modeling using both groundwater modeling and confluence modeling that we've talked about and kind of in an iterative process as things develop and then the both the additional top-down and bottom-up climate analyses that would feed into decision making to the decision making process in 2022 and then following 2022 <coughs> these three um, things that are happening in the bottom three swim lanes that look all the same it's either one of these or some combination of these, but this is, would be the timeline for the implementation. So this is the proposed uh, revised water supply augmentation strategy work plan that would um, represent the adaptation. In the staff report, I'm pretty sure I, um, these are the implications, delayed decision, additional climate information would be valuable, near term ASR, treatment improvements being designed in. And this is from your staff report, which is a summary of the sort of changes, including retain and continue, et cetera, that you've seen here. So this is the document that would be, that we're asking you to um, take action on to accept along with that detail. And I think that's with that. Um, Thank you so much. I just have to say, um, you know, the, the policy kind of nerd in me. I just, the, the WASAC process model is just, just extraordinary. I just want to say how much I appreciate the foresight that that, uh, that committee was um, just taking into consideration as we move forward. This is just really exceptional. And, and to get at this place here using that model, it's just, it's wonderful. So with that, I'll see if there's any questions. Uh, Councilmember Myers. Uh, I don't think I have any, I think I'll wait. Um, allow other folks to ask questions. But I would, I will, um, ready to make a motion and when we're point. ready. Okay. Are there any questions um, up from the from my colleagues up here? Okay. Question. Well, I, I guess since we're all here, um, and maybe if there are members of the public who want to speak, we'd do that before. But if there are members of the Water Commission who want to say something about you're, you know, the process, then I, it would, you're here, so it'd be great to hear from you. That'd be great. So we could go here, um, we can go ahead and take public comment and then come back and hear from our uh, commissioners. Okay, uh, if there's members of the community who would like to address this on this item, please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. We'll start with you, Mike. <coughs> Hi, I'm Mike Rodkin. I was a member of the WASAC committee. Um, 
if I understood what we're being shown here, there's high confidence, or at least a reasonable level of confidence, that if you add additional wells uh, in the Belts area or perhaps to La Viega, that we don't need anything else. That in effect, that really, now you still need back backup of possible uh, recycled water because it might stop raining. If that happened, none of these things work at all. Um, but I'm trying to figure out the level of confidence you have in the, um, in those injection wells in the in the belts area versus super for example supersizing our treatment plant so we could deal with a you know all the rain coming in a major storm in one month or something so how how confident are we that there's water uh, that it will store the water that can be recovered with these additional wells that's something it's a quantitative issue that I, you know, I, I understand the process we're in, but I don't understand what the numbers look like and how confident you are that we, because what it comes down to is, should we be speeding up the look at the uh, recycled water thing because we're not confident, or is it okay to put that off, as you said, to the future to decide that, or this other option <laughs> of, um, you know, basically increasing this, the capacity of the, the pipes and the treatment plant? That's my question. Uh, Rosemary, taking note, we'll go ahead and see if you have any response after we hear the rest of the public comment. Please come forward. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I am the petitioner in Proper that has taken the legal action against the Pure Water SoCal project in SoCal Creek Water District um, for many, out, many violations, as I see them, of the California Environmental Quality Act. That, um, that action is still in consideration by Judge Small. And I, I want to point out to you that part of um, why WASAC, uh, in my opinion, did what it did to really uh, ensure that the public was involved is because where WASAC came from, Measure P and Rick Longinati in the desal alternatives, people were screaming, you're not listening to us as the two agencies forged ahead with a project, a desal project that was very energy intensive and environmentally damaging. And the people were saying, no, no, no. That's how you got WASAC and that's how you got that good process. And that is the flaw with the Pure Water SoCal. The customers, the people in the mid county have said, no, no, no. And the district is forging ahead regardless without giving the people in live oak a voice. I want to um, point out that Loch Lomond is 92% full. And I would like to point out that um, wisely, the, um, your agency is moving forward to amend the place of use water rights. That will change very soon. So you could give more water to the mid-county area using water from the San Lorenzo uh, River that currently you are restricted to using only the pre-1914 water law North Coast streams. But you could be giving them water now, the North Coast streams, and using yourself, the Loch Lomond. May I have one more minute, please? No, actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I didn't receive uh, additional time, so we'll go ahead and see if other members of the community, you're welcome to right. submit your comments and we can review them. Though. Well, I did send you two extensive written comments. Okay. Did you receive them? Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. I, yes, I'm as a, you. as a customer, as a person in the Mid-County, I'm here to beg you to be leaders because SoCal Creek your, Water District does not have the will to your, do so. Your time is up. Thank, thank you. you. Please, next speaker. Good evening, everyone. My name is Greg Pepping. I'm the executive director of the Coastal Watershed Council and the Coastal Watershed Council was one of the organizations um, represented on the WASAC. Um, really short and sweet, I just wanted to um, come and say that as a WASAC member, it's um, that, it, that I support the recommendation to um, the staff recommendation and the adaptation as offered. Um, WASAC knew a lot and we knew um, we needed to learn a lot more. Still lots to learn and what the way I understand it and um, since stepping off of WASAC, I don't have as much of command of the material as I used to when we were really digging into it. But what I have confidence in is that the work that the staff do and the work that uh, the Water Commission um, is doing and I have confidence in that it's a fact-based recommendation 
Um, we knew we didn't know a lot. It, it's, it's gratifying to see what has been learned. Um, there's a lot of humility that there's still um, more research to do. Um, I, wish, I wish it was raining. We can't do anything about that, but with, we have what we have. Um, with the work that we're doing as an organization, try to, you know, the habitat and water quality work and engaging youth and families and educating them about the river, none of that really is, is not worth doing if there's not water in the river. So um, Wasak value is really focused on sharing, humans sharing water with the fish. And that's consistent with what you have before you. The adaptation is still consistent with that. So that's very reassuring. So in short, just wanted to offer my support for the staff recommendation. Thank you. Morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. What am I? Uh, my name is Candace from East Morsi. So, so my understanding is that by making this decision today, delaying the decision you're only delaying it two years from its ultimate implementation, which um, would be by 2027. I guess that's a question. Um, the decision on this, the Water Advisory Committee was like ended in 2015. So that like is 12 years. And I remember it being like six to eight years. So I'm just, it just feels like it, it keeps getting pushed out. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, for many of us, I'm one of the people that have just gone down to the bare minimum. I mean, if I were to ask to go down another 15%, I really don't know what I would do uh, because I have reduced my water. I don't water any landscaping, any lawn. Some of my trees have died, a couple of my fruit trees I've lost. Um, I haven't replaced them. Uh, any kind of landscaping is to the minimum as far as any kind of watering. I just barely keep it alive during the summer. Um, some of my hedges almost died. Finally, we agreed with the neighbors, you know, it's either a fence or a hedge, so, you know, we, we started watering a little bit. Replaced all my appliances, toilets, washing. Don't use my dishwasher. New, do Navy showers every other day. My partner goes to the pool, um, doesn't shower at the home. Um, yeah, I mean, what would I do to save water beyond what I do right now? And I think a lot of people are in that boat. So, you know, just keep that in mind when you talk about, you know, adding another 10,000 people or 20,000 people. A lot of people in this community are wondering, well, you know, how are we going to survive? Thank you. I believe you'll be our last speaker. Any other members? Okay. Good evening, Scott Graham. Um, there's a lot of uh, different things that could be done to supplement our water. The uh, city owns a large tract of land up Zianney Creek where they were gonna build a reservoir at one time, put a dam up there, and they could be drilling artesian wells along the hillsides in that land and uh, have a water supply from that. And then <clears throat> with the uh, winter runoff, we could pump some of that water over to, to the sand pits in Scotts Valley and refill the aquifer that way. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is if, if the city is uh, digging up the street somewhere, putting in new water mains, they should throw an extra pipe in the ground so that it, in the future when there is a reclaimed water systems system wide they'll have pipes already existing for that system wide reclaimed <laughs> water system which could water landscapes flush toilets and stuff like that um, it isn't completely necessary to use fresh water to flush a toilet i mean nobody drinks out of a toilet except maybe dogs uh, so <clears throat> Anyway, I would hope that you would look at some of these other ideas on how to get more water and, you know, <clears throat> the other thing is that we, you should contact 
our state representatives and the governor and tell them to ban fracking in California because fracking destroys the water systems. And in, even though the Trump administration has opened up California to fracking, let's statewide ban it. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the community who want to address um, our joint uh, commission and council meeting uh, here today, we'll go ahead and return back. I know there were a couple questions that were raised. I don't know if you want to speak to those, Rosemary. I do want to just sort of really applaud and compliment you. I know you went over this slide, but the social norming shifts that you see here are pretty remarkable yeah. in terms of the um, education and outreach, and it was brought up by one of the community members. So just sort of wanted to take note of that. Uh, I'll offer your uh, response and then uh, welcome any comments from our commissioners here. Um, a couple, just a couple of things. So uh, with respect to uh, the comment about adding a, one more ASR well, and uh, so in the Mid-County Basin would potentially solve the whole problem. It potentially solves the whole near-term problem. Uh, if, if we end up in a situation where, you know, demand ultimately rebounds to some degree, people decide that actually the hedge is worth keeping, for example, um, then, uh, then we would need to do more. But I think that's the reason we're putting it on the table as something to do sooner is because with the near-term demand being what it is, uh, you know, we could have a major impact in the event we had a 2014 kind of an event again, and that would be great to be in a position to say, first increment of new supply, uh, new based on storing of water that, you know, of surface water that we have uh, in 60 years, right? So that would be good. Um, with respect to the comment about the opening up the water rights for um, SoCal, the analysis we did actually already assumed that that was happening, that we could move water from anywhere in the system to the SoCal. Um, so it wasn't constrained by, that part was not constrained by the uh, lack of the SoCal district being in our places of use for our San Lorenzo water rights. And then, um, uh, let's see. Yes, that's it. That'll do. Okay. No, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, I, of course, welcome any comments from our commissioners or our council at this time. I definitely just want to thank you for your, just your work and your commitment and service to our city and bringing us this far. This is really extraordinary. Councilman Matthews. I just have one more question. Uh, I bet all the water commissioners know it already, but I'm looking at the, the blue to red chart here. Oh, yeah. And it's not all just social norms, it's a whole lot of equipment changes, too, that are built into that. Well, of course, and you know, the, some of the things that we've had in place for a long time, the uh, retrofit on resale program yeah, yeah. has had a dramatic effect over a long period of time. Um, I, I do think that irrigation practices probably have shifted mm -hmm. somewhat dramatically. I, I, I remember in 2017, uh, Mike Rodkin used to tell us that he liked to have a garden and grow corn in the good years, and he was hoping for more of those again. And I remember in 2017, and when it had been raining, 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 I sent him an email. I said, "Grow corn, Mike. It's it's the year." <laughs> <laughs> but um, I I do think that uh, the, a lot of the irrigation practices have really honed in. And you know, one of the things we did in the last rate increase was. We put the big irrigators all on water budgets, so they had based on their actual, you know, size of their landscaped area and what have you, they had an amount that was 100%. You paid a certain amount, but if you exceeded that, then you paid a penalty rate and a penalty rate. So, I mean, we did it. We've done a lot of things in the way that the rates have incentivized efficient use too. So, a lot of things. And and so my things. question, um, <laughs> I remember. Oh, 10, 15 years ago, we were saying even then we have one of the lowest per capita daily yes. uses in the state. I don't remember what it was then, but um, this is million gallons a day here. But so what's our residential? It's uh, 48, including indoor and outdoor use. For the system wide, I think it's about 70. So it's a it's a number that, uh, of course, we live in a we live in a uh, you know a Mediterranean climate, but generally we usually have kind of wet, dry, what have you. Um, but it's probably one of the lowest handful of lowest in the states. I think San Francisco might be lower, but then has way fewer uh, patches of ground to irrigate. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Chair, anything? 
Uh, <coughs> Council Member Brown asked for additional comments, and I thought, you know, rather than going through, re reviewing what Rosemary went through, there were a few other thoughts I had while I was listening to what she had to say. And we, we have the gift of time here, which is unusual mm -hmm. in my experience. And I'm reminded of the old Latin proverb, festa nolante, at least I'm moving slowly. We have an opportunity to get smarter in a lot of ways, and uh, I'm glad we have the, that we're going to take advantage of that. A um, couple little things. Uh, the wells, uh, the ASR wells are supply agnostic, and as Mike uh, pointed out, Short term, we can take advantage of it with winter flows. Longer term, if, if those winter flows become attenuated, we can we can look for other water there and perhaps still be able to use them, which is hugely beneficial. In the meantime, while we're while we're taking some time here, the technology is going to get better. So if we do end up going with something like recycling, I'm confident that it'll be cheaper, uh, more energy efficient, um, more cost effective when and if we do have to do that. I'm also uh, reminded that there are some generational equities in being able to take some time here, as Rosemary pointed out earlier with respect to the bond issuance. Mm -hmm. If we can delay these decisions or moderate the amount of additional um, investment we have to make in order to achieve our supply goals, then there are, there are benefits to being able to take some time. And then finally, um, gratified that we did follow the letter and spirit of the WASAC process throughout this. Fully in support. Wonderful points. Any additional comments? Ms. Ryan. Hi. So I had a, a few points I wanted to bring out. I'm fairly new to the Water Commission. I started uh, earlier this year, but I've been, uh, Rosemary's been a very good teacher. We've had a lot on our plate this last year, a lot of opportunities to review this. So um, for those of you who are kind of new to this, as, as was I, um, but I have a, a few points that I wanted to make too. Um, the first one is that while I do understand that there's a sense of urgency that um, we are facing, that we've created, it's November, it's not raining, um, there's, there's a real need, I think, that the community feels to see something happen. I think it's really wise to wait until we really have as much information as possible before spending tens to hundreds of millions of dollars from our ratepayers on a project. Uh, we want to be really sure that it's the right right course of action and taking these short-term um, opportunities that have arisen, I think it, it's really wise. It's it's the right thing to do, both from a supply standpoint and from a, a rate payer standpoint, so that we know that we're, we're taking them into account. Um, another thing I wanna say is that since the, the WASAC ended in 2015, you cannot go to a regional water related meeting without seeing a city staff member. They've been fantastic collaborators, um, really, at all of the groundwater planning meetings in both Mid County and Santa Margarita, they've been there, they've been active, they've been really um, collaborative partners and that's, um, it's reflected in, in this. And I think it's important to recognize that they're, you know, they're really talking, talking the talk, walking the walk, they're, they're doing it all and they're, they're trying to be here, um, making sure that they're, they're looking at all options and talking to everybody at the same time. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to make sure that everybody is aware, and I'm sure you are, that the climate change, it's, it's going to be ongoing forever. This is, we're not gonna solve this problem. We're going to get us further, further down the road. And it might be that in the long run, we end up having to do a lot more projects than we're talking about here. But I think this will get us to that point where we can continue moving forward. So. Can you give me the slide before this one? We'll go ahead and hear from uh, you, uh, Commissioner Baskin, and then we'll and we'll have you uh, go over. Uh, so David first. Yep. Thank you. Go ahead, so point C. Looking at the impacts of climate change, with the goal of providing the information necessarily necessary to compare the long-term viability of surface water development. That's been our defining thing for the, the last ten years. When I got on the Water Commission. Donna Myers was the chairperson of the Water Commission eight years ago. And through all of that, the, que the defining question that has, de that has been our, at a, the root of our water process for all these years, is our surface water supply sufficient or do we need something else? Whether we're storing it in the ground, however we're doing it. And so to me, the adaptation we're doing now, it's getting down to the real nitty gritty. It's getting to the focus of what we really need to be focusing on. And we should not forget that when we did WASAC, 
we operated in a vacuum of no capital improvement program. We could just say, let's do this, let's do that. We didn't have to deal with an $85 million project on the Newell Creek Dam and, and replacement of our underground pipe system that is costing $1,000 a foot. I mean, there, there's some pretty heavy stuff going on there. And, and I also think about the fact that we should not lose sight of the impact of fish flows and the concessions we've had to make to the environment. Because if it wasn't for the fish flows, we probably wouldn't need a project at all. Our, our surface water really would be sufficient. But it, the, re, the reality is, is that it's in the drought years when the fish need the water that we need the water. And so that's when we need the project. We don't need it all the time. We need it in the drought years. And those are, 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 appear to be getting more frequent and of greater duration. That's what climate change has been telling us so far. And that's what we're gonna be studying as we go forward. The, the thing about the modeling, which, which Bruce uh, Jaffe always says, and Rosemary always says too, is that the models are always wrong, but they're the best we've got to try and predict the behavior of our system as it meets the conditions. So I look at this adaptation and, it, and, it, and it's saying, okay, let's do what we know we can do that will work. Let's figure out what we need to do in a really very real and focused way. And we'll get there which is what was always the WASAC process and has been this, the water department process and the water consideration process for the last 60 years, whether it be the Zianti Reservoir or Desal or whatever, as we've gone through the different incarnations of trying to solve what we knew was the same problem. So I'm glad to see us get down to it. Jim. Good evening. Yeah, we're all touching on climate change. Climate change can sound sort of nebulous and squishy, especially when we look at multiple models that say something slightly different. In the August meeting, it was sort of brought home for me when one of, the, one of our experts pointed to a report that says we should expect to be losing coastal redwoods within 20 years due to climate stress. They rely on the same groundwater and fog that we rely on for our water supply. So it, it's closer than you might think. And Fish flows, well, a large portion of our no north coast water is dedicated to fish flows, and Department of Fish and Game defines that for us. So in a sense, we are sole source with the San Lorenzo River watershed. It's a bit risky, and the risks are described in, in some of our documents. We expand and provide additional storage with ASR. That may or may not be enough as we move forward but it's a good start and we need to get moving. <coughs> that's, that's pretty much it. Um, oh, one last item. I'd like to see us moving forward maybe more quickly on some redundancy. We don't really have that choice. Um, we have deferred maintenance for decades on our current water system. And if we want reliability in what we have before we try and expand forward to what we need, we have to spend a lot of money just to upgrade what we have to meet current regulations and to make it solid. So challenges and opportunities. All right, I welcome any other comments, please. One of the things that I'm really grateful for in participating in the, in the commission is the diversity of experience, the different perspectives. And, and it's, it's kind of fun for me um, working around infrastructure projects to see what a, a, a hugely complex project we've undertaken in a relatively small agency and how well the, the, we've distinguished ourselves in working through it. This, you know, in your introductory remarks, the, the WASAC strategy was ambitious. Um, it absolutely was. And it's ambitious because it preserves so many options. And I think correctly that we have a lot of options on the, on the table. There are a lot of variables at play and we're trying to, um, we're trying to keep track of them without just taking them out and freezing them. You know, the, the D cell proposal is a very simple proposal, very easy to execute. You do the one thing, you pay your money, you get your water, <coughs> all kinds of, of side effects, but it's a very simple plan to execute and, um, was maybe not a good plan. And I think we have a very complicated plan. I think everyone's being very patient 
as we work through some unavoidable aspects of a complicated plan. Um, but I, I think Doug came up with a statement that's really stuck with me, this idea of the no regrets investment. As soon as you find a no regret investment, something that is obviously a good idea that you, you should do it no matter what, like look at one or maybe two more wells in an area where you've already got rights and you can probably find a site. That's very low regret investment. And as soon as you do that, you take other options off the table, you freeze variables, you can simplify your problem. And then I think your momentum gains. And I think the one thing that we can look forward to as we sit here at the beginning, hoping for things to move more rapidly, is that as we put pieces in their place, the other pieces are more obvious where they fit. It's like finishing the big jigsaw puzzle, that all of a sudden things look like they make more sense <coughs> after you've settled down the model. And I'm just, I'm really optimistic. I wanna make sure that, that people who are kind of new to this and don't touch it every month at a meeting understand it is extremely complicated for a group of this size to be working through a plan like this. And it's going to get much easier um, over the next five years. Any other comments? Okay, seeing none, um, Rosemary, I, my understanding is you're interested in having us make a motion to uh, move the recommendation. I'll go ahead and see if I can entertain a motion. I'll make the motion. Oh. Well, no, I know you said you were going to earlier, so. Is that okay? Of course it's okay. Councilmember Myers. So, I think um, it sounds like we're tracking very well with all the recommendations um, due to all the amazing and good work and continuing um, commitment to keep discovering um, what we can do differently and, and uh, those tweaks and no regrets. So I'll go ahead and um, make a motion to approve an adaptation to and also adopt a revised work plan for the November 24th, 2015 City Council approve agreements and recommendations of the Santa Cruz Water Supply Advisory Committee to integrate the new inf information identified tonight. Um, to take advantage of near-term low regrets opportunities for supply augmentation, specifically with the belt swells, as outlined in, our, in the new work plan. Uh, to take advantage of near-term, oh, I'm scared, excuse, sorry, said that one already. Um, and finally, to change the timeline for decision-making about additional source augmentation strategies from 2020 to 2022. Second that. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously, and I appreciate uh, leaving us on a positive note and a place of optimism. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for your dedication to our city for this critical resource. We really appreciate your work, and uh, good night.